ex or boyfriend, I almost got kidnapped, OMFG. And then minutes later, she was killed. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of April Millsap. Viewer discretion is advised. April was just 14 years old and she was an only child. She was living with her mom and her stepdad in Armada, Michigan. On July 24th, 2014, April would go out and take her dog Penny for a walk. And their walk would take them to a bike trail that was really close to where they lived and it was a trail she used all the time. She left the house around 6 p.m. At 6.28 p.m., April's boyfriend got a text from her that said, I almost got kidnapped, OMFG. About 10 to 15 minutes or so after that text message was sent, a dog was found wandering by itself. This dog turned out to be Penny. This couple was walking and Penny was almost trying to get the couple to follow her. And so the couple did. They followed her to a certain location. And right off this bike trail, kind of in the bushes, the dog led them to a body. It was the body of 14-year-old April Millsap. Police arrived within minutes, and also around that time, April's mom had reported her missing because she hadn't come home yet. So basically, as April's family and friends are looking for her, they come across this scene, and that's how they find out that she is gone. It appeared April had been strangled to death, but she also had injuries that looked like she had been kicked, possibly stomped to death, or hit with something. Her clothing had been like ripped off of her, but there were no signs of an actual sexual assault. Police quickly learned that her cell phone and her backpack were missing. That's when the boyfriend arrives at the crime scene and says, hey, I just got this text. Police are like, well, this is kind of weird. Where were you during this time? The boyfriend said, well, I was actually out getting food with friends when I got the text message. And then police had to go check CCTV footage of, you know, this fast food restaurant. And they confirmed the boyfriend was there. And they quickly ruled him out with anything to do with this. Police would end up using uh, scent dogs to see if they could track where her cell phone and backpack were. And it actually helps them find the cell phone. Her phone is found roughly a mile away. As they're searching through her phone, they realize that she had been actively using a fitness app that tracked her steps and her, you know, all that stuff. And it actually painted a very clear picture. They saw that she had started to walk at 6 p.m. By 6.20 p.m., it says that she had picked up speed. And then there was 15 minutes of what they described as frantic activity. They were also able to use this fitness app to track the movements after she had been killed. And because of that, they were able to track and find out where her backpack was. Witnesses would come forward to state that they also saw a man riding a blue and white motorcycle on the riding trail that day. Motorcycles were not allowed, and this man appeared to be very, like, angry. One or two of these witnesses said that the man on this motorcycle appeared to be arguing with a younger female, but they didn't really think much of it. Not until they found out that this young female was found murdered. That's how they came up with this composite drawing of this man. And so police would release this image to the, the public. And also said, you know, a man who may look like this who rides this type of motorcycle. Based on the fitness app, in terms of where it was tracking, they were able to find CCTV cameras along that path where they found the man riding the motorcycle. But the man was wearing a helmet, so they couldn't see who he was. Well, one day as police are driving through these neighborhoods, they see a blue and white motorcycle in someone's driveway. So they ask the homeowner, whose bike is this? And they say, well, that actually belongs to a friend of mine, a man named James Van Callis, 32-year-old man who didn't really have any kind of criminal history. James said he had been visiting his brother in the area at around 6 p.m. that day, and he left around 8 p.m. However, when they checked his cell phone data, they proved that was wrong, or he was lying. His cell phone actually pinged in an area near, I think, where she was attacked. They got a warrant to search his home, but they found nothing. However, they did find marijuana plants, and so they arrested him for drug charges. That's when his girlfriend would come forward to state that she was basically being held hostage by him. He was abusive and controlling. And then the day of the murder, he came home and he cleaned his shoes. Shoes that police were never able to find. But they know what type of shoes they were, and they actually were the same types of shoes, Air Jordans, that were left at the crime scene. There was an imprint of Air Jordans on her face. But the crime scene, there was no DNA, there was no fingerprints. But based off witness statements who would identify him after the fact, the motorcycle, the phone records, the fitness app data, he was placed in that exact area of the murder. He was seen by people, he was caught on CCTV, and so when he went to trial, he was found guilty of the murder of April Millsap. 
and he was sentenced to life in prison without parole. The motive was likely he wanted to kidnap her, and he probably tried to, which is when she texts her boyfriend, but then he came back around and then took her. He probably was trying to sexually assault her, but she fought back too hard, and so he ended up killing her. And her trusty dog was able to bring people to where she was. And so thankfully, April got the justice she deserved. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Ara Johnson. Viewer discretion is advised. This story happened in the city of Big Sandy, Texas, which I guess is right there near Dallas. And there is very little information about her case. At the time of this case, Ara Denise Johnson was just five years old. Just nine months prior to this happening, her brother, who was six years old, died in an accidental drowning. And then on the morning of April 2nd, 1986, her parents would call police to report her missing. Her dad would say that he checked in on her between 1 a.m. and 2.30 a.m. and she was sound asleep in her bed. Then when they woke up at 6.30 a.m., they went to check on her. She was no longer in her bed. The back door of their house was wide open. The orange blanket she slept with was also missing. But other than that, everything else was still there. There were no actual signs of foul play, no signs of a struggle, no broken windows or broken doors, no signs of forced entry. The parents both said they heard absolutely nothing that night. Police brought in scent dogs and they couldn't pick up her trail anywhere. Her mom and her dad, and I guess another individual, would all take polygraph tests, and all of them passed. Ugh. Police in Texas did consider this guy a suspect. His name is David Elliott Penton, and he is a horrific dude. In the mid to late 80s, he signed a plea agreement admitting to murdering three girls near Dallas, Texas, all aged between four years old and nine years old. He was also convicted of manslaughter for killing his infant son in 1984. He then escaped prison, where he then killed the nine-year-old niece of a friend of his. He was then recaptured and brought back to prison. He was out and about when Ara disappeared. However, police do not have any physical evidence to say that he was the person responsible for this. She does fit the criteria of who he would typically kidnap and kill. But he never confessed to it, he never brought it up, and they never had evidence. Foul play is absolutely suspected in Ara's disappearance. It's just a matter of finding out who. The authorities think it's more likely that she was taken by someone close to the family. Someone that knew her. Someone that maybe she felt trust with. That if they quietly came into the house and said, hey, come with me, she would go without any issues. Which is why the parents maybe didn't hear any signs of an argument or screaming or anything. I assume they dusted for fingerprints and all of that, but I don't know 100% for sure. All I know is even now at this point in 2024, her case is still unsolved. She has never been located. And whoever may have done this to her is still free. Well, maybe. If you have any information about her disappearance, please call 903-843-2541. So somebody asked me um, in a YouTube comment on one of my videos uh, recently, and I've been asked this question a few times before, but basically they said, how come every time, you know, you cover a true crime story or any true crime creator covers a story, how come it's always the case of like a good person, a nice person who always makes people smile and a happy person? Essentially what they're asking is how come you're never saying the bad parts of the victim, like whatever, you know, bad things they may have done in their life. How come they're always just so nice, bubbly, and light up a room? <laughs> the simple answer is, is because we're covering their murder. They were murdered. Like, we all know that every person on this planet is flawed in some way, shape, or form. I am, you are, these victims are. But why would we point out the bad aspects of a person's life if... You know, let's say maybe like, oh, this person can sometimes be a jerk to, I don't know, people at retail stores. <laughs> maybe they're like a Karen. Like, why, why don't you guys mention that in your videos about the person who was killed? But because they were killed, they were murdered, they didn't deserve to be murdered. It would just be so incredibly disrespectful to be like, well, you know, Susie, she was kind at times, but sometimes she was just a downright bitch. Like, what does that do for the story by saying whatever's negative about them? What does that do? Because 10 times out of 10, if you're murdered, you're murdered by a really bad person. 
And odds are, the person who was murdered didn't deserve to be murdered. And in some cases, like, I, I remember I've told stories where I've talked about victims who, you know, I'll say, like, oh, you know, they were battling with alcoholism or they were experimenting with, you know, illegal substances and they fell into the wrong crowd. Like, I, I'll say that stuff because sometimes it's relevant to what ended up happening to them. Wow, my my voice is going. But... Essentially saying something, the bad aspects of a, of a murder victim's life, it offers absolutely nothing to the story. Because some people will look at that and go, oh, well, they were a Karen, they were a jerk, well, then they deserve to die. Then you have to deal with those comments. Because there are bad people out there as well who like to leave comments on videos. And why give them the ammunition, you know? In the end, the murder victims were people. People, like me and you. And they didn't deserve to get killed. So I'm not going to point out their flaws and the issues they may have had in their life, especially if it has absolutely no relevance to the story and to who they were most of the time as a person. This is one of the most heartbreaking and horrific cases that I've ever covered. And a very strong trigger warning because this is about the death of a baby. This is the case of baby Jylene. Viewer discretion is advised. On June 16th, 2023, a woman called 911 with regards to her child. The woman was Crystal Candelario, and this happened in Cleveland, Ohio. When fire and ambulance and police arrived at the home, it, it, was, all, it was too late. Baby Jailene was pronounced dead. She died of starvation and dehydration. And how that occurred is one of the most disgusting things that I have ever heard. On June 6, 2023, she left for a vacation hundreds of miles away in Puerto Rico. And what did she do with her child? She left the baby in a playpen in an empty house. She abandoned her child and she left her baby alone in a playpen in a dark house with nobody there. Not for a couple of minutes or a couple of hours. She left her 16 month old child in that playpen alone for 10 fucking days. 10 days with nobody there, trapped in a playpen by herself. I'm going to play you a quick audio. This might be pretty disturbing to some of you, especially if you're parents. So just trigger warning. Around 1.04 a.m. in the morning that you hear this child cry. Baby Jailene was screaming and she was crying and nobody, nobody went to see what was going on. She was heard by neighbors. She was captured on camera screaming and crying while she was dying slowly because she was starving to death and she was, she had no water. She is terrified. She's in a completely dark house. I, I can't even begin to imagine. I, I can't. Nobody came to her rescue. Nobody. And so the neighborhood heard her slowly dying and crying for help until eventually she could cry no more. 10 days without food and without water, without a parent, a mom. This human waste of space allowed her daughter to starve while sitting in piles of urine and feces. And she tried to say, I was under a lot of stress. It was, I was depressed. Uh. Shut up. She was found guilty. She got life without parole. Lock her in a dark room. Police initially said he was a suspect simply because he wasn't emotional enough. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Barbara Gibbons. Viewer discretion is advised. This case happened in Litchfield County, Connecticut, and it was back in 1973. Barbara Gibbons was a 51-year-old mother. At the time of this case, she was living in the house with her 18-year-old son, Peter. It was September 28th, 1973. 18-year-old Peter had come home from being at church, and he got home sometime just before 10 p.m. When he walked inside their home, he found his mom brutally murdered. Apparently, Peter would make five phone calls to different people asking for help. And his friend Jeffrey, I guess, came to the house, and then police were called. Behavior that is probably a little suspicious, sure. 
When police arrived at the scene, Barbara, they noted, had been stabbed just many, many times. The coroner would also determine that she was likely sexually assaulted. Her son Peter, to them, did not seem emotional enough. He seemed to be devoid of any emotion. And so that made them consider him a suspect immediately. The thing is, is you don't know how you're going to react to something like this until it happens. And everybody will react differently. There is no perfect cookie cutter way you are supposed to react. At any rate, Peter was brought in for questioning. He volunteered to take a polygraph test, which he passed. He talked to the police without a lawyer because he said that would make him look innocent. Always get a lawyer, folks. They subjected him to 24 straight hours of interrogation when he finally confessed to killing his mom. Very quickly afterwards, though, he would recant his confession. He said he was coerced into this. He was browbeaten until he said the thing they wanted to hear. They had no physical evidence, nothing to connect him to the murder. But at any rate, he goes on trial and because of his own confession, he's convicted. And he is sentenced to 6 to 16 years in prison for manslaughter. In 1974, renowned playwright Arthur Miller became a huge supporter of Peter and basically offered to pay legal fees to get his appeal done. He was granted an appeal. They discovered that the original prosecutor, who has now died of a heart attack, he had files that they discovered where he withheld evidence and witness testimony, damaging evidence that suggested that Peter had no way of being able to do this. Because Peter Riley, that was his last name, he had been seen driving his prized possession, his car, by multiple people. Very reliable people. All during the time when Barbara would have been murdered. Prosecution said, nah, we're not going to tell that to people. We're not going to call those witnesses or let the defense know. And then another look at the case determined that he, in fact, was coerced. And they based their suspicions simply off of him not being emotional enough. In 1977, his conviction was overturned. A person's emotional reactions is not evidence that you can really say is evidence that a person committed murder. But police just felt that he did it, and so they just made it seem that way. And just, you know, Even after his conviction was overturned, police would basically continue to slander his name, stating that they still believe he was the guilty party. Even with evidence, now having evidence that he could not have done it. I don't know if there was DNA left behind and that's how he determined she was sexually assaulted. So I'm not sure about that particular route. But they haven't announced any other suspects. In 1978, he ends up suing the police department for $2 million because they continued to say he was guilty. That case would later be dismissed. And then we're back to square one. Barbara Gibbons, a 51-year-old mother, was found stabbed to death and sexually assaulted in her home. Her son was very likely falsely accused, and a proper investigation was completely just thrown to the side. They didn't investigate anyone else other than Peter, which now means that that person, whoever actually killed her, has had decades to just trash any evidence, to get as far away as possible, to never be caught. And that is not fair to Barbara. She deserves justice. She hasn't gotten it yet. But somebody somewhere out there may know the truth. This was in the 70s, and at this point in 2024, her killer is very likely dead, or perhaps maybe in their 70s to 80s. And if they're still out there, they deserve to be caught and spend whatever little time they have left in prison. If you have information about the murder of Barbara Gibbons, please contact the authorities at 860-626-1820. It's been 17 years, and they are still absolutely baffled. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Blake and China Dickus. Viewer discretion is advised. It was July 24th, 2006 in Franklin, Indiana. At 5.15 p.m. that same night, Sean Dickus would come home and find his wife and his son brutally murdered. Sean and China had been married for some time. Blake was not her biological son, but she was completely motherly to him. She loved him dearly. As a matter of fact, China got along really well with Christina, who was Blake's mom. There was a shared custody situation, and the entire thing was very amicable. Everybody got along. There were no issues. Blake was supposed to be dropped off at China's house that same night because there were plans for them to go to a movie. But once China didn't drop him off, Christina said she got a little annoyed, and so she went to the house. When she gets there, she sees a sea of police cars, 
Sean had just gotten home not too soon before that and, you know, found the bodies. China Dickus had been stabbed many times. Blake seemed to get the worst of the attack. He had been beaten, he had been smothered, and he had been stabbed. This was just a horrible crime. Police very quickly ruled out Christina. She had an alibi. They were able to prove that she had nothing to do with this. And since Sean Dickus was the one to find the bodies, police thought, you're probably the guy. They really, like, honed in on him. They looked very hard at his day, who he was, his financial records, his relationship with China and Blake and Christina. They looked for his, you know, where he was. He did seem a little detached during all of this, almost unemotional. But at the same time, you could see that he was genuinely destroyed. After a very thorough investigation into Sean Dickus, and after giving him a polygraph test, which he passed, they determined that he also had nothing to do with this. And that's kind of unbelievable. Usually this is someone within the family or friend group. The attack, especially on Blake, was very personal. Nothing was stolen from the house. There was no forced entry. There had been a series of break-ins going on around the same time. As a matter of fact, the same day the murders happened, another home just down the street was broken into. But all of those break-ins had forced entry. This one did not. Some thought, well, was China the ultimate target? Was someone jealous of her new husband? Was someone jealous that she was giving attention to this kid? Nobody knows. They recently submitted evidence for DNA, but they found no DNA. So if you have information about this double homicide, please call 317-346-1100. 41 years ago, a young boy vanished, and today they are still wondering, where is Bobby Joe? Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Bobby Joe Fritz. Viewer discretion is advised. At the time of this case, Bobby Joe Fritz was just five years old. He was four foot tall and 50 pounds. Bobby lived with his family in this general area in Campbellsport, Wisconsin, which was pretty close to the Milwaukee River. Bobby Joe was one of several kids, and, and actually his parents were separated. His dad and two of his brothers lived in Illinois, and then he was living with his mom and four other siblings. It was May 14th, 1983, sometime between 2.30 p.m. and 4.30 p.m. Robert was out in the neighborhood playing with his sister and other kids. He said he got hungry, he was going to walk home to go get some food. Bobby Joe was last seen walking down this road, but he never got home and it wouldn't be long for his mom and siblings to realize that he was missing. So the police are contacted and the search for the five-year-old boy begins immediately. They searched this entire neighborhood, knocked on every door. They dredged the river and all bodies of water nearby because they thought maybe he accidentally fell in and drowned. But they came up with nothing when they did that. But they continued to search the waters and the land right around the water. Hundreds of people would start to volunteer to help look for the little boy, and they searched on foot every possible place they could, but they never, ever found him. They did look into the possibility that maybe his dad had somehow done something to him, but they were able to very quickly rule that possibility out. Police then looked into this guy, Michael Scott Menzer. He became a suspect about a year or so after Bobby Joe disappeared. In 1980, he was convicted of molesting a young child. He didn't serve much time. In 1990, he burned down the Waldo Mill, I guess, where he was living, and his two stepchildren that he had at that time were both killed. He was also accused of sexually abusing both of those kids. He was acquitted of doing that, but he was tried for the two murders, and he was found guilty. He got a 40-year prison sentence for that. He was literally living right next to where Bobby Joe was probably taken from, but police needed to find evidence. They would end up digging up his property that he used to live on. They were given tips about certain locations where he would frequent, and they dug there as well. And yes, they dug near where the home used to stand, but they got nothing. Bobby Joe Fritz has never been located. Not a single trace of him ever found. No clothing or anything. But they do believe that he was taken and he was likely killed. The motive was likely sexual in nature. However, if still alive today, he may look something like this. If you have information about what happened to Bobby Joe Fritz, please call 
1761. Was this just an accident or was it murder? Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Bonnie Craig. Viewer discretion is advised. At the time of this case, Bonnie Craig was an 18-year-old freshman at college, and she was living in Anchorage, Alaska. She was originally born in Canada. Bonnie was always regarded as a really good student in high school and also in her early portions of college. Bonnie was actually studying to become a psychologist. She loved to write music. She loved playing the violin. She enjoyed writing poetry. She had a zest for life and was just getting started. But on September 28th, 1994, that would all end. Early that morning, around 5 a.m., she would get up and begin her walk to the bus stop. She would take a bus to the University of Alaska. It was actually a 45-minute walk to the bus stop, but she enjoyed doing it. However, Bonnie, the 18-year-old, never made it to school that day. But her family didn't even really have time to report her missing because a discovery was made pretty quickly. Here at McHugh Creek, the body of a young female was found. She had been face down in the water. At first glance, it looked as if she had accidentally fallen off of a high cliffside and landed in the ground below. The body would soon be identified as 18-year-old Bonnie Craig. Her mother, pictured here at the scene of the incident, did not think that this was an accident. First of all, this was a very long distance away from the bus stop she was supposed to be going to. Bonnie didn't have a car or anything, so how Bonnie even got this far out is confusing to her. When she saw her body, she noticed that Bonnie had defensive wounds on her. And Bonnie's backpack and her purse and all the belongings she carried out of the house with her was not there at the scene. Her mom wanted to know, was there anything else? Was there like a sexual assault that happened? But at first, the police did not really say much to her at all. Which is interesting because Bonnie's mom, Karen, she did undercover work for the police force. But eventually, the police would tell Karen that Bonnie was not sexually assaulted. Six months after that, she's told something completely different. Police had found male bodily fluid with Bonnie, indicating that there was a sexual act, but they couldn't say whether or not Bonnie was actually sexually assaulted or if it was consensual. So Bonnie's mom, she started to investigate this on her own. She felt that it had something to do with her undercover work. She had been involved in busting certain like drug rings and other types of large illegal operations. And therefore, when a person is arrested, they have a right to know who is their accuser, essentially. And so the police files would actually end up showing Karen's name. So she thought, well, maybe someone saw the name and wanted to get retribution. And so Karen was looking down that path. But eventually, she couldn't find any tangible proof that that was what it was. One of Bonnie's professors, this is Bonnie pictured with her boyfriend. By the way, the boyfriend didn't even live in the same state and he was ruled out. One of Bonnie's professors would go to police to suggest that a fellow student may have done this based on some, I guess, shady behavior of the student. So police looked into that person and they found out that it was not him. They had taken the DNA from Bonnie's body and run it against that particular individual and it wasn't a match. Bonnie's mom was like, well, that doesn't mean he wasn't involved. It just means that he wasn't the one to leave the DNA because maybe there was two people involved, which is definitely a possibility. But nothing else came from that. In September of 1997, this is now about three years later, police officially announced to the public that Bonnie, in fact, was raped. And they also announced that she had been beaten and her going over the cliff was not an accident and that they were really looking at this as a homicide. Police would get some tips stating that, you know, Bonnie was seen getting inside of a vehicle or talking to two men in a car, and that maybe she got into that car. Some witnesses said they saw her at the bus stop. Some said they saw her away from the bus stop. They got so many tips that really didn't lead to any new information. And a lot of it just wasn't accurate. And so her case, really, it just goes cold. And then finally, in 2006, they plugged the DNA into the system. At that point, they finally got a hit because a man was placed into a prison in New Hampshire and he was required to give his DNA. It was 100% match to the DNA found with Bonnie. It belonged to this man, 36-year-old Kenneth Dion. He was living in Anchorage, Alaska at the time the murder happened. He was in prison this time for a whole bunch of armed robberies. He was also charged with several counts of assault. In May of 2007, he was officially charged with the murder 
of Bonnie Craig. And this is largely in part due to the DNA. He goes on trial and he actually admits that he was with her. He said they had consensual sex. And then she accidentally fell and hit her head after they were done. But when he was first questioned about it, he said he never knew her, he never met her, never came into contact with her. But when they said, well, we have DNA, that's when he told that story. Bonnie was in a really committed relationship at the time. She loved her boyfriend. Why on earth would she just hook up with this random stranger at five something in the morning while walking to a bus stop? This was very clearly a wrong place, wrong time situation for Bonnie. They believe that he snatched her up when she was on her walk. It was dark. And then he brought her to that location where he raped her and then he killed her. He was found guilty of her murder and also of sexual assault. And he was sentenced to about 225 years in prison. Drop the soap. 51 years after a boy's body was found in a dumpster, his killer was finally identified. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Brad Bellino. Viewer discretion is advised. At the time of this case, Brad Bellino was just 12 years old. He and his family lived in Boardman, Ohio, and he had been reported missing on March 31st, 1972. On that particular evening, he had been over at a friend's house, and he left that friend's house somewhere between 7.30 p.m. and 8 p.m., and he was supposed to be on his way home, but he never got home. The 12-year-old boy who was described as gentle with a sunny disposition was reported missing by his parents. And I guess it wasn't unusual for him to walk home. I, I guess it wasn't a super long distance. The community of Boardman would get together and they would all begin searching for him. They searched high and low. They searched under every bush, under every tree, and he was just nowhere to be found. And at that point, they were fearing the worst. On April 4th, 1972, those fears became reality. This was, I guess, like a, a grocery store and behind it was this dumpster. One of the employees had been throwing some stuff away when they noticed something horrific. It was a body of a young boy. Police arrive very shortly after that and they bring the body to the coroner. And sadly, it is identified as 12-year-old Brad Bellino. He had a leather belt tied around his neck and his clothing appeared to have been like hastily put back on him. He was also sexually assaulted. An investigation into the boy's murder began, but they really kind of had almost nothing from the get-go. They said they got a lot of like phony leads and information. They had about two significant tips, but those led to nothing. And Bradley's case just went ice cold. Decades would go by. Investigators who are part of a cold case team would take the box of evidence and they would go through the clothing Brad was found in. They sent it to a forensics lab and they were able to swab the clothing and they actually got DNA from it. DNA from his would-be killer. And then it actually took a couple of more years for that DNA to be processed and gone through the system. And they used the advancements in DNA technology to link it to, I guess, a particular family. Some members of this family were willingly gave up their DNA, and then some they had to acquire the DNA through other methods. But it would come back with a match. It matched a man named Joseph Norman Hill, a man who was a trucker back in 1972. He was never a suspect in the case. His name never came up. They had never even heard of him. Sadly, there will not be justice. He died in a nursing home in 2019. This was likely a scenario where he just saw a young boy on the road. He took him, sexually assaulted him, and killed him. For Brad's sake, I hope the man is rotting in hell. He is more than likely responsible for seven murders. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Brandon Howell. Viewer discretion is advised. 16-year-old Tabitha Brewer was dating 19-year-old Nicholas Travis, and they lived in Shawnee, Kansas. On the night of April 27th, 1998, the two of them would go over to Tabitha's dad's apartment where he lived with Tabitha's stepmom. At around midnight, they were seen leaving the apartment and at that point, a friend had met up with them. That friend was Brandon Howell. Apparently, he was going to be hanging out with them that night. However, after that particular evening, nobody ever saw Tabitha or Nicholas again. Their parents would report them missing pretty quickly and they wanted to question Brandon Howell because he was the last one to see them. He says he had dropped them off at a Circle K, and this was near 75th Street and Interstate 35. I don't know if they ever confirmed with like CCTV footage or not, and right away the 
Police said, okay, the two of them probably, you know, they're this young couple, they probably just ran off. They'll be back soon. They weren't. Three days later, in a dumpster in Kansas City, Missouri, they also find the burned identification cards of both Tabitha and Nicholas, but there were no signs of them at all. Fast forward now to August of 1998, just behind this home, which was only a couple of houses down from where that dumpster was, but now several months later, in a shallow grave, they find the body of Nicholas Travis. His death was ruled a homicide. He had multiple fractures to his skull, and so he was killed with a blunt force in instrument. However, they did not find Tabitha. Brandon Howell was considered at this point a suspect in this case. As all of this is happening, he is also convicted of attempted robbery, kidnapping, animal cruelty for an unrelated case. He was convicted in 1999 of that case. In 2006, he was then charged with the double homicide of both Tabitha and Nicholas, even though they had yet to recover Tabitha's body. They had a shoe impression they found. I guess they found like a shoe impression on the inside of Brandon Howell's vehicle, indicating someone may have been in that trunk, but they didn't know who it belonged to. There was really no other evidence. And so Brandon Howell was acquitted of that double murder. He can never be tried for it again. The motive behind him doing this could possibly be that Tabitha had recently come into $40,000, I guess from like an, a car accident settlement, but he didn't know she wouldn't actually get it yet. It was actually being held in a trust until she turned 18. So if that was his motive, he never got it. In 2014, Brandon Howell was charged with the murders of these five people, George and Ann Taylor, Lorraine Hurst, Daryl Hurst, Susan Schaukroon, Brandon had initially started to, I guess, steal one of their cars, which led to a burglary, I think, in their home. He ends up beating these two to death, and then he shoots and kills their three neighbors. It wouldn't be until about 2019 or so, I believe, when he would go on trial for those five homicides, in which he would eventually be found guilty on all five counts, plus a, a whole list of other charges related to that case, like robbery and whatnot. And so he was found guilty and he was sentenced to five consecutive life sentences without parole. So he will never be out again. Meanwhile, Tabitha Brewer is still missing. She's never been located. He won't say where she is. He won't admit to killing her or Nicholas, but her family does not have the answer. They don't have that closure. They don't have that peace. They don't get to bury her, lay her to rest. She's still out there somewhere, alone, in a grave. And hopefully one day somebody can find her. Seven people, at least. But at least this evil monster will never be able to hurt another innocent person ever again. A car on fire and a tragedy inside. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Brianne Ginty. Viewer discretion is advised. This story happened in Catawba County, which is in North Carolina. Brianne Mary Ginty was just 22 years old. She had graduated recently from Mitchell Community College with her associate's degree, and then she was enrolled at the University of North Carolina. She was working in management at a Target store. Her family and friends described her as an absolute go-getter. She was incredibly intelligent, and she was someone you could always rely on. Like, if you were in any kind of trouble, she was always someone that would be there to help but sadly, someone would violently take her from the world. On the morning of June 7, 2012, a vehicle was found completely engulfed in flames. Once the fire was contained and the smoke settled, they discovered that there was a body inside. The license plate was still intact, so they were able to find out who the car belonged to, and that's what led them to Brianne Ginty. And then from there, they would soon confirm the body inside was hers. Almost right away, her boyfriend, Antoine Reed, was arrested because he had been with her the night prior to her death. But Jermaine Wilkes, his cousin, was also with them that night. What they found out was that the three of them had been drinking and playing cards the night before. Brienne and Antoine had gotten into an argument and Antoine left. He and Jermaine tried to get back in the house a little bit later, but she had locked the door. So he took a knife, he cut out a screen, the boyfriend did. He climbed into her house, unlocked the door, and let Jermaine back in. Then there was more arguments. And then Antoine left, and Jermaine stayed behind this time. Brienne and Jermaine manage to get into her car, and they go to try to pick up Antoine. Another argument breaks out, Antoine gets out of the car and begins walking home again. 
That's the last time he ever saw Brienne, but Jermaine was still with her. Police then bring in Jermaine Wilkes for questioning. And after a couple of hours of talking to police, he confesses that he killed her. From what I understand, he and Brienne then got into an argument in Brienne's home, so they must have gone back to her place. Police discovered enough evidence there to indicate that she was killed there, which he would later confirm. He said he was high and intoxicated, and then they got into a fight where he basically beat her and killed her. And he didn't want anyone to know about it, so he put her body in her own car and burned it in the woods. Brienne's boyfriend, Antoine, was cleared of any wrongdoing, and he was then released and not charged with anything. It doesn't sound like there was a sexual assault in play, and it sounds like police believe relatively that this was like a heat-of-the-moment crime of passion type thing. So Jermaine Wilkes pleads guilty to second-degree murder, and he was sentenced to 20 to 26 years in prison. He was in his early 20s, and so he will get another chance at life. Brienne doesn't. A 21-year-old man is currently missing from Corpus Christi, Texas. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Caleb Harris. Viewer discretion is advised. Now, I'm filming this video around 9 o'clock in the morning on March 10th, 2024. So if there is new or updated information, it won't be in this video. Caleb Harris, pictured here with his family, is 21 years old. He is a Texas A&M University student at Corpus Christi, and he lives at the cottages at Corpus Christi. It was the very early morning hours of, I believe, Monday, March 4th, 2024, around 2.45 a.m. when, like, this actually happens. They have this information based on a Snapchat ping that I guess Caleb did. He had let his dog out that morning to go to the bathroom. Caleb left his ID, his car keys, his shoes inside. And according to investigators, his phone was actually dead by 3 o'clock in the morning, just 15 minutes later. And then the 21-year-old Caleb Harris just vanished. There really isn't much known, or at least not publicized at this time of me making this video, about the circumstances of how he disappeared. But Caleb is literally just gone. His cell phone hasn't been used. All of his belongings were left inside. According to his family, there were no indications that Caleb was in any kind of trouble, that he was in danger, he didn't have any enemies that they knew about. He had not mentioned that he was just going to be leaving or traveling or anything like that. As a matter of fact, his dad said that Caleb had ordered his lunch for the following day at school. I guess that's something they would typically do. So the community, along with police, have all gone out and they are looking everywhere for him. Searching high and low, they're also canvassing the area, they're knocking on doors, they're interviewing people. They have brought in scent dogs, cadaver dogs, to see if they can pick up his scent anywhere, but I think they have not had any luck yet. The family has also hired a private investigator to help out, and I read a quote that this private investigator thinks he knows what happened based on the information he has. However, that information has not been made public. But it sounds like they've come to the conclusion that this was not something he did on his own accord. That he did not leave willingly. The Corpus Christi police are still stating that this is currently a missing persons case and not a criminal investigation as of right now. It sounds like there may have been foul play involved. But as of right now, I can't confirm that. I also don't know the status of his dog. There is also a GoFundMe fundraiser his family has put together in order to fund the search efforts. But most importantly, if you have any information about the whereabouts of Caleb Harris, you need to please call 361-886-2840 or 361-886-2600. A car found engulfed in flames, but was the owner inside. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Carlos Reyes. Viewer discretion is advised. At the time of this case, Carlos Reyes was a 20-year-old young man living in Danbury, Connecticut. The stories keep advertising that he was a DoorDash driver, but I don't see anything relating to the fact of, like, was he doing a DoorDash when this case occurred? But Carlos was last seen by his family on the night of March 28th, 2022. This was about 11 p.m. But then they never heard from him again. They never saw him again. The following night, on March 29th, 2022, police in Brewster, New York, got reports of a vehicle on fire on the side of the road. 
They spend quite some time extinguishing the flames, and when the flames are all gone, they do not find a person inside. The vehicle in question was a 2008 Gray Infinity. When they ran the plates, they discovered the car belonged to 20-year-old Carlos Reyes. Sometime very shortly before this, he is reported missing officially by his family. Ever since the discovery of the car, police have been pretty quiet about what information they have. I'm going to tell you right now, I'm, you know, filming this in March of 2024, he hasn't been found. About a week or so after the vehicle was found and as they're searching for him, police, I guess, got a warrant to search this pond. And the pond is located in Danbury, Connecticut. They search it, they look for hours, but they don't find whatever it is they were looking for. And they don't find any sign of Carlos Reyes. On April 4... Ugh. On April 14, 2022, police arrested this man. Christopher Lemke. Well, he was arrested because he held a woman at gunpoint and stole her car. And he did all that because he was trying to escape police for an unrelated weapons charge. But police announced, and they were pretty vague with this, that Lemke may have information that pertains to the whereabouts or what happened to Carlos Reyes. And that's when they announced that when they searched that pond, they were doing so with Christopher Lemke as a possible person of interest. However, what information he may have has never been released to the public. I also read somewhere else that police, I guess on May 9th, 2022, had searched a property about 60 miles away, and this was now in Massachusetts, and that this may have had a connection to searching for Carlos Reyes, but that search turned up nothing as well. According to one individual, they said that the search was with regards to a possible body being located, but a body was not located. And as of now, Carlos Reyes has still not been found. There have been no traces of him found. I don't know if they've checked his cell phone and have they done cell tower pings, I'm not sure. So if you have any information about the disappearance of Carlos Reyes, please call 203-796-1601. Help bring Carlos home. Hello, true crimeers. There is actually a really wonderful update on the case I covered, I believe, back in January. The missing child case of Sincere Vines from Buffalo, New York. I was informed just earlier this morning by one of his family members that he has now been found and he is found safe, alive, and well. He was, I believe, found in Atlanta and he has since been returned back to uh, Buffalo. I do not know the circumstances of what happened to him, what he went through. I don't know how he got there. And quite frankly, that's none of my business and it's none of anyone's business but the family's. The only thing that matters is that this teenager, Sincere Vines, is home with his family and he is safe. And he is alive. It's not often you get to make updates like this and stories like this. So this is definitely a really, really amazing outcome. I'm happy for his family, and I hope they are able to kind of figure this out and, 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 and move forward. There is an unfortunate update in a case that I covered in August of 2023. If you click on the comment, you can go back to the original case. But as of this morning, March 7th, 2024, police in Tulsa, Oklahoma have said that the remains of the missing man, Timothy Van Mater, have been found. Timothy was last seen on March 18th, 2023, leaving his home, and he was captured on CCTV footage doing that. Later, they would find his vehicle, but were not able to find out where he was. The remains of a person were found here in this general area, and I guess this is called Mohawk Park in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Apparently, where he was found was in an area that was very difficult to initially get to. And that's why people weren't able to find him, you know, during the course of the initial searches. Two individuals were just out there searching for deer antlers and they noticed something kind of, I don't know, I guess white in the distance. And so they used binoculars to see what it was and to them it looked like a body. And so they would go to police and then the body was found and recovered and was then identified as Timothy Van Mater. As of right now, they have stated that foul play is not suspected. So this may have just been a tragic accident. But his cause of death, as of me filming right now, has not been, like, released. In a way, I guess this does end, you know, the family's suffering. Because sometimes the not knowing can be a lot worse than knowing what happened. 
but now they will be able to lay him to rest, and hopefully they can soon find peace. An arrest has been made in the John Walter Lay case, the obvious hate crime. You can click the comment to go back to the original video, but real quick, John Walter Lay was a gay man in Florida who was shot and killed at a dog park by this moldy sack of russet potatoes here, Gerald Declan Radford. He was actually arrested back on March 8th, so I apologize for not seeing that update. But in the weeks and even months leading up to this shooting, Gerald had been harassing Walt at the dog park. He had been throwing homophobic slurs at him. He had threatened the man. It got to a point where Walt had to stop going to that dog park and went to another one, but then he ended up going back to his original dog park because that's the dog park that was his. And then a day prior to the shooting, he essentially made a threat towards Walt. Walt told his family via text, and then the following day, this, this disformed bowling pin shot and killed him. And at first, police in Florida were not going to arrest him because he said, it's self-defense. Uh, he, he, he scratched me. Girl, please. Even if he did, you don't pull out a gun and shoot someone point blank in the chest. An unarmed man. So he was charged with second degree murder, which I don't, it should have been first degree murder, but, and I guess it has a hate crime element to that charge. God forbid you just be who you are in this place. God forbid you're just trying to peacefully live your life, but someone doesn't like the people you love. And so they shoot and kill you. I hope that he gets the justice he deserves. Hi, Ted. You're dead. Good. Was this killer inspired by Ted Bundy? Uh Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Cesar Baron. Viewer discretion is advised. He was actually born Adolph James Road in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. After his parents divorced, he was basically raised primarily by his father and his dad's new wife. But since his teenage years, he's always been a troublemaker. By age 15, he threatened to stab a 70-year-old neighbor of his. He was put into, like, a place for troubled youths for, like, a little while. But he remained a violent and crazy teenager who became involved with illegal substances. He committed several burglaries, robberies, and he was arrested and convicted and sentenced to, like, two years in prison. By 1980, oh god. It looks like he probably wanted to say, felt cute, might delete later. By 1980, he would end up changing his name, for whatever reason, to Cesar Barone. While still living in Florida, he committed more burglaries and robberies and was put in prison yet again. And it would be this time where he was in the same prison as Ted Bundy. They met, they chatted, maybe he was inspired by him, who knows. By that time, Ted Bundy was already known as a serial killer. Cesar was released back into the world by 1987. He would then join the U.S. Army, but then eventually he would end up getting in trouble for exposing himself to a female officer. That's then also when the Army found out about his name change and that he had spent a whole bunch of time in prison, and so he was discharged. At this point, Cesar then moved to Oregon. And in April of 1991, 61-year-old Margaret Schilt was found murdered in her home. And this was in Hillsboro, Oregon. She had been sexually assaulted, and her cause of death was strangulation. In October of 1992, he would shoot up this Volkswagen bug. He then dragged the woman out of it who was driving it, shot her, sexually assaulted her, and then shot her in the head, killing her. Her name was Martha Bryant. In December of 1992, 23-year-old Shanti Woodman was found murdered. She was sexually assaulted and then shot to death. In January of 1993, he broke into the apartment of this woman, 51-year-old Betty Williams, where he had sexually assaulted her and then she died of a heart attack during this attack. He was eventually caught because of jailhouse informants because he was in and out of jails during these murders in Oregon. And he was bragging about how he had murdered these women. So he would be arrested and I believe they had evidence to link him to all four murders. And he would go to trial and he was convicted of four counts of homicide and he was sentenced to death. Just like his butt buddy Bundy. He is suspected to have killed more women, especially in Florida, and possibly more in Oregon. Police were hoping he would talk, but he never did. In December of 2009, he died. Not from execution, but after a long battle with cancer. Holy Land USA was a religious-themed theme park in Connecticut, and it would be the site of a brutal homicide. 
Hello, true Kramerers. This is the case of Chloe Ottman. Viewer discretion is advised. At the time of this case, Chloe Ottman was just 16 years old and she was a resident of Waterbury, Connecticut. She was a student at Crosby High School. She was very popular. Her friends would say that Chloe had a lot of presence. She had compassion. She was extremely loyal. She was very open with you. She had a sly sense of humor. She was labeled the best sister you could have, and she was an amazing daughter. Her favorite color was purple. She loved drama class. She was a big fan of the Twilight books. Chloe was just your typical American teenager who had a very bright future ahead of her. She was someone who was just really, really loved. But unfortunately, someone would take all of that from the world because simply he was rejected. Holy Land USA is a Christian theme park or was a Christian theme park in Waterbury, Connecticut. It was about 18 acres large. It was based on certain passages from the Bible. It had like replicas of catacombs. Old style buildings were like built into the mountain. It actually opened in 1955 and then by 1984 it closed. And then for a large chunk of time, Holy Land USA was just an abandoned place. Kids would go there, hang out there, that kind of thing. In 2010, a horrific murder took place there. It was July 15th, 2010. Chloe was supposed to be going out with a friend of hers, like her best friend that had been her friend for the past couple of years. And that was 19 year old Francisco Cruz. Well, Chloe basically never came home that night and she was reported missing. But everyone knew that Francisco Cruz was the last person to see her because that's who she was hanging out with. I believe it was a day or so after she was reported missing when Francisco Cruz would end up leading police to where her body was because he had killed her. He had just treated her like she was garbage and just dumped her like trash in the woods. There is a special place in hell for people like that who just not only have a disregard for human life in terms of just taking it, but then just to sort of throw a body away just like it's your weekly garbage is just such a, I don't know why that makes me so mad, but it does. But he would end up confessing to what happened. The two best friends had gone to Holy Land USA, which was then abandoned, and they were just going to hang out. Chloe thought, well, we're just going there to have a couple of drinks and just hang out as friends. But Francisco made a pass at her, like a sexual advance towards her, and she said no, she rejected it because she actually had a boyfriend and he knew that. He ended up strangling her. Chloe then fell unconscious and then he sexually assaulted her as she was unconscious. And now he's in a position where, well, nobody can know this and she's a witness, obviously. So he took out a knife and he stabbed her in her neck until he knew she was dead and then he just took her body, this so-called best friend of his and just threw her in the woods. He murdered her underneath the big cross, which is there at Holy Land. That's where this horrific crime took place. Once he confessed, he was charged with her murder and he ended up taking a plea agreement instead of going to trial. And because of a plea agreement was done, the judge was only allowed to sentence him to a maximum of 55 years in prison. I believe there is no possibility of parole. He was 20 years old when he was sentenced. He will be 75-ish when released from prison. He will be a very old man. And I think even the judge or someone, a part of the case, basically looked at him and said, you're gonna probably die in prison. And more than likely he will. And when he does, I hope it is awful. But at least Chloe got the justice she rightfully deserved. Hello, True Crimeers. This is the case of Colleen Finlay. Viewer discretion is advised. Colleen lived with her husband and their three children in Fraser Valley, and that is located in Vancouver in Canada. Unfortunately, I only have one photo of the victim and no other photos at all. Colleen was a loving mother. She was a great mother. She loved taking the kids out to go do fun things, and she actually had plans to do that on the evening of November 12th, 2002. Her and her husband were planning on taking the kids to a Canucks game after dinner that night, but sadly Colleen would not get to do that. Because on that November 12th, 2002 morning, her husband would 
pack the three kids into their vehicle, one of their vehicles, and he would drive them to a dentist appointment. That would be the last time that he and the kids would ever see Colleen alive again. A couple of hours later, they arrive back home to find that the house is on fire. And inside was the body of 39-year-old Colleen Finlay. Their other vehicle and SUV had been stolen. When Colleen was found, she was bound with like duct tape. She had three cuts across her throat, but they were very superficial cuts. Her actual cause of death was smoke inhalation, meaning she was alive when the fire was set and she burned alive. The coroner surmised that whoever did this to her probably thought she was dead when they cut her throat, but she wasn't. Not too soon afterwards, they end up finding the vehicle, and outside of it are a group of teenagers who were smoking cigarettes. One of those kids was a 15-year-old named Jeremy Vojkovic, whose photo I cannot find. He was brought in for questioning, and eventually it was determined that he was the one who had killed Colleen. He was the one who was driving the car. He didn't know Colleen and her family, and eventually he would plead guilty to the murder and he would say what happened. As he was, I guess, walking down the road that day, he happened across a barn, which happened to be the barn next to Colleen's house. They owned the barn. And he had gone in there to see if he can steal some things, and then Colleen walked in on him. He put her in a chokehold. He then found duct tape, and he tied her up by the wrists. He put duct tape over her mouth and her eyes. He demanded any money from the house, and she only had $50 in cash, which he got. And then he sexually assaulted her. She asked him, why are you doing this? And all he said to her was, it doesn't matter, just be quiet. He then took out a Swiss army knife and he cut her throat three times. She fell onto the bed and stopped moving. He thought she was dead. But then he found gasoline and he dumped it all over her body and lit her on fire. And then he fled. According to him, this was his very first robbery. And he ended up taking the life of an innocent mother. He got life in prison, but because he was a minor, he could get paroled after four years. However, he is still in prison to this day. The theatrical release of the movie Escape Room had to be pushed back a few months because of a real-life tragedy that occurred in a real-life escape room. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of the Polish escape room deaths. Viewer discretion is advised. The story took place in Poland back in 2019. Five teenage girls who were all really close friends were celebrating one of their birthdays. All of them were 15 years old and they decided they wanted to do something fun, so they went to an escape room. This particular escape room was located, I guess, in a, a building that used to be a residence that was then transformed into a business. The five girls arrived, they were super excited, this was gonna be a lot of fun. I personally have never done an escape room. I don't know if I'm intelligent enough to ever do one, but they wanted to see if they could figure it out, and unfortunately they would never get that opportunity. They first entered the building, they got into the reception area, and after that they were then put into the actual escape room, and the door was locked because that's what you do in escape rooms. And of course the idea is you're supposed to solve a series of riddles or find clues that helps you unlock the escape room to your freedom, your safety, and yay, you've won. At some point, after the five teenagers were then locked into the room, a fire broke out, they think, in the waiting room area, the reception area. The fire began to spread very quickly, and what happened was it ended up blocking, I guess, the one entrance into this escape room, so the people who were their employed there did not have any way of getting inside the room to save the five girls. One of the employees did suffer from some extreme burns, but would survive. The fire was caused, eventually they would find out, from a gas leak in the heating system. What happened when the fire broke out and it basically locked these poor girls inside this room with really no way out of it, because of the fire, it created carbon monoxide and the five girls were inhaling that carbon monoxide and they were with no way out, no windows, no ventilation system for whatever reason and no emergency exits. They all slowly suffocated 
until they passed out. By the time fire and ambulance arrived, they were able to treat the man outside the room for his burns. He was rushed to the hospital, but like I said, he would survive. But they would end up putting the fire out and breaking into the locked room where they unfortunately found all five teenage girls had died. Initially, the firefighters believed that this was caused due to faulty wiring, but they would learn of the bottled gas thing that ruptured and caused this fire to occur. There were five families that had to lay their children to rest forever. They had a, a joint funeral, which is just a tragedy in itself that that's something that ever has to happen. Five 15-year-old girls whose lives were completely ahead of them, died doing something they were super excited to do, something that was going to, was supposed to be really fun. The investigation into this would find out that there was a shit ton of negligence in this building. Like I said at the beginning, this was not like a business office or a business building. This was a, a house that was transformed into this escape room business. The owners, however, did not notify anyone of the switch to a business. Therefore, there was no safety inspections done in this escape room. The heaters that were inside the building were placed way too close, almost like up against items that were highly flammable, like curtains and stuff. They had makeshift electrical installations. These were not professionally installed things. They just sort of jimmy-rigged them. They had no emergency route there was no emergency exit for the escape room itself. There were no warnings given to the people who would use this, like, hey, in case of an emergency, go this way, that way. They didn't have a plan. And so because of all of these just insane violations, they would end up arresting the venue's owner. He was charged with deliberately creating the danger of a fire and unintentionally causing the death of people in a fire. This was obviously not an intended homicide, but he created the situation which led to these deaths. They also would end up charging the owner's grandmother who took out the business in her name, the owner's mother who was a co-owner of the business, and then a 27-year-old employee who worked there who was the employee who actually himself got burned. All four of these people have denied their guilt, saying that they did not do this intentionally. And there's no argument that they did this intentionally. The argument is that they created a situation, an unsafe situation, with no plans, and they didn't inform the proper people in order to get a safety inspection. And so what happened after this was Poland, who I guess had like over 1,100 different escape rooms, they would all go through mandatory safety inspections after that. And I think somewhere around 12 or 13 of them were shut down completely because they broke safety protocols. The four individuals were indicted back in 2021, but I do not see any more updates on this case. And so I don't know what the outcome was for those individuals. And if it wasn't those five teenagers, it would have just been the next group of people that went into that room. Those families should never have had to bury their daughters, but hopefully in some way, shape or form, they get some kind of justice. The video you see behind me are the final horrific moments of a man's life who died in one of the worst deaths imaginable. Viewer discretion is advised. This story happened to a 31-year-old man named Alex Reed Paxton back in 2020. Alex was a commercial diver. On October 27, 2020, he was working at the Oliver Dam, which was on the Chattahoochee River, and that is in Columbus, Georgia. Alex was supposed to be doing an exploratory dive because there was a chain malfunction going on somewhere near a pipe. Alex was told that every single valve was closed and that lockout procedures were in place. The footage you are about to see is from his camera. And just a trigger warning, just in case, this may be upsetting to some people. Alex Paxton was lied to. All of the valves were not closed. 
lockout tag procedures were not being done properly. Alex had gotten close to a high pressure pipe where again, the valve was supposed to be closed, but it wasn't. And because he had to dive next to this pipe, that's when you hear the very audible, what sounds like a lot of you know swishing water and him screaming. His arm was sucked into this pipe and he would end up being pinned by 850 pounds of pressure. And for the next several minutes, Alex was struggling to breathe because the force of this pressure was so strong that he was no longer able to expand his chest. So for roughly three minutes, Alex was underwater and suffocating while having his arm being forced into this pipe with 850 pounds of pressure. This was 100% the fault of the people operating the dam. He went into that water thinking everything was being done correctly by them. Unfortunately, it wasn't and it cost him his life and he died in a horrific manner. Georgia Power, who I guess ran and operated this dam, was obviously sued by the family. And in 2023, at the end of the year, they would eventually settle out of court. I don't know the amount of money that was given, but Georgia Power essentially would have to take blame in this. He was a professional who had been doing this for 10 years, and sadly, he was failed. Having coffee injected into your veins could be one of the worst ways to die. This is another worst deaths imaginable. Viewer discretion is advised. This story happened in Brazil back in 2012 to an 80-year-old patient. One of her nurses was a trainee. She had just started, I think it was three or four days prior to working with her. This patient had two separate bags. One of them was for food. The other one was for medicine. The two bags are really close to one another and the nurse would later say it's really easy to get them confused. I don't know the circumstances behind this, but the patient, I guess, was getting coffee and milk, I believe was supposed to be injected into the feeding portion of, you know, the tubes. But the inexperienced nurse instead injected the coffee and the milk directly into the bag where the medicine was supposed to go. Almost immediately, the patient began to react. She appeared to be in some kind of trauma. She was having a very loud reaction to this. Unfortunately, once this happens, it's pretty much already too late. It took about three to four hours for this patient to die from what happened. The coffee and milk would run straight to, according to the doctors who worked on her, it went straight to her heart and to her lungs. And basically it filled up her lungs and it caused her to have the effect of drowning. Not to mention it was actually a hot liquid. So slowly this patient drowned because of this. And she passed away after being in some significant pain and discomfort. I know that the 23 year old nurse was charged with involuntary manslaughter. However, I do not know the outcome as to what happened to her. But unfortunately because of her inexperience, this poor woman suffered for a couple of hours. The image you kind of see behind me here is that of a man who was crushed to death by an elevator in one of the worst freak accidents. Viewer discretion is advised. This story happened in Fuzhou, which is in Southeast China, and it occurred back in 2014. An elevator repair man named Wu Ming was doing some repairs on an elevator inside a high rise building. He himself was working on the roof of the actual elevator. Now, normally when you are doing this kind of repair work, you're supposed to pull out the emergency stop so that nobody can use the elevator while you're doing this work. He did not cut off the power at all. What he did was he had the elevator door opened. He then took a chair. He propped it in the elevator like doorway to prevent it from closing, which would then in turn prevent you know it from being used. So anyone on any other floor, if they press the button, nothing would come because the elevator door was still open. So as he's doing work on the elevator, the roof of it, someone walks up to the door, which is obviously just below him. They take that chair and they move it because they did not want to use the stairs. To be fair, he did not put any kind of warning signs up. He did not put any do not use or out of service signs. The person didn't want to use the stairs. So they said, I'm taking the elevator. So they go in, they press the button, the door closes and the elevator begins to move. 
The sudden movement causes Wu Ming to fall in that little crevice or crack right here between the wall and the elevator. He falls head first as the elevator is dragging him down the wall. His head and his torso are jammed between the elevator and the wall and he is being crushed to death. From what I've read, the death would have likely been very instant. I hope it was instant because if not, I don't even, that's just it was beyond horrible. I obviously can't show you in great detail because it's, you know, here, but real quickly, you can see that he fell like that and that's where he was found. The person who moved the chair and caused the elevator to start moving again was not, did not get any trouble because they had no way of knowing that any of this was going on because there were no signs being used. The people who owned the building were not held responsible either. This unfortunately is a situation where someone cut corners to save time and it resulted in an unfortunate freak accident that led to their death. Lesson learned here is never ever cut corners especially when working with stuff like this. It is not worth it. It is not worth your family having to bury you and not have you forever to save however few minutes it may have saved you. Within the next 30 seconds of this video, a young girl would die in one of the worst freak accidents. Viewer discretion is advised. This story happened in Malaysia in 2015. Pictured here, you can see a mother with her two daughters, and they are at the top of an escalator. As you can see, the mom is on her cell phone. She's actually talking to the girl's father, and they're actually having an argument over the phone. Her two daughters are here playing with the escalator on the railing. And honestly, it all sounds pretty harmless. Until it wasn't. What you are about to see is the actual CCTV footage played out in real time. However, I do have to cover up when the actual incident happens. So pay attention to her, the red circle, because she's the one where the incident occurs to. This is like a thin little opening between the railing and the wall. This is where I have to cover it up. But she is pulled by that, you know, moving railing and sucked between that little crack between the railing and the wall. And she falls five stories to her death. And so the young girl sadly is basically sliding down that crevice and she is hitting you know, the other escalators and she ends up landing on the concrete floor of the basement of this building. This opening is like maybe a foot, but they would state that you know, the cause of death was she was killed instantly when she hits the concrete floor, which means for however long it took her to fall down five stories, she was terrified and she was alert and then she crashed into the ground. There was no foul play here. The mother was distracted, but this wasn't like her fault. But, you know, we can look at situations like this and we can see that this stuff can happen. And so hopefully when, you know, people hear stories like this, they are more aware of their surroundings, especially with their kids involved. And by seeing this, if, you know, your kids are ever playing near escalators, you may be more wary of it. This was just a super tragic freak accident. I personally don't think anyone was to blame, but I'm sure people below in the comments will either agree or disagree with me. But regardless, it was just an absolute tragedy. What is this? Oh, stranger danger. What's going on? For what? What for what? I, I kind of would like them to turn out okay. To death? What? Firing the hole? What hole? My hole? Ouch. Why are you laughing, you sick f Hello, true crimeers. This is another Deaths at Theme Parks. Viewer discretion is advised. Today's story... No. Well, this story happened at Glenwood Caverns, an amusement park in Glenwood Springs, Colorado. One of the popular attractions they had there was the Haunted Mine Drop. And it's literally built into the side of a freaking mountain. Essentially, you are buckled into a seat here in this makeshift elevator. At the time, the ride did not was not in a cage, did not have like a roof to it. 
and you are literally just, you drop. It's a 110 foot drop. You know, basically like, you know, Tower of Terror at Disney. It's described as a ride that uses gravity to free fall. In September of 2021, a family was visiting the attraction and the inexperienced operators were charged with buckling each member into their seats. After they buckled everyone in, they were given a warning. Something had happened with one of the buckle cycles. They couldn't figure it out, so they basically reset all the buckles and they unbuckled them all and then went back in individually, the ride operators, to snap the buckles all back into place and pull the cord. Somehow, some way, they did not notice that one of the passengers was actually sitting on top of their seatbelt and it was not over their lap. This was of a six-year-old child. The first operator did not notice it, and then when they did the whole reset, a second operator came in. They also did not notice this. How on God's green earth they, they both didn't see this, I have no clue. But since they had reset it and rebuckled everything technically, the ride was back in the green mode and they were able to start it. The ride starts and it does its 110 foot free fall. Five people go down with the ride itself. The sixth person, the six year old child, essentially when the ride itself dropped, she came out of her seat and she free fell after the ride. Her body fell 110 feet on its own. And tragically, she died. No charges were filed because of course not, right? The theme park, however, was sued, but I do not know the outcome of that lawsuit. Usually that stuff is kept private. In 2023, the ride reopened as the Crystal Tower, now inside a secure cage. Death by thermal annihilation would be one of the worst deaths imaginable. Viewer discretion is advised. This particular story happened at a Caterpillar foundry in Mapleton, Illinois, and it occurred on June 2nd, 2022. 39-year-old Steve Dierkes had just started working at this facility. As a matter of fact, it was just his ninth day on the job. In the facility he worked in, they dealt with molten iron, which could get as hot as 2,600 degrees, which is actually hotter than molten lava. Steve Dierkes was working near one of the vats, which at the time was basically melting down iron. And it should be noted that there are very few safety rails in this facility. Well, on his ninth day, he was supposed to be taking a sample of the iron from, I guess, the vat. And from what I understand, he tripped and he fell partially into this vat of molten liquid. He fell in, basically head first, and his head down to his legs essentially were annihilated almost instantly. The coroner would later describe it as thermal annihilation. His skin, his organs, everything was completely just gone and annihilated within moments. If he felt anything like any pain, it honestly would not have been for very long. What makes this just even more horrific than it already is, is when he was found, basically his lower half was kind of had just melted off the rest of his body. And ultimately all they were ever able to recover were a couple tiny bone fragments from the vat. Caterpillar is just yet another company that basically cuts corners, cuts costs, all for the advantage of a profit. OSHA would find, you know, several violations within this particular facility. There are numerous falling and tripping hazards inside the building that the company was aware of and never actually fixed. Had the company actually installed safety rails, Steve Derkis would actually probably be alive still. This wasn't him not doing his job right. He was doing his job that he had only been trained on for nine days without, at this point, he was not being supervised for whatever reason. He simply tripped and that, I mean, it's something that just happens. And had he tripped and there been a guardrail, he may have not fallen over. But don't worry, the uh, big wigs at Caterpillar, they offered their thoughts and prayers to his family. So, so that should definitely rectify this entire scenario. There were no criminal charges. They were fined $145,000, which they contested. They appealed it, uh, Caterpillar did. In 2022, there were over 5,000 fatal work injuries in this country. And more often than not, large American corporations are never held accountable for their actions. Kind of feels like they should be held accountable, don't you think? This is worst deaths imaginable, and this is one of the most horrific ones I have ever told. Viewer discretion is advised.
This particular story happened on February 7, 2007 in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. Six-year-old Joao Helio was in the back seat of his mother's vehicle. At around 9 p.m., Joao's mom gets to a stoplight. In front of her is a cab. When they stop, a few men get out of that cab. Two of these men point a handgun directly at Joao's mom. They were screaming and demanding everyone get out of the car because this was going to be a carjacking. His mom gets out and goes to the back and she's, she's trying to get him out of the car. At this point, the assailants had already crowded the car and already started to get in. But she was taking too long and so one of the assailants took her and threw her to the side and took Joao, the six-year-old boy, and yanked him out of the car. But he was still in his seatbelt. And so when they slammed the door, Joao was still hooked to the seatbelt on the, and he was like to the side of the car. And they immediately sped off. They drive for seven kilometers, roughly 4.3 miles. They are going like crazy around these neighborhoods. They are zigzagging in the car. They are going in circles and they are going at very high speeds. Witnesses were horrified to see this young boy screaming and crying as he is being slammed against the pavement. He's being slammed against the car. He is being dragged against the pavement and scraping the skin off. He is bouncing basically up and down. Some onlookers were screaming at the people in the car, stop the you know, fucking car like there's a kid. And, and they, the people in the car point a gun at them and tell them to shut up. This poor six-year-old child for four miles was dragged, was beaten, was bouncing around literally tortured. Some described him looking like a doll, like a rag doll that was just being tossed around on the outside of the car. They finally stop the car. The assailants get out of the car and they just walk away from it and they leave the six-year-old child attached to the side. Blood is covered all over that side of the car. They then go home and they, they all have dinner with their families. And then they go to a church party afterwards as if nothing happened. One of their family members found out that they were the ones responsible for what happened. One of those family members turned them in and they were arrested within eight hours of the incident taking place. Two of the main individuals, I believe the ones who initially held the car basically at gunpoint and the ones who were like driving the car, the ones who had guns, they were sentenced to about 45 years in prison each. One of them who was driving the taxi in which the assailants came from he was sentenced to 39 years in prison. And then there was another man who was in the taxi who knew exactly what was going on and what was happening. And he was also sentenced to 39 years in prison. A fifth individual who was only 16 years old, who also had a gun with him that night, he got a brief sentence and was released in 2010. But then after he got released, he committed another series of crimes and was right back in prison. Uh, it's not enough. All of them should also have been tied to a car and dragged in my opinion, but hey, that's just me. A man would die at a drive through in one of the most unusual freak accidents. Viewer discretion is advised. This particular story happened at a McDonald's drive through in Vancouver, Canada back in 2021. The incident unfortunately occurred to Mr. Tony Isles, who was a husband and a father. He had two kids. On September 8th, 2021, he pulled into the drive through He ordered his food. This is at about 5.30 in the morning or so. He then pulls up to the window in order to pay. And then as he is giving the card to the employee, and I know this has happened to pretty much most of us, he accidentally dropped his card on the, you know, the ground. So he opens the door and he leans down, you know, to pick up the card. I know that when something like this has happened to me before, I don't, for whatever reason, my brain just did not tell me to put my foot on the brake or anything. And I've rolled forward before. I think it's just one of those, like, you're not really thinking, you know, in the moment. But that is also what happened in this situation. He did not take his foot off the gas and the car would zoom forward pretty quick. He ends up basically having the car door slam against one of the fixtures on the side of the building. And the door slams shut on him and he is now pinned between the car itself and the door. And he is literally crushed in between it. I don't know if his foot was somehow still in the gas, causing it to just put on constant pressure. I'm not sure, but he was unable to free himself. I'm guessing that there was no one behind him or I don't know. 
I would think someone would have seen this and rushed out of their car to help him, but unfortunately it was too late. Tony Isles would be pronounced dead at the scene when the ambulance arrived. And again, I'm sure there are people out there who are always like, well, whenever I do that, I put my foot on the brake. Sometimes, especially that early in the morning, you're, you know, you're not fully awake, right? You're just not thinking immediately like that. You're just, you reach over to get your card or your dropped money, and sadly, something like this happened. Crushed to death by his own car, just trying to get probably a coffee. But, you know, we can all look at stories like this and go, you know, if I'm ever in that situation now, I can maybe think about situations that have happened before. And, you know, maybe, like me included, I can be more self-aware. But this was just a tragedy. He was a father and his kids don't get to have him anymore. This is one of the craziest freak accidents. Viewer discretion is advised. Before we get to that story, here are two other crazy helicopter-related deaths. On May 22nd, 1981, an actor named Boris Segal, he was filming a miniseries called World War III. And I guess the set helicopter, I'm not sure if it was like a prop helicopter or if it was just dropping him off at the set, I don't know, but he got off the, and as he was walking back towards the back of it, the tail rotor blades were still spinning and it came into contact with Boris and it sliced basically into his neck, partially decapitating him. But however, he actually was still alert after the incident. He was rushed to the hospital, but five hours later, he was pronounced dead. The second story, very similar one, happened actually very recently, back in 2022. A 22-year-old British tourist who was in Athens, Greece, they were on, I guess, a helicopter doing some sightseeing. Once the helicopter landed, they were given the all clear to disembark the helicopter. But the rotor blades, much like the first story, they were still on, they were still actually spinning. But the pilot had told them that everything was good to go. The 22 year old walking away from the helicopter, but the rotor blades, he was still too close to them. And in this instance, the rotor blade sliced into him and it decapitated him completely. They said he died instantly. In this case, they actually arrested three people, including the pilot. The 22-year-old's parents were in another helicopter that hadn't landed yet. And the pilot who just killed this other kid had to radio them, hey, land somewhere else because their son just died. I do know that the pilot was charged with manslaughter. However, I don't see any other updates since 2022, so I don't know if there was a trial yet. The final story happened in Russia. Three men were on a fishing expedition when they were dropped off at a, I guess, a resort or a river to do some fishing. In this case, they were given the all clear to get off the helicopter, and the, the three men had begun to walk away. And then this is a recreation, an image of what basically happened. So essentially what they think occurred is that as the helicopter was lifting into the air, a gust of wind had pushed it and tilted the helicopter to the side, causing the blades to obviously spin and it literally sliced through the three men. I know that the three men, I believe, were all pronounced dead at the scene. Their deaths were likely very instant because the blades went right through them. Then the helicopter ends up basically kind of crashing and the pilot sustains some pretty severe injuries, but he survives. Uh, lesson learned, I guess, don't get on helicopters because getting off of them uh, sounds terrifying. Well, this ride seems nice. Seems fun, huh? Going up, going up, going up, going up. Going up. Okay. Hi, God. Apparently we're going straight to your place. We'll be there in just a minute. It's still going up. <laughs> still going straight up. We have not reached the top yet. This is going on for 14 minutes now. Okay. You know, it's actually kind of peaceful. What? It's kind of peaceful. I, mean, I find this to be nice and kind of relaxing and not peaceful, not peaceful, not a peace, not a peace, let me off, let me off, let me off, let me off, let me off. We're hanging here. We're, shut up. We're hanging. <laughs> Just let me. Uh. Why do we do this to ourselves? Why? 
Why do we insist on having more thrill rides that are crazier than the previous one? Because of your demands, the next ride they come out with is they're just going to yeet you off a mountain and that's it, that's the ride. Anyway, this is another deaths at theme parks. Viewer discretion is advised. This particular incident happened at Six Flags La Ronde. You're welcome. And it's located in Montreal, Canada. The incident happened with this ride, Le Vampire or Le Vampire. On July 6, 2012, a plumber who worked at the facility was asked to do some work. He had been working at that park for four years. Well, another worker told him that there was a broken pump, and that was at the pit of the ride Vertigo, which was actually located next to the vampire ride. Just after 1 p.m., the plumber who was asked to go do this work, he went into, I guess, the restricted section, but he accidentally went into the wrong attraction. The ride itself, the vampire ride, was actually in operation at that time. As he is walking towards one of the pits of this ride, the coaster comes screaming by, which as you can see, includes people just hanging from it. And he is struck directly in his head by this ride that is going at top speed. He was killed instantly. They have not said exactly what his injury was, but they said that it was clearly impossible to save his life. There would be no work they could do to save him. This is a ride that goes about 50 miles per hour or 80 kilometers per hour. And being struck in the head by a ride going that fast. In the past, we have seen people get decapitated uh, for that exact scenario. But I cannot confirm that that's what happened to him. In one story, I read that four other people were treated for injuries and one person was hospitalized due to psychological trauma. I don't know if that means that that's the person that may have struck him, like in their seat, or if it was just someone who witnessed it happen firsthand. The amusement park was fined, but no one got in legal trouble. The ride reopened a month later. Freddy Krueger in A Nightmare on Elm Street was loosely based on some of the most unusual deaths. Viewer discretion is advised. No, it does not involve an actual man invading someone's nightmares and murdering them, and if you die in the dream, you die for real. And it also does not include the phrase, Welcome to prime time, bitch! One of the greatest lines of dialogue of all time. However, Wes Craven, the creator of the Nightmare on Elm Street series, he was inspired by a couple of actual stories that happened that he read in the LA Times. A family in Cambodia would escape to the United States in order to basically flee the mass genocide that was happening in the killing fields. This family had a young boy, and the young boy was terrified to sleep. He said, he told his parents, if I fall asleep, someone is going to get me because someone is chasing me. So the young boy literally forces himself to stay awake for days and days. But eventually, he would end up falling asleep because he could only go so long. According to his family, it appeared that he was in the middle of a nightmare, some kind of bad dream, when all of a sudden, he died. His heart had been racing so fast that that's what led to his death. So he was possibly scared to death from his nightmare. The next inspiration does not involve Johnny Depp being sucked into a bed and pulverized into nothing but bloody goop. But between 1978 and 1981, 13 men aged between 20 and 30 years old, and these were men who were allegedly recruited by the CIA to fight in the Vietnam War, it seemed to only affect those specific men, and it was just men. And all of them died between the hours of 10 p.m. and 8 a.m. while they were sleeping. According to some people, some of these men, their hearts were racing, and they appeared to be in some sort of distress while they were sleeping. But then just suddenly, they died. This phenomenon would be nicknamed SUNDS, or Sudden Unexplained Nocturnal Deaths Syndrome. The same thing happened again in 1981 to 26 men. And this all happened to the Hmong people in Vietnam. There has never been an explanation for it. There is only speculation as to what causes this, but it's extremely rare. It almost never happens. The Hmong people in Vietnam believed that this was being caused by spirits, and these spirits were punishing the men for abandoning their homeland. And well, Sir Frederick Kruger here is technically a spirit who invades their dreams and nightmares and kills them. In the movies, obviously. But yeah, Wes Craven was inspired by those stories to come up with this notion, this character. Personally, one of my favorite uh, horror movie serial killers. Yeah. 
I have a hankering for pizza. Who's with me? So I got one more pop figure to add to the collection. My, mo my mom got this for me. You are one of a kind. It's me. <laughs> Kramer or Mikey. I have a baseball sticker on my shirt. I'm wearing the serial killer glasses. I've got a, a game controller in one hand and either a baseball bat or a survivor tiki torch in this hand. I don't, I'm not 100% sure. <laughs> but yeah, I am now a Funko. Look at that. <laughs> I don't have any more shelf space though, so I'm gonna have to figure out where to put it. I'm gonna put him in this corner for now, I think. Yeah, until I can figure out a third shelf maybe here, I don't know. But there I am. What a nerd. 12 year old girl had to listen to her own mother's murder. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Crystal Perry. Viewer discretion is advised. At the time of this case, Crystal Perry was a 30 year old mother. She had a young girl named Sarah. Crystal was a single mom. She was working at a shoe factory. Crystal did have a kind of a hard upbringing. She was one of 10 kids. She got married when she was 15 and she had Sarah when she was 18. And sadly, she had romantic partners in the past who were violent with her. But at this time, she was doing everything she can to make sure her daughter Sarah had a great life. Crystal was an amazing mom. All she really cared about was providing for her daughter. And she did so. At the time of this case, her daughter Sarah is 12 years old and they're living together in this home in Bridgeton, Maine. It was May 11th, 1994, in the late evening hours. Sarah was rattled awake by the sounds of her mother screaming. She thought she heard her mom screaming the word, murder, murder, murder. She heard loud thud noises. She heard someone rattling through the silverware drawer. Sarah is terrified, and so she stays in her room. But then the screaming stopped, and there were no more noises. Sarah would go out and she found her mom on the floor just covered in blood and there was blood everywhere. She tried to pick up the phone to call 911 but there was no tone. So she ran half a mile down the road to a restaurant where she was able to get someone to call 911. Police arrive and they find her body and later it's determined that Crystal Perry had been stabbed 50 times. This was an act of rage and Typically, when you see that type of brutality, it's by someone they know. So at first, they actually looked at her ex-husband, the father of Sarah. Her ex-husband, Thomas, and his new girlfriend or wife, Joanne, they were each other's alibis that night. But Joanne had actually recently gotten into a fight with Crystal. And Joanne had punched Crystal. So the two of them were high up on the suspect list. Crystal was also dating a younger man, and they inquired about him. Apparently one time this boyfriend had pulled a knife on her and threatened her, but he denied having anything to do with this, and he too provided a kind of shaky alibi. They found blood droplets on Crystal's leg that they knew could not have belonged to Crystal. So they collected that blood and they created a profile, a DNA profile, but it didn't match anyone at the time. They ran it against her ex-husband, against Joanne, they ran it against the boyfriend. No matches. All of them were cleared. And then 12 years later, when DNA technology is slightly more advanced, they finally get a hit on the DNA. It belonged to this man, Michael Hutchinson, who lived one mile away from Crystal at the time of the murder. They didn't know each other. He claimed they had a relationship, but nobody could prove that. And nobody had ever seen him in the house. No one had ever heard her mention him before. He was just 19 years old at the time of the murder. He tells police that, you know, he and Crystal were having this affair and that he was in her house that night and they had consensual sex. But then someone broke into the house and, and basically started to harm Crystal. He says he confronts the man who broke in and then he was, then Michael was then knocked unconscious. He says he then woke up and he saw Crystal being stabbed and so he just ran out of the house. The problem is for him is that Sarah, the daughter, had literally never seen him before. She heard the killer's voice that night. It sounded a lot like his voice but a, again, a voice she had never heard before. Crystal's bed only showed that one person was basically sleeping in it at that time. And most importantly, it was his blood droplets that were found on her leg. She was stabbed 50 times, and typically when that happens, the killer will cut themselves on the blade because it's slippery with all the blood. And that's exactly why his blood was there. So he was arrested and charged with her murder. 
Prosecutors believe that he was likely just roaming the neighborhood. He had probably seen Crystal and Sarah walking around the neighborhood before. Perhaps may have been stalking her slightly. And he may have been intoxicated the night of the murder. And he just broke in and did what he did. He was convicted and sentenced to life in prison without parole. Crystal's daughter Sarah would later go on to write an acclaimed novel called After the Eclipse, a book and a story about her mom. And it was a beautiful tribute to Crystal Perry. A mysterious phone call and then a woman murdered. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Dana Chisholm. Viewer discretion is advised. Dana Von Chisholm was born on August 30th, 1969, and at the time of this case, she has moved all the way out to Washington, D.C. Dana had been a former cheerleader and a choir singer, and she had wanted to pursue some kind of career in singing. She was very, very good. But she also had aspirations to one day maybe kind of start a business, so she goes to business school. At the time of the case, she is 25 years old. She is described as a very bright young woman with an incredible future ahead of her. But all of that was taken away in an instant. It was February 27th, 1995. The parents of Dana Chisholm get a very mysterious phone call very, very late at night. The person claims to be an officer, specifically with the Metropolitan Police there in Washington, D.C., this so-called officer tells her parents in a very excited voice that Dana has been arrested for prostitution. Then he hangs up. The parents feel weird about this, and so they contact the Metropolitan Police back. They ask if they can go check on Dana at her place. They do. They find Dana inside her apartment. She had not been arrested. Dana had been murdered. She was found lying on her back in her apartment, and she was completely nude. She had a cord wrapped several times around her neck, and this was used to strangle her to death. Her apartment was just a chaotic mess. It was clear that a very violent struggle took place. On the door was a note. The note just said, I'll be back. And then a dash, and then MPD, implying that it was another officer who left it. They determined the phone call came from a payphone. It was not a cop who called her parents. They don't know who it was. The media went crazy with covering this case. They painted Dana as a troubled young woman who was an addict, which was something from way back in her teenage years. She had completely moved on from it. They kept bringing up how she had various sexual encounters, which turns out was over-exaggerated by the media. They wanted to point out that she went to clubs all the time. She met up with and talked to several men. The media was basically painting her almost as if, uh, like they're blaming the victim. Kind of like, a, well, she asked for it. But really, most of what they were saying was super over-embellished. They made her look worse than she was. And they pulled focus away from her brutal murder. It was a detriment to the investigation. One officer says that one night he got a phone call. A man said he knew why she had been killed, and it was because of her lifestyle. But that was it. They have uncovered no more evidence ever since. No fingerprints have matched anyone. No DNA has matched anyone. I don't even know if they have DNA. It does sound like, for the most part, that the police were trying to be as active as possible in trying to figure this case out, and trying to find out who killed her and why. But there really isn't a ton of information on it, and so I don't know, like, what evidence, if any, they have. But as of now, in 2024, it, it hasn't led to anything or anyone. It sounds like a lot of people believe that the media was trying to paint Dana Chisholm as, like, well, just a, a drug-addicted sex worker black girl. Almost like, you know, they were demonizing her. But she wasn't what they were describing her as. She was imperfect like all of us. And what's more, somebody killed her. Someone clearly got into her apartment and strangled her to death. They brutalized her. Whatever her lifestyle may have been or not have been, there may be relevance there to kind of go down a path to find out who may have done this, sure. But it doesn't mean that this isn't someone who doesn't deserve to have her case solved. Because, hi, murder is worse than all of it. It sounded like Dana Chisholm was really trying to get her life going in a very positive direction. But unfortunately, she crossed paths with some kind of monster. How that came to be, who that is, is all still a mystery. 
and she deserves justice, just like every other person does. If you have any information with regards to the murder of Dana Chisholm, please call 202-727-9099. Please help catch her monster. A dog would bring bones back to his owner, but the problem is that they were human bones. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of David Reed. Viewer discretion is advised. David Wellington Reed was born on January 17th, 1972, and at the time of this case, he is 13 years old, and he is living in Skokelhaven, Pennsylvania. He was a middle school student at this time, and he was a fairly well-behaved kid. On the night of August 21st, 1985, he had gotten onto his bike, and he had gone out to hang out with some friends. However, he never came home that night. Once he wasn't home by the following morning is when his family would report him missing. They would find his bicycle, I think just sort of thrown in some bushes, but they didn't see any signs of him. They scoured the area looking for the young boy. They were going door to door, seeing if anyone knew anything about his disappearance, had anyone seen him. They just weren't really getting a ton of information from people. In December of 1985, so this is a, about four or so months later, a 20-year-old man named Joe Geiger contacted police because his dog kept going into the woods and then coming back with these like small pieces of bone. He initially thought these were just animal bones, but then he brought back another type of bone that did not look like an animal bone, and so that's why he called police. There's actually an image where you can see Joe Geiger on the news handing something to police, and this is a piece of bone. He's interviewed on the news. He doesn't know like what this is all about. He doesn't know who these remains belong to, but when police go out to the area where the dog continually kept going to, they found more bones. Eventually they found a human skull. And through dental records, they actually confirmed that this was the remains of David Reed. Now, unbelievably, the coroner, who had just bones, and that was about it, but what the coroner said the ultimate cause of death was likely was complications from undiagnosed diabetes. Don't know how he would have figured that, but that's what he said. Then the case just sort of goes cold because they're not investigating it. The police weren't handling it properly. Her David sister would continually press the police, and then eventually she actually passed away. I think about a year or so after that, is when a new detective would look at this case. They would end up having his body exhumed. The new medical examiner who looked at this determined there was a skull fracture that David had died by likely having his head either struck with something or he had fallen on something that caused a severe fracture. I don't know how the coroner at the first autopsy didn't recognize this, but they didn't. And they find out that David Reed had been associating with a couple of slightly older uh, people in the community in the marijuana scene. One of those people, back when he disappeared, was 20-year-old Joseph Geiger, the man who called police about the bones being found. But as they're interviewing more people, they're finding out that Joe Geiger had told people over the years that if you want to get away with killing someone, just kill them in Skulkel Haven because you'll get away with it. Then they found another friend, a man named John Fry, who would tell police pretty much what he thinks happened because John Fry was there when David Reed died. He says that on the night of August 21st, 1985, the 13-year-old David Reed met up with Joe Geiger and himself, John Fry, and they were at this abandoned train thing and in one of the cabooses they were smoking some you know pot. Joe Geiger had apparently had this thought that David Reed had been stealing some of his product, his marijuana, and this caused an argument apparently. David didn't steal anything but Joe Geiger just said he was. And David Reed stood up and then Joe Geiger stood up and then Joe just punches David square in the head and it actually knocks him out of the train. And then he falls backwards and he, his head lands hard on the rails below and he stops moving. Joe Geiger told John Fry, get out of here and go. And that's exactly what he did. He left. From this point, it's believed that Joe Geiger then took David and dragged him uh, farther into the woods 
and then just dumped him where eventually he would be found. They didn't have a ton of physical evidence. In fact, they really had no physical evidence that can connect him to this, but they had several witnesses who would say otherwise. So in 2008, Joseph Geiger was arrested and he was charged with physical assault and also third degree murder of David Reed. And even though at first he denied it ever happened, he ended up confessing that he did do it. They would end up taking a deal. He pled guilty to lesser assault charges and the third degree murder charge was dropped. It was basically just a charge of simple assault and that is all he got. And he was sentenced, I shit you not, to just two years in prison. And he is out and about, he was released. He killed this kid. Like, I, I know it wasn't like a pre-planned type thing, but he did it in the heat of the moment. That's at least manslaughter or something. He got two years. That's nothing. That's like a slap on the wrist. That's insane to me. A kid is dead. He didn't get to live the rest of his life, but Joe Geiger did. And then he got to live in a jail cell for a couple of months, basically. His killer may have been found, but in the end, David Reed did not truly get the justice he deserved. A haunted theme park? Um, hello? What the f is happening here? What bizarre three-way human centipede is this? Okay, let's just cover this up. This is another death set theme park. So viewer discretion is, well, it's advised, but it's too late for that now, I guess. Magic Harbor, which is located in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, opened in 1954. Initially, it started as like an old-timey Wild West theme theme park. They had things like stagecoaches. Well, not too soon after the theme park opened, on the stagecoach ride, well, the stagecoach would accidentally fall over. And it ended up crushing someone to death and injuring four other people. This caused the theme park to close completely. Then it reopened as a more traditional theme park with like your typical theme park roller coasters and rides. It was like kind of popular, but like also not really. You had those old tiny bucket things that would take you from the island to the theme park had log rides, animal shows, everything was hunky-dory. Until two people were murdered inside the theme park. The owner and his 16-year-old stepson were shot and killed when a former employee robbed them. The man who did it was caught and he was convicted and sentenced to life in prison. Then it was turned into a British-themed amusement park. Bruh, do British people do this kind of thing or what's going on? My guy, you are really happy about this. I don't think they had any three-way rides. In this rendition of the park, they had a roller coaster called the Black Witch. And this is where a fourth person would die at this theme park. A young woman was on the roller coaster and apparently, according to the stories, she stood up at some point on the ride, which then smacked her neck or head into one of the tracks above her. And she was nearly decapitated there on the spot. She would not survive the ordeal. Soon after this, it was basically the nail in the coffin for this theme park. It just wasn't meant to be. Eventually, it closed down. It became an abandoned theme park. And that's when people started to think this place is haunted. The four people who died there still roam the grounds, haunting. But eventually, it was all scrapped. And I think now it is turned into campgrounds, which that's... Sure, a haunted location. Let's, let's put campgrounds there. I hope people aren't encouraged to wear hockey masks there. Are there any other gamers out there like me when you're playing like an open world game? For example, I'm replaying Far Cry 6, right? But is there anyone out there who is like, has like OCD when it comes to defogging the maps in games like this? So like the light areas are where I have explored, the darker areas I have not explored there yet. I am obsessed obsessed with defogging the map i can't beat the game until i've done this is that is that too crazy like every square centimeter of this map needs to be defogged before i hit the end game right i'm sure i'm not the only one maybe right i'm obsessed it's a problem we all know the staircase case, but did you know there was a second murder? Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Dennis Rowe. Viewer discretion is advised. It was November of 2004 in Durham, North Carolina, when Dennis Rowe was found murdered outside of his home. 
Dennis had been shoved into a trash can, his head covered in a plastic bag, his hands were tied up behind him, and several parts of his body had just been wrapped in several layers of duct tape. The same medical examiner who was well known for doing the autopsy of Kathleen Peterson also did his autopsy. He had several blunt force trauma injuries to his head, and the injuries were almost identical to the injuries that Kathleen Peterson had on her head. Just like with her, his skull had no fractures to it, but then they also found that he had been stabbed. There was a brief moment in time when they thought, oh my gosh, what if we have the wrong guy for Kathleen Peterson's murder? Because what if the person who murdered Dennis Rowe also killed her? But they quickly found absolutely no connection in terms of the murders, but there was a very significant connection in their cases. Dennis Rowe was a gay man, and he provided testimony to the district attorneys working on Michael Peterson's murder trial. Kathleen Peterson was found murdered at the bottom of the staircase in 2001, but he was a witness for the DA because he had a sexual relationship he claimed with Michael Peterson. And the whole bisexuality aspect of Michael Peterson was a humongous portion of his trial, which factored into what the DA said the motive was for him to kill his wife. Michael Peterson said he never had any sexual interactions with this man. Dennis Rowe also told the DA that his friend and roommate Tyrone LaCour also had a sexual relationship with Michael Peterson. And then the murder of Dennis Rowe happened just a couple of months after the initial trial was over for Michael Peterson. But Tyrone had allegedly found out about this story that Dennis Rowe was telling to the DA about these sexual encounters with Mr. Peterson. And then lo and behold, Dennis Rowe was found brutally killed inside his home and Tyrone LaCour was then on the run. They did find out that Tyrone had threatened Dennis with regards to the sexual allegations, and then I guess he just instinctively one night acted on those threats, and then he beat and stabbed Dennis Rowe. Tyrone LaCour was on the run for about two years. They found him in Lancaster, Virginia in 2006, and then he was extradited back to North Carolina to face his charges. In 2009, he pleads guilty to second-degree murder, and he admitted that he killed Dennis Rowe. So he was sentenced, and he was released after just 16 years in prison for murdering a guy. He's also accused of killing a previous roommate, Eric Pennebaker. However, he has never been formally charged or gone to trial for that murder. What a great guy to have running loose in the streets. It's been three decades, and they still don't know who killed Diana Don Vicari. Hello, true crimeers. Viewer discretion is advised. It was October 24th, 1992 in Tucson, Arizona. In a dumpster behind a building in downtown Tucson, someone found the severed arms of a person. There were no other body parts. Eventually, I'm not 100% sure how, but they would determine the arms belonged to 19-year-old Don Vicari. Don had been reported missing a couple of days prior. She was working two jobs at the time, and she was reported missing after she failed to show up to either of her job for a couple of days. Diana was last seen at midnight on October 22, 1992, just outside the Tucson Community Center. She had been attending some kind of party. As a matter of fact, her car was still found parked in the parking lot there. Even to this day, nobody has recovered the rest of her body. Police had gotten very few tips and very few leads. They had no physical evidence that they would be able to ever tie to someone. They don't know where she was killed or how she was killed. However, they did develop a suspect pretty quickly. His name was Lemuel Prion. He was someone known in the area who had a criminal history. He had talked to people about how he had sexually assaulted women, and that he enjoyed hurting women. Police would talk to a bartender there in Tucson, and that bartender said that he saw Diana the night she disappeared. When police showed him a picture of Lemuel, he didn't recognize him. Another woman had also been sexually assaulted just around the same time. Police thought this may be tied to Diana's murder. So they showed that surviving victim a photo of him. She didn't recognize him either. But police put his image in the newspaper and said he is the murder suspect, based on no evidence. After it was on the news, the bartender would call the police back and say, you know what, I do recognize him. He was with Diana that night. So he was arrested and charged with her murder. This trial also included the sexual assault of the other victim. Based on zero physical evidence, 
based on very shaky witness testimony, somehow he was still convicted of her murder and he was sentenced to death. But then in 2002, the Arizona Supreme Court unanimously decided to overturn his conviction. They stated that the trial should have been separated from the murder and the sexual assault. There should have been two trials. The defense also wanted to accuse another person of committing this murder. But during the trial, the judge said, no, you can't do that. The Supreme Court said, well, you should have been able to do that. So Lemuel Prion was released and they basically dropped all charges against him. But now they're back to who killed Diana Vicari. If you have information, please call 520-791-4444. She's been missing since 2020 and her family just wants to know what happened to her. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Diana Rose Alejandre Garcia Gonzalez. Viewer discretion is advised. At the time of this case, which is in 2020, Diana is a 31-year-old mother to five children. Her five children, I believe, were living with the father in Yuma, Arizona. Danielle was living in Winter Haven, which is on the border of California and Arizona, it looks like. I've never heard of it before. And she was living with her live-in girlfriend named Danielle Meaden. The last time any of her family members heard from her was on April 29th, 2020. Now, because she didn't live with family, it wasn't like unusual to not hear from her for, you know, a little bit. But by June of 2020, they became very concerned when they hadn't gotten any calls, texts, anything from her. On June 30th, 2020, the Imperial County Sheriff's Department there in California, they got a phone call from Diana's family to officially report her missing. The investigators, I guess, believe that she was likely last physically seen towards the beginning parts of May of 2020. She just up and vanished one day, it seems like, according to her girlfriend. Diana's cell phone, her purse, and all of her belongings were still at the home that they shared together. And then literally nobody has seen her. Even her own kids, the father of, of her kids, haven't been contacted by her. She would, you know, go to Yuma sometimes and she would go down to Mexico because it was all in that same area. They searched all three areas where she was known to visit or live. They never found any trace of her. However, police don't have actual proof of foul play. There was no signs of foul play in the home she lived in with her girlfriend. And so they're treating this still as an active missing persons case. I found this image um, when searching. I think this was done by her aunt. But this is Danielle Meaden, uh, Diana's girlfriend. She is the last person to ever see her, ever. But it does not sound like she's ever been labeled a suspect or a person of interest at all. I believe this is also her because this is an inmate record from Yuma, Arizona. She does have a criminal history. As a matter of fact, she has been accused of physically abusing Diana on multiple occasions and also threatened to kill her one time. I believe there was actually an attempted murder charge placed on her for actions towards Diana. But again, nowhere do I see she's been labeled a suspect or person of interest in Diana's current disappearance. I think the family obviously wants to keep hope alive that she's out there somewhere. Maybe she just had to get away and hide, you know? But it's unlike her to never contact her kids or any of her family members. But somebody has to know what happened to her. If that person is you, you can call the San Diego FBI office by calling 1-800-225-5324. A woman would vanish and it must have been the estranged husband, right? Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Diane Washer. Viewer discretion is advised. At the time of this case, Diane Washer was 39 years old and she was a mother. She had a very strained relationship with her husband, Jimmy. There was a lot of arguing kind of involved, a lot of fights. And in July of 1994, she would end up getting a $10,000 social security check. And this was because she had a back issue. On July 20th, 1994, the two of them would argue in public over this money. Allegedly, he tried to attack her and they were next to a, a payphone where she was able to get into the payphone area and call 911. He apparently is trying to get physical with her, but then she smacks him over the head with the phone. When police arrive, he is gone, but she is still there and she's calm. She says he took off and then she just said everything is fine now and she left. And then suddenly Diane Washer was gone forever. She never got home that night. And Jimmy never reported her missing, which drew a lot of suspicion his way. 
Diane's family would look at the house and notice that she didn't take any of her like medication with her, like for her back, and pretty much all of her belongings were at the house still. So on August 24th, 1994, they officially report her missing and the police honed in on Jimmy. It had to be him. They fought all the time. They were in a heated argument the night she disappeared. He tried to attack her. She hit him. Clearly, he did something to her. He even failed multiple polygraph tests. He was never officially ruled out as a suspect. That is until 1997. She had gone missing from Covington, Kentucky. In the summer of 1997 in Boone County, Kentucky, a skeleton was found. In particular, there was a skull that was crushed. But there were a lot of scattered human bones there, and some of them still had flesh on them. A forensic anthropologist would collect the bones and basically determine that these were human remains. By June of 1998, they were able to take DNA from those bones and compare it, and they were, in fact, the remains of Diane Washer. She died from severe blunt force trauma to her head. A tip would come in about who may have done this. Jimmy, right? Nope. A man named Larry Freeman. He was a local house painter in the area. I don't know how the informant found this out, but somehow he found out that he was responsible for her murder. So they brought him in for questioning. He said he met her that night. They got intoxicated. They, he started to drive her home. He then got into an accident, which threw her from his car. Then once he realized she was dead, he just dumped her in the creek. Unfortunately, police cannot prove otherwise. So he pled guilty to manslaughter. He got 20 years and he's already been released. Because they failed to help one child, it would lead to the murder of another one. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Eddie Werner. Viewer discretion is advised. Edward Werner was born on Christmas Day, 1985, and he was born in Staten Island, New York. Eddie had two sisters and a brother. They got along really well. Eddie only got to experience life for 11 years, but in that time, he was a happy-go-lucky kid. He loved school. He loved church. He had a bunch of friends. He was ambitious, and he already had a lot of goals ahead of him. And he always loved doing the fundraisers. You know when you would sell, like, chocolate bars around the neighborhood, you know, to get a prize? He loved doing it, and he excelled at it. And that's exactly what he was doing on September 27th, 1997. At that point, he is in the Jackson, New Jersey area. Eddie Werner set out that day with a box of chocolates to sell, and he would never come home. Within a couple of hours, he is reported missing and the search begins. But it wouldn't take long to find him. Just two days later, in a wooded area really close to his home, they would discover the body of the 11-year-old boy. It appeared that the young boy had been strangled to death and there was evidence of a sexual assault. So police are essentially going door to door and they're trying to find out how this came to be. So obviously they discovered that Eddie Werner was going around the neighborhood and trying to sell some chocolate bars. When news of the body being found came out, someone working with the FBI would alert police to this young man, 15-year-old Samuel Manzi. He lived in the neighborhood. He would have been on the pathway that Eddie Werner would have been knocking on doors. You see, Samuel Manzi had been cooperating with the FBI to bring down a pedophile. This 15-year-old kid, while using AOL chat rooms, befriended an older man, a 43-year-old named Stephen Simmons. Samuel had begun chatting in gay chat rooms, and Stephen Simmons said, hey, we should actually meet up. Well, it turns out the two of them did meet up at motels, and there were receipts to back this up, and the two of them had been having sex. Eventually, the police and the FBI catch wind of this. They then ask the 15-year-old child, who is now cooperating with them willingly, if he will do an undercover sting, essentially. Meet the man in person again, and this time on audio, get him to say some stuff. His parents agreed to it. And so he does get recordings, but... Samuel Manzi takes a bat or some kind of club and he begins to bash the recording device and he destroys it, saying he's no longer working with them and that he was going to defend uh, Stephen Simmons. And Stephen Simmons had nothing but great things to say about him. Samuel Manzi had been having a lot of mental health issues. He had abused his dog. He had started fires and his parents actually tried to get him help. But the help he was supposed to get basically kept saying, ah, he's fine, he's fine. And then during all of this with the Stephen Simmons situation, his parents tried to have him committed. 
and really tried to get him some very serious help. They knew he needed help, his parents, and they did everything that they could think of to get that help. But the mental health institution told them no. They basically said, we can't take him. A 15-year-old child who abuses animals, who starts fires, who is defending a pedophile. Like, clearly, he was not in a great mental state. He needed help. But they turned him away. Then, just a couple of days later, Eddie Werner is murdered. Once police caught wind of the situation with Samuel Manzi, they wanted to question him. And he confessed. He tells police, I killed him. Eddie Werner arrived at the Manzi house around 5.30 p.m. Samuel's parents were not there. He manages to lure the 11-year-old child inside the house where Samuel Manzi says something happens where Samuel gets really pissed off and he attacks Eddie. He forces him to the ground in his bedroom. He ties a cord around his neck and he sexually assaults the 11-year-old boy. He then strangles him until he is dead shoves his body into a suitcase, and then a day or so later, he takes that suitcase out to the woods where he dumps the body. Now, meanwhile, Stephen Simmons is arrested and he is being charged with all of these, you know, accounts of pedophilia, etc. But even in court, Samuel Manzi is describing him as a good person and he basically comes to his defense. And then again, uh, Stephen Simmons defends Samuel. He ends up getting convicted, but he's only sentenced to five years and only serves like six months. Then Samuel Manzi finds out he's being charged as an adult. Kidnapping charges, sexual assault charges, murder charges. And he ends up pleading guilty to all charges. So then obviously he is convicted and the judge sentences him to 70 years. And all of this just completely destroys the community. An innocent child is brutally murdered. Another child was failed by our mental health system. Samuel's parents are like, we were failed. We tried getting our son help. We did everything we thought we were supposed to do. But the people that were supposed to help us said no. And because of that, because he wasn't put into an institution, he's then free to murder a child. You have this 15-year-old kid who had some serious mental health demons going on. He was manipulated by a sexual predator. Nobody outside of his parents would help him. And then he does this. It's honestly kind of tragic for him too, but he still made the decision to sexually assault and murder this young boy. And so now, unfortunately, he is where he should be. Easily one of the most terrifying composite drawings I've ever seen. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Eileen Mangold. Viewer discretion is advised. At the time of this case, Eileen Mangold was 51 years old and she was living in Riverview, Florida. Eileen was a mother to three children. I think at this time, only one of them was still a teenager. Eileen was divorced, but she had a very good relationship with her ex-husband. They shared custody of their 13-year-old son. The arrangement was extremely amicable. Eileen wanted to provide the best she could to, for her son, and so she was working two different jobs. Her second job, which typically was in the evenings, was at the Kangaroo Gas Stop. She was also extremely personable, and so all the customers at the Kangaroo gas stop, they knew her. They all knew her by name. She knew all of her customers by name. It was September 19th, 1989. She started her shift at the Kangaroo gas stop at 4.30 p.m. By about 9 o'clock, she was getting ready to close the gas station. At 9.15 p.m., uh, two teenagers, a brother and sister, who they got there at 9.15 p.m. hoping that they can get some last-minute gas from Eileen because she was usually one to be like, okay, it's fine, go ahead. However, when they approached the gas station, they actually saw Eileen leaving the building, but she was accompanied by a man. It was pretty dark outside, and so they didn't get the absolute best description of him, but they got a pretty decent look at the guy. They didn't recognize him. They saw her get into the driver's side of her car, and then the man got into the passenger side. It looked as if Eileen was getting ready to leave with this particular man, but what was weird to the two teenagers was that all of the lights in the gas station were on and she left the door unlocked. So they felt something was wrong here. Eileen, driving the car, circled the gas station and she ended up pulling up to the two teenagers in their car. And she actually manages to yell at them, help me please, I'm being robbed. And then she, I guess, is forced to speed away. The two teenagers call police and when police arrive at the gas station, they do confirm that everything is still open, the lights are on, 
and eventually they discovered that about a hundred bucks in cash was taken from the register. At about two o'clock in the morning or so, police locate Eileen's car and it is abandoned. This is roughly two miles from where the gas station was. They found blood on the hood and when dusting for fingerprints, they found fingerprints on the hood. Inside her car, it looked as if a struggle had taken place. Unfortunately, a couple of hours after this, they do in fact find the body of 51-year-old Eileen Mangold. She had been found along Interstate 75. She was dressed only in her underwear and shoes. She had defensive wounds and everyone who described her said that she was absolutely a fighter and she would have fought back, but she had been brutally just beaten to death. Her cause of death was blunt force trauma to her skull. Two teenagers were called to the police station. They looked at a police lineup, a police lineup like in a book, and they didn't really recognize anyone. However, they were able to help a police sketch artist come up with this drawing, uh, which is just such an unsettling image. They, these things always are. They came up with really nothing though. There was no physical evidence that were they were able to connect to anyone. The composite drawing was put out on the news, but nobody recognized the image. The killer was described as having a, a lot of hair, uh, very curly shoulder length hair. In July of 1999, police would take the fingerprints found on the hood. They were always putting it in the system to see if they ever matched anyone because those fingerprints they found out were not Eileen's. And when they plugged it into the system in July of 1999, they finally got a match. Matched a man named Franklin Smith. Franklin Smith was a career criminal. This is a guy who had robbed, he had stolen cars, he had sexually assaulted people. He had a lot, just a list of crimes and he was in and out of prison his like entire adult life. He had been released from prison in 1988, about a year before Eileen's murder. They questioned him because he was still alive at this point and he said, I don't know who that is. I had nothing to do, nothing to do with it. Well, why are your fingerprints on the hood of her car? I don't know, you guys got it wrong. They would take some of the evidence found with Eileen and specifically some of her clothing items that was next to her body. And they apparently found some male bodily fluid on one of those items of clothing. They took the DNA profile from it and Franklin Smith willingly gave his DNA and it was a match, even though he said he never knew her, never met her, didn't have sex with her. And so he was arrested and charged with her murder. However, the DNA was a very tiny amount of DNA. And in 1999, technology was still very kind of iffy and back and forth. At the trial, the jury did not buy that this DNA evidence was as solid as the prosecution was saying. They felt something just wasn't right with it. Furthermore, they had descriptions of what Franklin Smith looked like during the time of the murder, and he was actually mostly bald. He did not have this lush curly hair. The defense brought up evidence that Eileen was being harassed by a customer, another customer at the store making sexual advances towards her. This person, the description of that person did not match Franklin Smith either. At his trial, the jury came back deadlocked. Six votes to, to of guilty, six votes of not guilty. The judge said, please go back and keep working on this. They still couldn't do it. So the trial was deadlocked and he declared a mistrial. In the year 2000, I believe, he goes on trial again. They basically used the exact same evidence. The DNA still was not as conclusive as they had hoped. The fingerprints, I mean, they can't explain that. They're, they were his fingerprints. His appearance did not match the description of the man seen leaving with Eileen. And so in this trial, he was found not guilty. That's it. He can no longer be retried for that murder. In February of 2020, he died. And so if he did commit this murder, he got away with it. But if he didn't, who did? They don't really have any other suspects. They didn't really investigate many other people. The few tips they got in about certain suspects, they were able to rule them out and clear them. They did run the DNA and fingerprints against any other suspects that they had, which was few. Nothing ever matched. Now it's just sort of an unsolved mystery. Here we are in 2024 and Eileen Mangold still has not gotten justice and she deserves justice. So if you have any information about the murder of Eileen Mangold, please contact the police in Riverview, Florida, and you can report your information anonymously. Please help Eileen and her family get the justice she deserves. If you see this man, contact the authorities because he is wanted for murder. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Emma Schaefer. Viewer discretion is advised. At the time of this case, Emma is living in Springfield, Illinois, and she is 24 years old. 
Emma was described as someone who was intent on making a difference in the world. She was a board member for the Springfield Immigrant Advocacy Group. She was an organizer for the Faith Coalition for the Common Good, and she volunteered at several different groups. Emma was described as a wonderful activist, someone who genuinely cared about everyone. She was the type of person that when she was growing up, if she saw a kid sitting in the lunchroom by themselves, she would get up and leave her friends to go sit with that kid. And it sounds like that stayed with her for her entire life. But unfortunately, that life would come to a very sudden end. On July 11th, 2023, around 11.30 p.m., Springfield, Illinois police got a phone call. It was the voice of a woman stating that her someone she knew had hurt Emma Schaefer and that she could be found at her place of residence. Police arrive at the home of Emma Schaefer and they find that she is deceased inside. Emma had been stabbed numerous times. However, this would not be a murder mystery. This would not be a cold case to a degree. They knew who did it. Because the woman who called police was the sister of this man, Gabriel Calixto. He had been a recent boyfriend to Emma Schaefer. This actually ends up getting worse because they found out that back in 2018, Gabriel was actually arrested for kidnapping another girlfriend and for assaulting that girlfriend. And he was convicted of that crime. Unbelievably, the man was only sentenced to six years in prison. But in 2020, the courts there overturned his conviction due to what they described as constitutional reasons. And he was released because he was resentenced to time served, which allowed him to be free, which allowed him to eventually meet Emma Schaefer. I don't know if they know what led to this particular attack where he would stab her to death, but not only is he being charged with murder, but he's also being charged with domestic abuse charges. Unfortunately, he fled the city or the state or something immediately after committing the crime, before police even knew Emma was dead. And he has yet to be caught. Now that he is out of their jurisdiction, the U.S. Marshals have taken over or are helping with this case, and they are trying to track down Gabriel Calixto. They don't have any idea where he is. If you do see this man, he is considered armed and dangerous and to not approach him. You'd want to contact your local authorities and give them all the information you can. And you can also contact the Springfield Police at 217-788-8311. But if you see him, please report him, but do not approach. He has killed and he may kill again. It took 43 years, but DNA once again for the win. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Eric and Liliana. Viewer discretion is advised. Eric Goldstrand was born on July 14th, 1960, and he lived in Eugene, Oregon. At the time of this story, he was dating fellow high schooler Liliana Adank. She was born on November 21st, 1960. The two of them were high school students at North Eugene High School in Eugene, Oregon. They were described as two very good-natured, fun-loving, outgoing people, and that they were just perfect for one another. Their personalities never seemed to clash, and many would say that they were just made for each other. But unfortunately, their lives would both be cut short together. On June 9th, 1977, the couple was going to go out to a little uh, area to do some fishing and have a picnic. Eric, who was having some on-again, off-again car issues, told his parents, hey, if we're not home by 10 p.m., come out looking for us because maybe my car probably hasn't started. So Eric and Liliana had gone to the Fall Creek area to do their, you know, fishing and picnic. But well after 10 p.m., they still had not come home. So Eric's parents said, okay, he said to go look for them. That happened, and that's exactly what they did. They arrived at the area, they found Eric's vehicle, and both teenagers' clothes were in the car. So they assumed that both, you know, Eric and Liliana were probably in their swimsuits somewhere nearby. As they continued searching, they made a very horrific discovery. Nearby in the bushes and kind of near the water, they found the body of 16-year-old Liliana Adank. She had been sexually assaulted. Not too far away from where she was found, they then found the body of 16-year-old Eric Goldstrand. His body had been thrown in a bush. Both had been shot to death. Police collected evidence like fingerprints and DNA, fingerprints that did not match either one of them. They collected the DNA, but this was before DNA technology was really a thing, but thankfully they stored it. I believe this was male bodily fluid found with Liliana. But unfortunately, almost from the get-go, this case just went cold. 
They couldn't find anyone who had any grudge with either of them. They interviewed people in the local area and they couldn't come up with a suspect. And quite frankly, technology just wasn't there to help them. As a matter of fact, it wasn't until 2020 when they finally caught a break. They would end up using, you know, Parabon Labs with the DNA technology that's been, you know, very much updated. You know, the same process that caught the Golden State Killer. And this, they came out with basically this image. They then also used the DNA genealogy and it pinpointed to a specific family. And then it narrowed down to this man here. Ronald Albert Schroy, who was 23 years old at the time of the murders. He did not know the couple at all. However, he would never face justice because when they got the match, he ended his own life. A living nightmare would occur behind these walls. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Eric Glover and Terrence Rankins. Viewer discretion is advised. I don't really have a lot of background information on these two gentlemen, but I do know that they were close friends and they lived in Joliet, Illinois. At 3.55 p.m. on January 10th, 2013, Joliet police were dispatched to this house here. The initial call said that there were two dead bodies inside. When police arrive, they do confirm there are two dead bodies. There are also several other people in the house who are alive and were allegedly the people who killed these two men. The bodies were identified as Eric Glover and Terrence Rankins. Each man was found in a different room of the house, and they both had bags tied over their heads. One of them, Jesus Christ! Oh, sorry. One of the men in the house was this guy, Joshua Minor. He was like screaming to the cops, uh, we killed them because they were trying to, you know, rape the girls in the house. So he said it was self-defense. They were fighting them, and then it, they just killed them. So Joshua Minor was arrested as, my God as was a friend of his named Adam Landerman. He also was basically stating that he killed one of the men. This was one of the women they alleged these two men were trying to sexually assault. Alyssa Massaro, she sure looks really traumatized, doesn't she? So the three of them were arrested and the friends would tell them about this woman, Bethany McKee, who apparently was also in the house when the murders happened. Bethany McKee would tell police something pretty horrific. Alyssa and John had intercourse on top of the deceased bodies. They placed the two men next to each other and then put something on top of them and then did it. Police would also uncover that they had abused the, the dead man's bodies. The four of them then partied after the two men were dead. Well, it turns out the motive was not what they said it was. Shocker. Joshua Minor just wanted to rob a couple people. And then he wanted to kill these people. And then he said, I wanted to take their faces off like Leatherface and wear it. Apparently, Josh Miner said that he wanted to scalp Mr. Glover and then wear it like a hat. They planned to dismember the bodies, but they never got around to doing any of that. Fueled by alcohol and other illegal substances, they managed to lure the two men into the house. And eventually they found a way to strangle these two innocent men until they were dead, and then they defiled their corpses. Alyssa Massaro was convicted and just got 10 years in prison, and she was actually released in 2018. Bethany McKee, whose toddler was in the house during the murders, got life in prison. Adam Landerman got life in prison, and mastermind Josh Miner got life in prison. It's been 20 years and they still have no answers. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Eric Nellums. Viewer discretion is advised. At the time of this case, Eric Nellums was a 32-year-old father, and he was also a former member of the U.S. military. He was living in Phoenix City, Alabama. It was September 26, 2003, at approximately 5.30 in the morning. It's reported that Eric was simply walking out of his home and going towards his vehicle. He was scheduled to work that morning. But all of a sudden, gunshots rang out, and Eric is on the ground. 911 was called, they arrive, and Eric is basically laying just kind of outside of his door. Unfortunately, the paramedics were unable to save him, and he was pronounced dead at the scene. I don't really have much more information other than that. I don't know if they ever have come up with any viable suspects. I don't know what kind of evidence they may have had at the scene. I don't know what witnesses may have seen. There is very little actually published about this case. 
But Eric's family and the Fennec City Police Department are still looking for answers. They're looking for closure. They're looking for justice. Surely somebody somewhere out there knows why he was shot. Was this a targeted attack? Was it random? Was it mistaken identity? Somebody knows, and there is currently a $5,000 reward for any information that helps lead to capture Eric's killer. So if you are that person who has information, you can report that anonymously. You don't have to say who you are. You just have to say what you know. So please call 334-448-2836. There is also a 24-hour tip line you can call, which is 334 334- 215-7867. Eric and his family deserve answers, and he deserves justice. So if you could make that happen, please do. On the afternoon of August 20th, 2000, the body of a 24-year-old woman was found, and police still need help in finding her killer. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Aaron Taylor. Viewer discretion is advised. This story happened in Marquette, Michigan where 24-year-old Aaron Rebecca Taylor lived. Aaron's best friend, Bonnie, would say that the two of them met at a women's shelter and they both moved to Marquette, Michigan together. Bonnie says that Aaron at one point was estranged from her family because her family were Jehovah's Witnesses and she just wasn't that. So she would venture out on her own and she did really well for herself, but she began to miss her family. So by around early 2000 or so, she kind of began to get back, you know, to her family. She actually went to uh, Jehovah's Witness Kingdom Hall. I'm not sure what that is, but she was attending that. And then she would meet in with a couple she met at that church. Erin was working as a secretary at the medical center in the Upper Peninsula. On August 11th, 2000, she left work, but then she appeared to never be seen again. The last people that can actually state they saw her were her co-workers that day. Nine days later, off of County Road 492, within a couple of miles of where she lived, her badly decomposed body was found. Initially, they had a hard time identifying her because of the decomposition, but I believe dental records would confirm that it was the body of Erin Taylor. When she was found, she had a piece of cloth tied around her neck, and her cause of death was strangulation. When she was initially reported missing, they almost immediately felt that foul play was suspected, and obviously now this confirms it. They were able to, I guess, determine that the likely place where she was killed was her own home, and then she was dumped in this location. Shortly before she went missing, Erin had started talking to a man online, and the two of them planned to meet that actual weekend at a hotel. However, according to that man, she never showed up. Police did look into that man, and they apparently have cleared him of having any involvement in this. And unfortunately, that kind of seems to be where it stops. In 2013, police did announce that they had a suspect in the case, but that person's name was never actually said out loud. Her friend Bonnie had said that this person of interest or suspect, well, unfortunately, that person is now deceased. The friend, Bonnie, does believe that this person, whoever it may be, was responsible for killing her friend. But police have not been able to close this case because they don't have the evidence to do so. And so really what they need is something from the public, any information, because she deserves justice. And so if you have information about the murder of Aaron Taylor, please call the Marquette Police Department at 906-228-0400. When this cruise ship docked, it was missing one passenger. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Fariba Amani. Viewer discretion is advised. At the time of this story, Fariba Amani was a 47-year-old mother to two children. She was divorced or separated from the father of her kids. But she was dating this man here, Ramiz Goshani. He invited her on a cruise, the Bahamas Celebration Cruise, and she was very unsure about going. She was seriously considering ending the relationship. But Ramiz Golshani had already prepaid the entire cruise. And so Fariba said, fine, I'll go just because it's prepaid. And she told you know friends and family that while on this cruise and afterwards, I'll know whether or not I truly want to leave him or stay with him. But it does need to be noted that she was seriously considering breaking up with him. She was not happy in the relationship. The cruise would take off in February of 2012. 
And on February 29th, 2012, Fariba disappeared. Somewhere between the Bahamas and Florida, she just vanished off the cruise ship. Her boyfriend reported her missing to the crew at about 8 o'clock in the morning. Once they were notified of the disappearance, an 84-hour, 10,000-square-mile search began. And that was done by the Coast Guard. However, they found no signs of the missing woman. When the cruise ship docked, they had FBI and police board the ship and then conducted an investigation. They also found no signs or traces of what happened to Fariba. They did discover that the cruise ship did have surveillance cameras. But as far as I know, they said that Fariba was never captured on any of the cameras, which seems strange to me. And so it sounds like they think, well, she must have gone overboard then. But her family is like, no. Fariba was not a drinker. She never drank alcohol, so therefore she couldn't have been drunk. The railings were relatively high, so the odds of her like leaning in and flipping over were low, but it's, it's not impossible. It could have happened. What raises red flags to the family is that Ramiz has stayed silent ever since it happened. When confronted by, you know, news reporters or the family themselves, he says nothing. He hasn't reached out to the family on his own. He hasn't given condolences. Not one single attempt to ever contact her family has been made by him. He was described as an incredibly controlling man. He needed to know everything that Fariba was doing at every moment of the day. She was in constant fear that he would be upset with her over something. However, police and FBI have not named him a suspect in this. He has cooperated with police and the FBI, and they just don't have enough evidence to charge him with anything. They don't have Fariba. So at this point, her disappearance is a mystery. Did she fall off? Was she thrown off? Where is Fariba Amani? A man is found shot to death in the parking lot of a truck stop. Did he do it to himself, or was it murder? Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Gene Ward. Viewer discretion is advised. Information on this case is very, very scarce. At the time of this case, Gene Ward is 33 years old. This is him pictured with his ex-wife, also named Jean, but spelled G-E-A-N. They had, I believe, four or five kids together, but at the time of the story, they were divorced. Gene Ward had gotten himself a job at a place called the Southern 500 Truck Stop in Elm City, which is in North Carolina. On September 1st, 1973, Gene Ward was found shot to death in the parking lot of that truck stop. He had a single gunshot wound to his head. I'm having a hard time finding any mention of the actual gun or where it was located. But the sheriff's department almost immediately ruled this a suicide. His family believed this was not a suicide. Gene Ward had literally just gotten remarried and he was one of the happiest he had been in a long time. This case wasn't investigated at all. It wouldn't be until 2010 when one of his now adult daughters began looking into his death. When she looked into this, she found that there was no case file really. The sheriff's department had conveniently lost all the evidence. It was completely gone. She did find the coroner who actually had a file on this case, who he noted back then that he did not think this was a suicide. The coroner notated that he had a gunshot to the left side of his head and it had to have been fired from three to five feet away. But the sheriff's department apparently said, nope. What's more is that his friends and family, they never even saw him with a gun. They didn't even know he owned one. So his daughter found out that Gene knew a lot of the sheriff's deputies. As a matter of fact, a lot of them were customers at that truck stop. She also found some type of evidence that he may have known about illegal goings on in the area, possibly being done by the sheriff's deputies. She then finds out that all of the evidence, all of the files on this case, all burned up mysteriously in a fire. So it sounds like he knew about some things he wasn't supposed to know about, and he may have been killed by the sheriff's department. I also forgot to mention he had no powder burns on his hands at all. I'm not sure exactly when this started, but recently the new sheriff had reopened this case. He also couldn't find any files on it at all, except for what the coroner back then had. Most of the officers, including the sheriff, they're all dead now. But this new sheriff found that through interviews, there was a whole bunch of inconsistencies back then. And that something does seem to be very suspicious about all of this. But with nearly everyone dead, all the evidence gone, they may never know exactly what happened to him or why. But was it suicide or was it murder? 
I'm inclined to believe murder, but that's just me. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Ginger Hayes. Viewer discretion is advised. Ginger was born on August 9th, 1977, and she did have a brother. By the time this case occurred, she is married to a man named Jeremy Hayes, who is in the Air Force, and the two of them have a son named Nicholas. In June of 2001, Ginger, her husband, Nicholas, and her brother, they were visiting family in North Carolina. On June 30th, they would get back into their rented vehicle and head back to their home in Virginia. On the way, they would make a pit stop in Greenville, North Carolina. They pulled into a CVS. Jeremy and Ginger's brother would go into the CVS to purchase some snacks and stuff like that. Ginger would stay outside because she wanted to change the baby's diaper. When the two men walked out several minutes later, Ginger and the baby and the car were gone. At first, they thought this was like a joke she was pulling. But after they tried calling her phone and she didn't answer, they called 911. That's when they learned that there was another 911 call that was just made. This may not be nothing, but there was a red uh, Ford Focus. There was a girl bent over her and it did something. And then they came up behind her and they looked like they pushed her in and they took off. A mailman in the parking lot witnessed the actual kidnapping of Ginger and her baby. He immediately called 911. He described a black male came behind her and basically shoved her into the car, then got into it and they sped off. Police would discover that Ginger's credit card was being used at a nearby store. They pulled up surveillance footage and they see Ginger alongside this man here and they are making a purchase. Nothing seems out of the ordinary to the people there, but this is the man who kidnapped her. Then they are observed walking out of the store and Ginger is never seen again. And the other thing is the baby is nowhere in these videos. Just an hour or so later, the rental car that she was kidnapped in was found parked outside of someone's house. The people inside happened to have Ginger's cell phone and some jewelry she owned. Well, they said it was given to them by a friend, a man named Andre Edwards. But when he left the car there and gave them the cell phone and everything, the friend said that Ginger and the baby was not there with him. Eight hours after she was taken, a man was walking his dog in these woods and they found the body of Ginger Hayes. They also found what at first they thought was the body of a baby. The baby was face down in the dirt, severely sunburned, but alive. And this was Ginger's baby. He would make a full recovery. That same night, Andre Edwards was found and apprehended. He said he was highly intoxicated. He also did not deny he did it. The motive essentially was robbery but he needed to get rid of Ginger, so he beat her to death with a tire rim and then just left the baby there. Ginger was in the wrong place at the wrong time. He tried to say he had a really rough childhood, which he did, but it's no excuse to kill someone. A jury found him guilty, and he was sentenced to life in prison without parole. A murder mystery 50 years in the making finally has some answers, but it still does not have justice. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Gregory Nickel. Viewer discretion is advised. Gregory Dahl Nickel was born on May 29, 1951. He grew up in Duchesne County, which is in Utah. He had a brother and a sister. I believe he was one of three total siblings. Eventually, he would join the army and he would fight in the Vietnam War. Gregory was described as just a very kind-hearted and gentle soul. At the time of this case, he is 21 years old and his girlfriend is 18. It's approximately 1 o'clock in the morning on November 26, 1972. This is Thanksgiving weekend. Gregory and his girlfriend were parked at this overlook in Vernal, Utah, when all of a sudden, a guy walks up to the car and, and knocks on the window and he asks for help. Gregory, being the helpful, kind person he is, even to strangers, said, of course. As Gregory turns, I guess, to do something in the car, the man points a 22 caliber pistol at the back of Gregory's head. And without question, without any warning, he pulls the trigger multiple times. He shoots Gregory dead right there on the spot. The man then just opens the door, takes Gregory's body, and shoves it over onto his girlfriend's seat on top of his girlfriend who is still alive and is terrified. The man is continuing to point a gun now at her head saying don't do anything stupid or I'm going to shoot you too. They then get onto US Highway 40. They drive for a little bit. They then pull into another area where another vehicle basically ends up pulling up in front of 
the car with this murderer and this terrified woman in it. And it appeared the, the crazy gunman was friends with whoever was parking in front of them. This guy had a partner. Unfortunately, it was very dark and the 18-year-old girl did not get a very good look at her assailant or this other man. They threw a blanket over her and forced it on her and said, if you take it off, we're shooting you. They then drive for a couple of hours and the two men will take turns stopping the car and raping this 18-year-old girl. They both do it. Then the two men just drop her off and leave her on the side of the road. And I believe they then take the car with Gregory's body in it, leave it somewhere and set it on fire, where then it is found and his body is found. The girl manages to get to someone's house or somewhere for her to get some help. And then soon she tells police what happened and then it coincides with finding the body of Gregory. Now, there was a rape kit done on the victim and there was male bodily fluid found, but in 1972 they didn't really have the technology to deal with it like we do now. But the actual murder case goes cold very quickly. And then in 2020, they end up having a cold case team work on this. They submit the DNA. They were able to find two separate DNA profiles at this point. One of the DNA profiles came back with a hit to a man named David Arthur Bell. David Arthur Bell lived in the area where this murder and sexual assault happened. He had been convicted many years down the road, I think in 1992 or so, of another sexual assault. He had been released in 1999, but in 2019, he died. And so the DNA, one of the DNA profiles was him. And so they know that he was one of the two men who sexually assaulted this girl whose name has not been released to the public. But they don't know if he was the shooter or if he was the other guy. The other profile, DNA profile, they have yet to find any match to. They used the forensic genealogy with the Parabon Labs, which was is solving all sorts of crimes and murders now, thankfully. He had been cremated, uh, David had been, so they asked his family after they did the genealogical, you know, family tree thing with the DNA, the family cooperated and that's how they got the match. However, the second profile has still not matched anyone. But now police are reaching out to the public. If anyone knew David Arthur Bell back in 1972 in Utah and knew who he associated with, police need to know and they need to know who this other man was because there is still a chance that justice can be served if that man is still alive. I'm sure they're running it through the genealogical, you know, family tree situation, but it's not always going to get a result. It's not one of those things where it's like, this will definitely solve it. If you have any information about the murder of Gregory Nickel and who the other individual may have been, please contact the Sheriff's Department at 435-781-6700. Help David and his girlfriend get the justice they rightfully deserve. She had a seizure, he says, as he is trying to hide the gunshot wound. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Haley Johnson. Viewer discretion is advised. At the time of this case, Haley Johnson is 21 years old and she's living in Cobb County, Georgia. Haley was described as warm and inviting. She was a caring person, loved to smile. She had a great sense of humor. Her family described her as passionate and feisty and zesty. She was a very protective person of the people that she loved. She was an amazing sister, a fantastic daughter. She loved spending time with her family and her friends, and she was a huge animal lover as well. She was working as an assistant manager at a place called Rocket Fizz, and she just had a lot of things to look forward to. But sadly, on Christmas Day 2022, it would be the last time her family ever saw her alive. On December 26, the following day, police would go to her family's home to notify them that Haley is deceased. Haley was living here at the Campus Edge Apartments in Cobb County, Georgia with her boyfriend. The boyfriend would run to a neighbor's apartment and say Haley had a seizure. The neighbor goes back to the apartment with him. He goes back to his girlfriend who's lying on the ground. He then picks up her head and conceals her head like he's consoling her. The neighbor, as he's calling 911, looks into another room and says there's blood everywhere and it looks like a murder happened. When ambulance and firemen arrive, they go to Haley. He keeps saying she had a seizure while he still has her head in his lap. But finally, they're able to move him aside. They're trying to work on Haley, but it's too late. Haley Johnson is pronounced dead. 
All the while, Brooks Michael Cleary is telling police that she had a seizure. Later on, when he's in an interrogation room, he changes his story. He says, ah, uh, she slipped and fell and hit her head. But the firemen had already noticed at that point that there was a hole in the back of her head. The coroner would determine that it was a gunshot wound. She had been shot through her mouth. However, at the scene, there was no gun. It was clear that she had been shot on the couch given the blood evidence and then she had moved her body to the floor. Why would you do that if she shot herself? Because that is a working theory that she committed suicide. Well, why was the gun next to her? Why did the boyfriend move the gun? Why did he hide it? To her friends and family, Haley was not suicidal. She had never threatened to do it. She had never attempted to do it. She had a lot of things that she was planning for and looking forward to. But most importantly, the scene did not indicate a suicide. Why would the boyfriend tell two very different stories about what happened to her, but conveniently leave out the gun aspect? Knowing full well, they'd find out that she was shot. Police did not test his hands for gunshot residue. They didn't give him a drug test. They didn't check to see if he had changed his clothes. The crime scene was not thoroughly investigated. This looks and sounds like a cookie cutter murder. So the coroner says the cause of death was the shotgun wound to head, but the manner of death is undetermined, meaning they don't have the evidence to determine whether or not she did this to herself or if someone else did this to her. Seems pretty clear though. You have a guy who lied and told two very different stories about how this happened, never once mentioning a gun. The gun is not found initially at the house. I don't know for sure if they found the gun yet or not, but it's not like she shot herself and then hid the gun somewhere and then put herself on the ground. From what I understand in his uh, police conversation in the interrogation room, he got really mad and started destroying shit. But what's infuriating is that he has never been charged with any form of murder or assault or any violent crime. He hasn't been charged with any of that. He was charged with concealment of a death and concealment of a weapon. So technically this is still ongoing, but I believe just recently he was found guilty of concealment of a death and these concealment charges. However, there is, I guess, a court hearing coming up where the judge can decide whether or not to keep that conviction or toss it. And it sounds like the family believes the judge is leaning towards tossing the conviction why he would think about doing I don't even know why he would do that like this is to me such an in-your-face obvious thing it's clear that someone else shot her like that that should be obvious to anyone with eyes and a brain but somehow this dude is essentially getting away with it make it make sense but hey let's make the dude famous right you don't just get to kill someone allegedly and then just walk away Haley was an incredible person. She is missed by so many people. Everyone in her life knows that she didn't do this to herself. And so Haley Johnson deserves justice, just like everyone else does. So if you have any information, please contact the Marietta Police Department at 770-794-5300 and compel them to do the right thing, especially if you know the information. Please help Haley Johnson and her family get the justice she deserves. So I need to make a correction to the last video I posted. If you click on this comment, you can go back to the original video in case you're seeing this video first. But that, that video will cover the case of Haley Johnson. So this is her sister. And I just want to say, first and foremost, I am incredibly sorry for your loss. She seemed like a really amazing person. And I really hope you and your family get justice very soon because it's very, to me, to a lot of people, it's very clear what happened. Let me know uh, if you would rather me just redo the video completely or if you're okay with this, um, just let me know. But the correction I need to make is that they did actually do a gunshot residue test on Brooks, the boyfriend, but apparently they only really did it to his fingertips. And then according to uh, her sister, I guess he waited like at least 10 minutes before he went to get help, you know, from the neighbor. So there's a very good chance he probably washed his hands anyway. And apparently he's seen in the interrogation footage with police that he's like either rubbing his fingers or rubbing his hands or something, maybe trying to clean them off. They did not do a gunshot residue test on Haley. 
because there is that theory that she may have done this to herself, which is just asinine to me, given the way everything came to be. But they didn't, they didn't test her hands. And then the second thing isn't necessarily a correction. I just, in my video, I didn't know where, what happened to the gun because the news article, which there's very little coverage of her story, but they didn't mention like the actual location of the gun itself. So I didn't, I didn't know. But apparently it was in the, in the home, but I guess Brooks had, was trying to hide it in like one or two different spots. I think he was sitting on top of it at one point, like on a pile of clothes. Like he was clearly trying to conceal the fact that there was a gun there while he's also trying to conceal the fact that there is a gunshot wound to her, saying, uh, it was a seizure or uh, she fell and hit her head. I don't know what kind of police investigated this and how on God's green earth they don't look at this and go, yeah, this is definitely a murder or very least manslaughter something. I, I, don't, I don't get it. I don't understand it. Again, she died from a gunshot wound the gun was attempted to be hid by the boyfriend on multiple occasions. He stated multiple different reasons as to why she was in the situation she was in, but never mentioned a gunshot or a gun or anything. Like, to me, that's, that's just enough probable cause to arrest him and book him and just collect more evidence. Like, I don't understand. I don't get this. Does, do you know, like, does he know somebody, like, with connections to police or the judge or something like is there that kind of connection there her story needs to be heard by everyone and people need to be mad because she deserves justice clearly she was murdered they need to treat it as such sadly it sounds like everybody knows that he is deceased it's just a matter of finding him hello true crimeers this is the case of harold schrotter viewer discretion is advised at the time of this case, Harold Schroeder was a 57-year-old postal worker who was living in Falcon Heights, Minnesota. His son, Nick Schroeder, would tell people at a press conference about his case that his dad served in the Navy for 20 years. His dad had been working for the Postal Service for the past 10 years. He had never missed a day of work. He said his father, Harold, was a provider. He always wanted to help people out. He loved to have people come over and he could cook food for them. He was a jokester, and Nick says his jokes are basically like dad jokes, but, you know, you always laughed. On February 27th, 2009, his live-in girlfriend, Jackie Dubay, reported him missing to police. She said he had seen him last the day prior, February 26th. The weird thing is, is where he was heading that day, Harold was going to his attorney's office. For what reason? Well, he was going to see his estate attorney to remove his girlfriend as his beneficiary because Harold was done with Jackie. He wanted her out of his life. He wanted her out of his home. And on his way to that meeting, he suddenly disappears. He never makes it to the meeting. On March 1st, his 2004 Chrysler is found abandoned in St. Paul, Minnesota, a few miles from his home. The car yields no evidence of like foul play. There's no blood or anything like that. When police learns that he was actually in the middle of a breakup with Jackie, the one who reported him missing, they are able to get a warrant to search her vehicle. On the trunk latch of her car, they found blood. That blood would later match Harold Schroeder. Police also learned they had recently taken out the trunk liner and replaced it with brand new liner, all after Harold would have disappeared. Jackie Dubay and her brother, Jay, are considered prime suspects in this case. Four years after the disappearance, a judge essentially ruled that Harold Schroeder was deceased and that these two, especially her, are the likely people behind his death. However, they do not have the physical evidence enough of it to prove they did something to him. They have never found Harold's body. They have never found any real traces of him. And in most cases, you do at least need the body or enough evidence to show and prove that a murder occurred. The blood they found on her vehicle was a small amount of blood. Not enough to state that, yep, she definitely murdered him, even though we all pretty much know they did. But you have to prove it. Luckily, she's never gotten a penny of his money, despite him never getting to that appointment. But police need help to lay charges and to find him. If you have information, please call 612-782-3350. A young woman is found murdered inside her apartment, and thank goodness her killer was stupid. 
Hello, true Kramerers. This is the case of Heather Stigliano. Viewer discretion is advised. At the time of this case, Heather Stigliano is 19 years old. She had recently moved from her home state of Pennsylvania to Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. Heather was very much about entertainment and she wanted to pursue a career in either being an actress or a model, a singer. And so that's why she moved to Myrtle Beach because she felt she would have a good chance of getting to that goal. She got herself an apartment there in Myrtle Beach and she lived alone. Heather would talk to her mom on the phone basically every day, sometimes multiple times a day. Heather was last seen alive on November 4th, 1991. She had spoken to her mom, I think a day or so after that on the phone, but then suddenly she stopped answering her phone and she had never called her mom again. So her mom raised some red flags and some friends went to Heather's apartment to check on her. On November 11th, 1991, her friends entered her apartment and found that Heather had been murdered. Heather was stabbed just many, many, many times. This was a very violent and vicious attack. She had also been beaten, it looked like, over her head. There were these black plastic chunks of something found near her body. The crime scene investigators discovered that there was a shoe impression on Heather's like shirt, on her chest. They also sprayed the floor around where her body was and they ended up finding old shoe impressions, shoe prints, that had apparently been attempted to be cleaned up but the shoe impressions were made in blood. The shoe impressions found on the floor were the same shoe impression found on Heather's body. Heather's television had been stolen and other items had been taken. The house did definitely appear to be ransacked as if someone was attempting to rob her. They also stole her car. Heather did not appear to be sexually assaulted, so that did not seem to be the motive. There was no signs of forced entry, so they, they felt like this may have been someone she knew. So. They had suspected a guy she was dating, but then they were able to find out he was actually overseas during the time she was killed and so he couldn't have done it. There was another person that her family told police about, about this guy who was really bothering her at a recent Halloween party. He was like super weird and creepy. They found out who it was, they looked into him and they found out that it could not have been him. He was cleared. Not too soon after her body is found, the police get a phone call from a pawn shop. Someone had uh, attempted to pawn a camera and it was actually the same type of camera that was also stolen from Heather's apartment. This pawn shop guy had a really good memory. He remembers hearing about this on the news and that's why he called police. When police arrived that this was in fact the actual camera stolen from her apartment. And this is where the stupidity comes in. The guy who pawned it gave him, gave the pawn employee his license plate number. And so he kept that, the pawn guy. He then gave that to police, they ran it, and it was the car of Heather Stigliano. He used her stolen car's license plate at the pawn shop. The pawn shop guy gave a very detailed description of this man and they came up with a composite drawing. That is when several employees at a local construction site had recognized the composite drawing. They said it looked a whole lot like someone they knew named James Whipple. James, at the time police got to this construction site to talk to these witnesses, James had suddenly and unexpectedly just walked out and quit his job a couple of weeks back, literally around the time that Heather Sigliano was killed. So the hunt for her car is still on because it still hasn't been found. Six days later in Florida, someone lets police in Myrtle Beach know we have the car. We've pulled someone over and we have the guy. Police go there, they look at the car, they confirm this is Heather's vehicle, her stolen car. In the car, they found a serrated knife with blood on it and it had, it had damage to it. They found bloody clothing. They found a clothes iron. The clothes iron had some broken chunks missing from it and they would later find out the black plastic chunks found next to her body were the broken pieces from this iron. And so they determined he had struck her over the head with the iron as well. They also found a pair of shoes. The pair of shoes was tested. It was the exact same shoe that left the bloody shoe impressions on the floor of Heather's apartment and also on Heather herself. The police, they, they flat out asked him, like, did you kill Heather Sigliano? And 
He said yes. He confessed immediately. Once he was in custody, he said he did it. So his reason, he said he had a bad history with drugs and he said people will do anything, literally anything, to get access to those or to get the money to get them. Apparently James said he knew that Heather had been working as a waitress and I guess he followed her home. She got lots of cash tips again, as a waitress. He went to her apartment, basically knocked on the door. She opened it. He stormed in and attacked her. He then ransacked her apartment looking for money, for anything, and he killed her. And he told police, I did it and you should kill me. I should get the death penalty for this. He goes on trial and he's found guilty and he's actually spared the death penalty. And James Whipple is sentenced to life in prison without parole. And so Heather Sigliano got the justice she rightfully deserved. She was murdered 36 years ago. Will she ever get justice? Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Ina Langstaff. Viewer discretion is advised. At the time of this case, Ina Claire Langstaff was 24 years old and she was living in the beautiful Flagstaff, Arizona, which is like an hour and a half, two hours north of me. And she was a student at NAU. Ina was really interested in computer programming, but she also had a dream to work at the U.S. Embassy in France after college. Ina was described as really personable, very friendly, and she was someone that once you met her and got to know her, you would never forget her. Unfortunately, someone decided to take all of that from the world one day in 1987. November 7th, 1987, 8.17 a.m. The body of Ina Langstaff was found just outside of her apartment. She had been lying in the parking lot. Ina had been stabbed numerous times. Based on this scene, it looked as if she had been stabbed closest to her apartment and she managed to drag herself to the location where she was eventually found, about 20 feet away. Police soon found out about a 24-year-old man named Richard Ortega. He was someone who actually had been accused of stabbing two people to death in Albuquerque, New Mexico. They had found out that Richard Ortega had been in Flagstaff as early as May of the same year that Ina was killed. He was arrested back in May for marijuana possession in Flagstaff, but he was soon released. He then finds himself in California where he is once again arrested, this time for the murders he may have committed in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Once he was arrested, police in Arizona go to talk to him with regards to the murder of Ina Langstaff, but they did not really get much information out of him. And it got to a point where police and Flagstaff said, well, we're not going to pursue him any further until we have evidence. Because they had no physical evidence connecting him to her murder. They also don't know the motive behind her murder. Was this someone that she knew? Was this a chance encounter? It doesn't sound like she was sexually assaulted. She was just attacked and stabbed. Now, Ina did have a roommate at the time. The roommate said the last time she saw Ina was 11.30 p.m. the night before she was found in the parking lot. The roommate said that Ina left the apartment at 11.30 p.m. to let her cat outside, but then she never saw her again. Did the cat come back inside? I'm actually not sure. Police also discovered there was a party going on very close by, but nobody from that party claimed to have seen Ina go there that night. So what was she doing between 11.30 p.m. and the time she was found? How did nobody see her? If the motive wasn't sexual assault or robbery, because nothing was stolen, why did this happen? Why Ina? That's a question they are still asking. Well, if you have information about the murder of Ina Langstaff, please contact the Coconino Sheriff's Department at 928-774-4523. A family slain and for what? Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of the Jackson family murders. Viewer discretion is advised. The Jackson family lived here in this home in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. The family consisted of 61-year-old Jan Jackson, 68-year-old Melissa Jackson, 19-year-old Sabrina, and 20-year-old Alexander Jackson. They were considered a very respectable family in the area. They got along with everyone. They were known by everyone. There were no issues of, like, abuse. The father and mother didn't have any, like, extramarital affairs. And this is the type of family you just would not expect this kind of horror story to happen to. But on June 15th, 2021, a horror story would occur. 911 receives a phone call from Alex Jackson that someone had broken into their house and shot his family. When police gain entry to the home, right there in the entryway is the father, Jan. He is shot dead. 
And then down the hall, you can see Alex Jackson. He had been shot in the foot and there was a blood trail going down from where his dad was. Searching the house, they also found the body of the mother and the sister. Three of the family members had been shot dead and there was only one survivor. Alex Jackson had been shot through his foot and he was rushed to a hospital. They would treat him and he would be fine in the end. When questioned by police, he said that it was a black man who entered their home. He didn't know him. The guy just broke into the house in the middle of the afternoon and using one of the family's guns, shot and killed the family and tried to kill him. The murder weapon was a 22 caliber semi-automatic rifle. The killer would have had to have reloaded the gun at least one time during this whole process. This particular gun was extremely difficult to load. And if you're not familiar with this gun, you wouldn't really know that. So it seemed odd to police that an intruder who didn't know this family would steal a gun from within the house and kill them and know how to properly use this gun. Police scoured the neighborhood for CCTV footage, which they found some. They found no evidence of a person walking up to the house, no evidence of this intruder entering or leaving, and they had footage from various angles. Furthermore, the murder weapon, which was in the house still, had fingerprints on it and palm prints. The prints on the gun matched one and one person only, Alex Jackson, which was absolutely baffling to the entire community and the rest of his family because he was a really, really well-behaved, good kid. He didn't have issues with his family. He didn't have issues with anyone. But police found out he was basically broke. And also, he was likely failing out of college. And maybe he didn't want his dad to know that and possibly kick him out of the house. Alex Jackson is charged with the murders of his family. There was a ton of evidence that he did it, even though the motive wasn't totally clear. He was convicted. He got three life sentences. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Jerry Lee Greer. Viewer discretion is advised. 71-year-old Jerry Lee Greer lived here in Templeton, California. Jerry, pictured there on the end, was the father to two, obviously, adult children. Their names are Deborah and Brian. Jerry did work as a mechanic. He also helped people with farming. He was described as a man who always kept his word. He was incredibly reliable. And he was basically a fixture there in Templeton, California. Everybody seemed to know Jerry. Sadly, on March 28th, 2009, Jerry would be discovered murdered inside of his home. According to the San Luis Obispo Sheriff's Department, Jerry had been shot one time, and that was obviously fatal. They made notes that there was really no sign of disarray inside the house. There wasn't things thrown everywhere. Nothing appeared to have been stolen. Whether or not the Sheriff's Department, though, has any actual evidence like fingerprints or DNA or anything like that, I'm actually not sure. All I know is that the Sheriff's Department has essentially said they don't believe robbery was the motive, and this may have been a specific targeted attack towards him. In 2018, a cold case team who's working on this case said that Brian Greer was considered a person of interest. Brian is his son. Brian, however, strongly maintains his innocence. He said he had nothing to do with it. And I don't know what evidence the Sheriff's Department or the police have on him, if any. Honestly, there are very few details about this case. But it's clear this man was murdered. The motive was likely not robbery. He didn't do this to himself. So who did it? Somebody somewhere out there has to know. This was in 2009. This really wasn't that long ago. So somebody somewhere out there has got to know the truth about what happened to him. If that person is you, you can always report your information anonymously. You don't have to say who you are. You just have to say what you know. But please call 805 781-4500. You can also submit a tip online at www.slotips.org. If you have the information that can finally get Jerry some justice, please come forward. A man tried to blame Xanax for his murders. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Jessica and Don. Viewer discretion is advised. Jessica Brittany Miller was born on September 11th, 1984, and she was living in Dalton, Georgia at the time of this case. Jessica was a very successful businesswoman. She actually had owned her own tanning salon. At one point, she married a man named Adolf Neal. Jessica had a daughter from a previous relationship, but Adolf apparently you know, took the daughter under his wing and adopted her. 
69-year-old Don William Shedd was Jessica's grandfather. And from what I understand, he was living with Jessica and her husband. Her husband, Adolf, with a, that's such an unfortunate name, was described as deceptively charismatic. And the reality is, behind closed door, he was a narcissistic sociopath. There had been reports that he had physically abused Jessica, and he was extremely unfaithful in their marriage. The two of them did argue all the time. On the evening of May 24th, 2012, they were having a very large fight, a verbal argument that eventually got way out of hand. The following morning, Jessica's nine-year-old daughter found her great-grandfather's body in the house. Don Shedd had been beaten to death. The nine-year-old girl couldn't find her mom and couldn't find her dad. But she runs out of the house in a panic, goes to the neighbor's house, calls 911. When police arrive and they do a check of the house, they do find Don Shedd's beaten body, but they also find the body of 27-year-old Jessica Neal. She had been stabbed violently to death. Jessica's husband, Adolf, was nowhere to be found. A week-long manhunt would commence to find him, and eventually they did, and he was arrested. Adolf had said, I was, you know, I was going through a lot at that time. I guess his brother died of cancer a month prior, and he was an emotional wreck. He blamed Jessica for having affairs when it was actually him who was doing it. He was depressed. He had recently been prescribed Xanax. He said that night he took Xanax along with a bunch of alcohol, something you should never do. And he said it was that combination that put him in that mindset, that, that rage mindset, that during this argument, he took out a knife and he stabbed his wife. And then he had to beat to death his wife's grandfather. He wanted to lessen his involvement and tried to blame it on a, on a medication because he's not that guy. He, he wouldn't do that. Jessica's family disagrees that he is exactly that guy. He would do something like this. His lawyer would say that Adolf is very sorry for what he did, I'm sure. In order to not get the death sentence, he would end up pleading guilty. The family agreed to it because they didn't want to make their daughter have to testify in a sentencing hearing. And so he ended up getting life in prison without parole. Help! I need an adult! <sighs> Hello, true crimers. This is the case of this lovely woman, Jody Loomis. Viewer discretion is advised. The story took place in Snohomish County, Washington in 1972. Jody Loomis, pictured here, was the oldest of two children. At the time this story happened, the 20-year-old was studying to become a nurse, and she absolutely loved horses and loved horse riding. On the afternoon of August 23, 1972, Jody would get on her bike and ride towards the stables where her horse was. However, she would never make it to her destination. At approximately 5.30 p.m. that same day, a couple who was walking off the beaten path, they found the partially clothed body of Jody Loomis. An ambulance was called and she was rushed to the hospital, but sadly, 20-year-old Jody Loomis would be pronounced dead. Jody had been sexually assaulted and she had been shot in her head. She was shot with a 22 caliber just above her right ear. There were no witnesses to whatever may have happened to her. The crime scene itself yielded very little evidence. They had the bullet, they had her body, but honestly, that was about it. They did, however, have Jody's shoe, and on her shoe was something that they believed was, you know, male bodily fluid. So they collected the shoe and they preserved the DNA. Well, before they knew what DNA even really was, but they kept the sample. And because of the lack of evidence and lack of witnesses, Jody Loomis's case would go cold very quickly. Then in 2008, they wanted to have a cold case team look at this case again. And they found out that her underwear, the bullet, and the vaginal swabs they took were all missing from evidence. But thankfully, they still had the shoe with the DNA from it. But then in 2018, they were finally able to create a profile from the DNA left behind, put it into CODIS, but it had no match. But then in July of that same year, they used forensic genealogy which then brought them to the family of this man, Terrence Miller. He lived in Snohomish County, Washington, at the same time of the murder. Fuck. He would have been about 30 years old at the time and looked like this. Okay. Well, they found out that soon afterwards he got married, and then he had been married for about 43 years after that. 
He had a previous conviction of molesting a teenage girl in the late 1970s, plus numerous allegations that he had assaulted children just over the years. They followed the man around now in 2018, and they found a coffee cup that he disposed of. From that, they swabbed it, they got DNA, and they confirmed that it was his DNA left on her shoe. The 78-year-old man was arrested and charged with her murder. He denied it was him, Jody didn't know him, and he was convicted. And then he killed himself in prison. Jane seemed to confess to this murder numerous times over the years, but was never arrested. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Joyce McLean. Viewer discretion is advised. Joyce McLean grew up with her younger sister in East Millinocket, Maine. She was always a very happily bubbly girl, and she loved music. At the time of this story, Joyce McLean was a very popular high school student. She was 16 years old. She would be an honor student. She was on the cheer team. She had recently gotten her driver's license, and she was super excited about that. And even before her 17th birthday, she was already planning on, like, the colleges she wanted to go to. But sadly, that would never get to happen. At approximately 7.30 p.m. on August 8th, 1980, Joyce McLean would go for her nightly jog. Her usual route would take her around the high school, and then there was, I guess, this, like, softball field where she would do some laps around. At 7.45 p.m., a witness said they saw her turning the corner to go towards the softball field, and then Joyce McLean was never seen alive again. Within a couple of hours of her not returning home, her parents became very concerned, and so they reported her missing. A search began for the 16-year-old girl. Two days later, this gentleman here, Peter Lairley, who was a volunteer searching for her, in this recreation from Unsolved Mysteries, he discovered her body in the woods behind the school. 16-year-old Joyce McLean had been murdered, and she appeared to have been beaten to death. There were theories and rumors and gossip around the community about what happened to her. One theory states that this was there was a softball game going on that night that maybe some teenagers from that game tried to stop her as she was running and wanted to sexually assault her, but they got into a fight and then they killed her. There was also speculation that workers from the nearby paper mill and 300 employees there who were not members of the community, maybe they accosted her, but there was no proof of any of it. And so it quickly became a mystery about who did this. In 2008, her body was exhumed. And according to police, they got some evidence from the remains that would help point to her killer. In 2009, Scott Fournier was named a person of interest officially. Well, turns out he had been a person of interest the entire time. The night of the eventual murder, he had crashed his car and basically suffered a skull fracture. But this was right by where her body would later be found. Over the years, this man confessed to his priest, his mom, I think a stepdad, a co-worker. He told wildly different stories each time, but always confessed to killing her. But when always interviewed by police, he said he only knew who did it. He named names about the people who did it, but it wasn't him who did it. But police would interview all the people he would accuse, but they were always able to rule them out completely. But for some reason, he was never arrested, despite numerous confessions. In the early portions of this investigation, police even got tips that witnesses saw Philip Fournier running away from this area where her body was found on the night she would have been murdered. And this would have been at the time he had crashed this stolen gas truck he stole and then later went to the hospital with uh, basically a minor skull fracture. When he had confessed to one of his uh, co-workers many years down the road, the co-worker asked him, well, how did you get away with it if you've been confessing? And Philip basically told him, like, it's because I kept telling police that I knew who did it. It was other people who did it. It wasn't me. And I kept distracting them. <laughs> but in some of these confessions, he actually said information that only the killer would have known. One of those pieces of information was that she was on her period when she was killed. And there was also, like, a piece of evidence found next to her body that was not uh, told to the public. But he knew about that piece of evidence. But he was never arrested. And then finally they exhumed her body in 2009 and they got some kind of evidence from her that would help link to him. He still wasn't arrested until 2016. And then he wouldn't go on trial until January of 2018. His defense tried to say, well, he got into a really bad accident that night. He had a skull fracture. And so all of these confessions he kept giving were, were not real. Obviously his, mind, his brain was just in a state of craziness so you can't take those confessions seriously but they happened over the course of many many years not like the day of his concussion and head injury they even brought up medical experts to state that this, the type of injury he suffered from during that crash he would have been fully recovered within a very short time and so all the confessions he made well after that they were real they were they were actual confessions 
The defense tried to say, well, what about all these people he kept accusing? Well, police looked into them many, many times and always ruled them out. At one point, they tried to blame the guy who found the body. Uh, <laughs> but finally, on February 22nd, 2018, he was found guilty of the murder and he was sentenced to 45 years in prison. I believe he was 55, 56 years old when this happened, so he'll be basically it's a life sentence for him. It only took police three decades to finally, I guess, believe his confessions. I, I don't, I don't understand it. I don't know. And by the way, she wasn't sexually assaulted, and so they don't even really know what the motive was. Maybe this was an attempt to sexually assault her, but she fought back, and so he hit her numerous times, killing her. But <sighs> took decades, three decades. And finally, Joyce McLean got the justice she rightfully deserved. Oh. Okay. That is frightening. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Julie Paterson. Viewer discretion is advised. At the time of this case, 32-year-old Julie Paterson was a mother to four children, and she was living in Darlington in County Durham in England. Julie had recently been going through a bout of depression. She had lost three of her kids in a custody battle recently, and she unfortunately kind of fell on hard times, and she took to, you know, alcohol and whatnot. She was a good mom, and she did her best for her kids, but, you know, she fell in hard times, which unfortunately just happens sometimes. In April of 1998, Julie Paterson had, I guess, gone out to a local pub where she was having a few drinks, and she, at some point at the pub or at a park near the pub, she met a man named David Harker. According to him, he ended up bringing her back to his flat where they had, according to him, consensual sexual intercourse. But that was not David's goal that night. David had this desire to become one of Britain's most notorious serial killers. And apparently he was going to start with Julie. So that evening he took her tights and he strangled her to death with them. David would then basically dismember her body. He put parts of her body in a trash bag and then dumped them in a nearby trash bin. But he took part of her leg, her thigh, he cut it up into pieces removed the flesh, cooked it, and then he added her cooked body to his macaroni and cheese. Several days later, portions of her body was found, but not all of her body. And then that kind of began the investigation. Oh, God. And through tips from several witnesses, many people would state that David Harker was the last person to be seen with Julie. And this is all coinciding with around the time that her portions of her body were found. David Harker, who would refer to himself as the devil man, who had the words subhuman and disorder tattooed on his scalp. Well, he was promptly arrested because they had also gotten a warrant to search his premises and they found Julie's blood there. At first, he denied having anything to do with it. But then it sounds like he would end up just basically confessing basically stating he planned to become one of the most notorious serial killers. He actually claimed he killed a whole bunch of people, but there was never any proof to validate any of that. He was observed by numerous specialists, and he was basically, he deemed fit all of the characteristics of a psychopath. He was obsessed with serial killers, and he was just an all-around very mentally unstable person. So he would end up pleading guilty to manslaughter on the grounds of diminished capacity, almost like pleading insanity. He was sentenced to life in prison where he could get paroled after just 14 years. If stabbing people is wrong, I don't want to be right. Six hours later, he would stab someone to death. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Kaylin Blue. Viewer discretion is advised. At the time of this case, 33-year-old Kaylin Blue was living with her boyfriend, Philip Schwab, in I think his mother's house in Idaho Falls, Idaho. Both of them, from what I understand, had minor mental disabilities, which prevented them from living on their own. At the time of this case, the two of them had been dating for about seven years. Kaylin was reported missing by her friends and family on June 24th, 2019. She had failed to show up to her job, and she was not responding to anyone's calls or texts. Police would find out that on the night of June 22nd at 6.24 p.m., her boyfriend, Philip, posted on Facebook, if stabbing people is wrong, I don't want to be right. Shortly before that, he also posted, dead is better. June 23rd, he posts, she deserved quicker. 
June 23rd. I like drawing it out June 23rd, and I'm only using my hands. Good thing I have a get out of jail free card. Yeah, you're next, dad. Kaylin had posted to her Facebook page, wow, what a day, glad to be home, and now I'm staying home the rest of the night. And that's the last time anyone had heard from her. And you can see people saying, have you heard from Kaylin? Police go to the home that she shares with her boyfriend. Philip greets them and they notice there's blood in the house and he takes them to his backyard. In the backyard, they find a shallow grave with someone, a person, partially sticking out of it. It was Kaylin Blue. She had been murdered and she was stabbed many times, primarily in her neck. They also found in the garage two dogs that had been stabbed to death. In the time between when Kaylin was last heard from and when he was finally arrested, he had posted hundreds of very violent posts to Facebook. And obviously that made many people worried and that's why Kaylin was also reported missing. When he was arrested, he basically confessed to killing her. And the reason why is absolutely insane. Six hours after posting that if stabbing someone is wrong, I don't want to be right. While sleeping in bed, Kaylin rolled over and accidentally hit him. And so he responded by getting a knife and stabbing her in the neck. He then says she gets up and runs and he chases after her and stabs her more. He stabbed her in the bathroom. She got to the hallway. He stabbed her in the hallway until she finally stopped moving. Then he buried her body in the backyard. He was charged with first degree murder. He had an IQ of 76 and he suffers from DeGeorge syndrome, but he was determined competent to stand trial but they would not seek the death penalty due to his condition. He was found guilty and sentenced to 25 years to life. Kalen got justice, but why on earth did this have to happen? A horrific hit and run is still unsolved after 10 years. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Kelly Boyce Hurlbert. Viewer discretion is advised. At the time of this story, Kelly was a 29-year-old woman who was married to a man named Paul and she was working at the North Peak Brewing Company in Traverse City, Michigan. And Paul played in a band, and he sometimes played at the restaurant where she worked. And it was the weekend of July 4th, 2013. Kelly was working the late shift that night, and then Paul was down playing with his band. When she finished her shift, she went and watched her husband play for a little bit. And the two of them had basically both ridden their bikes to the bar. Sometime just before two o'clock in the morning, Kelly would get on her bike and she would begin to bike home. Paul was taking some extra time because he had to pack up his you know, gear. Not too soon afterwards, here at this intersection on Washington Street, witnesses would recall hearing a, a crashing noise followed by a lot of screaming. When the witnesses would look out the window, they see a what they thought was like a black SUV kind of turning a corner. And then there was a, some, a person lying in the road. That person was Kelly Boyce Hurlbert. She had been struck by a car, thrown off her bike, and then she was dragged for at least two blocks down the road, stuck under this car. An ambulance was called. Kelly was rushed to the hospital, but it was already too late. She was pronounced deceased. The person who hit her sped off and they have never come forward. Police, based on witness accounts, and I think some evidence found at the crime scene, believe that this was done by a dark-colored SUV or possibly a pickup truck. And unfortunately, they really don't have much more to go on. This happened over 10 years ago, and they still have not arrested anyone. They don't have a person of interest. They don't have a suspect. They are depending on someone to come forward with information. They placed a bike near the area where Kelly was hit, basically telling, you know, people who ride their bikes just to please be careful because you never know what lunatics are out there. This was probably, I can't say for sure, but probably a drunk driving situation. This was the 4th of July weekend, but someone struck and killed Kelly and dragged her under their car for around two blocks, dragging her on the pavement. Somebody has to know something. Somebody's car was damaged and someone had to have recognized it. You could report your information anonymously. You don't have to say who you are. You just have to say what you know. If you have any information about the murder of Kelly Boyce Hurlbert, please call 231-995-5150. Help get Kelly justice.
Since 1988, this case has baffled residences of Edmore, North Dakota, and to this day it remains an unsolved mystery. This is the case of Kenneth Engie. Viewer discretion is advised. This is a very rare situation where I do not have a photo of the victim. Even Unsolved Mysteries did not have a photo of him. It was October 4th, 1988 at approximately 3.30 p.m. Authorities in Edmore, North Dakota were alerted that there was a man dead in his garage. When police arrived, they confirmed that 27-year-old auto mechanic Kenneth Engie was deceased. This is a recreation from Unsolved Mysteries, but Kenneth was lying in this position. And almost right away, the police said that this was a suicide from carbon monoxide poisoning because Kenneth must have left the car running to inhale the fumes, which caused his death. There were some weird things, though. He had a rifle six feet away from where he was lying down. It was loaded. Close to his body was a small pool of blood, but no apparent injuries to his body. If this was carbon monoxide poisoning that he had left his car running to inhale the fumes, well, the gas tank was 100% full. The keys were in the ignition, but the truck had been turned off. So then if this was intentional, why would he bother turning off the vehicle and how did he do that? Why did he get out of the vehicle and walk towards the door? The police have no explanations really for that. They have no explanation for why the rifle was there. They have no explanation for the pool of blood. That blood was never tested or run against anyone and that blood no longer exists. Well, they learned that the night prior, he had gone into a fight with a man named Curtis Heck, another auto mechanic in the area. They got into a fight at a bar because of a barmaid that they were both hitting on. Kenneth asked her to come home with him, but she said no because she was going home with Curtis. Kenneth leaves the bar, but then before he leaves, he runs, he backs into Curtis's vehicle, causing some damage. Afterwards, according to Curtis Heck, he gets into the truck with the barmaid. They then go to Kenneth's house, where uh, Curtis begins to kick Kenneth's truck. He hears the sounds of moaning and groaning coming from the garage, so he goes into the door. Curtis claims he actually sees Kenneth lying in this position on the floor. He says, ah, I, was just, I just thought he was just asleep or he was just too drunk, and so, you know, I left him there. But Curtis says he did not do anything physical to him. There was no other fight that took place in the garage. Kenneth's family believes that Curtis did something to him. Because again, that pool of blood is and has always been unexplained. Why did Kenneth have his rifle out? And Kenneth is a trained auto mechanic. He knows all about how this all works. He knows that carbon monoxide is lethal. Because police are now stating that this was probably just an accident. It could not have been suicide because he turned the car off, right? So was he trying to end his own life, but then decided halfway through, no, I'm not going to do this, and turned off the car and begun to walk towards the door, but collapsed? Was he that intoxicated that he just, he, did, he wasn't able to discern what was happening? According to Curtis Heck, when he did walk into the garage, he didn't see any smoke and he didn't smell anything unusual. And he admits, I really should have done something. I should have maybe helped him because he was alive and groaning on the ground. But he said he closed the door and then just left. The foul play theory, though, also doesn't really make much sense. Kenneth had no visible injuries to his body that would have created blood. The blood is just flat out unexplained. He could have been holding the rifle maybe to stabilize himself, perhaps, maybe, and it just fell as he was stumbling towards the door. But I don't know what, you know, the, the bartender who was in his truck at that time, I don't know if she said anything about how long he was in the garage for or not. But the car was turned off. So was there enough fumes and whatnot in the garage built up when Curtis got there and saw Kenneth on the ground that he then decided to turn the car off and then leave and close the garage door, knowing full well what would have happened to Kenneth? It seems kind of far-fetched to me as well. This whole thing is just bizarre. Police have stated without a shadow of a doubt that this case is closed. It's done. It's over. They have ruled this an accidental death. The suicide thing it just didn't make... It was not logical enough. But then how does an auto mechanic accidentally do this? But there's also not enough evidence to show any kind of like cold-blooded murder happened. What happened to Kenneth Angie in that garage? He died. But what were the circumstances? Well, the residences of Edmore, North Dakota, for the longest time, have been baffled by it. None of it makes any real sense. But something caused his death. 
I think the autopsy showed that he did in fact die of carbon monoxide poisoning. It's just a matter of how that occurred. Did he do it to himself intentionally, on accident, or did someone do it to him? Well, unfortunately, to this day, it is still an unsolved mystery. And this may be one of those mysteries that remains cold forever. Where from? Then I saw the black shoe. Oh, black oh hey, hey, hey! Your boobs jiggled like mine. You need a diaper change. Wow. Uh, hello, true primers. This is the case of Christine Fitzhugh. Viewer discretion is advised. At the time of this case, Christine Fitzhugh is a wonderful mother to three children, and they are living in Palo Alto, California. And she is married to Ken Fitzhugh. Ken was a very successful real estate agent, and Christine was a music teacher. Ken and Christine lived here in this beautiful home. On May 5th, 2000, Ken would receive a phone call while he was at work. The call came from the school that Christine taught at. She did not show up to work that morning. So Ken, who could be played by Steve Martin, he immediately gets into his car and he drives home. He enters the home and when he gets to the basement door, he looks down the stairs and he finds his wife. Christine's body was found not here at the bottom of the stairs, but to the side of the staircase. One of her shoes was in a pool of blood. The other shoe was sitting on the stairs. There was a lot of blood on this metal bell and they believed at first that she fell down the stairs and struck her head on this. But Christine at the autopsy had numerous wounds to her head. Individual wounds, like that came from a beating or blunt force trauma. Not from a single fall down a staircase. Sounds kind of similar to the Kathleen Peterson case. So they send people in and out of this house for days looking for evidence and collecting evidence. One of the investigators who's looking at this case really has this gut feeling that the crime scene, it looks staged. The shoes looked like they were deliberately placed in certain locations. Ken's shirt had blood on it, but some of it was actually blood spatter. They found some blood on his shoes. They searched his vehicle, which was parked just outside the crime scene. They found a towel, a paper towel with blood on it. But technically that adds up because he was consoling her when he found her. He's brought into the police station where he says this. I must have told her six times get rid of the black shoes and then she bought some red ones just like and she she get dressed and she'd say how do i look and i say well fine except i wouldn't wear those damn black shoes you're gonna fall mm. and then he gives this performance then i saw the black shoes the goddamn black shoes <laughs> Give the man an Oscar. It's quite a performance. His behavior seemed very suspicious. To add on to the staged look, where Christine's body was found, it kind of defied physics. If she fell down the stairs, how did she end up on the other side of this railing? The location of the blood didn't make sense. It all seemed odd. So their instinct was telling them that this was not an accidental fall down a staircase, that she was killed, murdered. Based off the coroner's results of the multiple skull injuries she had, she was beat to death. But the problem for them is there was no blood spatter on that staircase. Just the conveniently kind of located pools of blood underneath her. But there really wasn't like, if she had landed and smashed her head on the, on the, on the floor, there would have been spatter of blood, but there wasn't. So they figured she had to have died somewhere else in the house. Well, they found blood upstairs. They found blood on a chair in the kitchen. More blood on a chair in the kitchen. Right where Christine was likely sitting, having her lunch doing some work. They sprayed some areas of the house with luminol. They found signs of a blood cleanup in the kitchen. And shoe impressions. Blood that wasn't actually there when police arrived. This only came up with, you know, chemicals. The shoe impressions were an exact match to Ken's shoes. The bloody towel found in his car had Christine's blood, but he didn't leave the house to go back to the car after 911 was called. There were witnesses. Well, what is his motive? Her older son graduates from college in a couple weeks. She wanted to be there for that too. It's really a sad time. You said her older son is in that your son? No, he's our son. Yeah, Ken just made a big oops because he only had two children with Christine. But apparently he thought he had three kids with her. 
This son here in the back, well, turns out he had a different father. Christine had an affair many, many years prior with this man, and he was that boy's father. But Ken was trying to swear up and down he had no idea, but he made that boo-boo in that interrogation. He may have just recently found out that he wasn't the father, and this was what caused him to do this. They also discovered there was a lot of financial issues in the house. Ken had been committing fraud, and they were almost broke, almost poor. Despite him continuing to spend money they didn't have. Based on the physical evidence and the fact that he may have been really pissed off about finding out one of the children wasn't his, and that the father of that child was someone he actually considered a really good friend, not to mention all the financial issues, that was enough for police, and he was arrested and charged with the murder of Christine. He goes on trial, and he is found guilty of her murder. He's convicted of second-degree murder. I guess they didn't prove it was premeditated enough. He got 15 years to life. He would only serve two. He was released under compassionate ground laws because he had been diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. Ken Fitzhugh died of the disease just a short time after he was released from prison. A family was found slain inside their home and the authorities still have no idea who did it. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of the Curia family. Viewer discretion is advised. Jane Curia and her children were originally from Kenya in Africa, but they would end up moving to Georgia in the United States in 2001 after Jane's husband passed away. They found themselves a beautiful home in the Powder Springs suburbs of Atlanta, Georgia. By 2007, Jane was working at a nursing home, a job she loved very much. Her 19-year-old daughter, Isabella, was in college. 16-year-old Annabelle was still in high school. And 7-year-old Jeremy was in elementary school. This was described as a really, really good family. Jane was generous. She was always smiling. She was the perfect mom. She was doing her absolute best to give her kids the best she could give them in a completely different country. And she was doing really well. On July 29th, 2007, one of their cousins was visiting from Kenya. His name was Peter. And he was staying with the Kurias on that particular day while his mom was out doing other things. By July 30th, the following day, Peter's mom couldn't reach the household. I believe the plan was that Peter was going to be staying there just over the weekend. By July 31st, when she still couldn't get a hold of anyone, she finally went there with another family member. The front door was locked, so the other family member went around the back and opened the door, and it was a nightmare. Jane, Isabella, and Annabelle were all brutally murdered. They were bludgeoned to death, and there was blood everywhere. Jeremy and his cousin Peter were thankfully still alive, but they had both been bludgeoned as well. Both of them were in comas for a couple of weeks. When they finally came to, they had absolutely no recollection of who did this, when, why. Nothing appeared to have been stolen from the house. None of the women were sexually assaulted. It appeared obvious that Jane was the primary target, and then the others were just killed because they were there. They go through Jane's phone record, and they find that she was in constant contact with a man named Patrick. I guess a friend she met at church. Patrick was seen hanging out with the family on the day that Peter was dropped off. They spoke multiple times a day over the course of two months, but then suddenly, on the night that they would have presumably been murdered, the phone calls he made to her stopped. He never called her again. Patrick told police that Jane told him that the Kenyan Mafia had killed her husband. And so maybe they came here to silence her. Except when police looked into it, her husband died of pneumonia. Clearly, Patrick was trying to throw them off. Apparently, he had borrowed $5,000 from Jane uh, a few months prior to this. But there was no indications that she was, like, pressuring him to pay it back. I believe he's a person of interest, but not officially labeled a suspect. Because I guess they have no evidence. It's been nearly 17 years, and it's still unsolved. The two surviving victims, they now live in constant fear of, is someone going to come back and finish the job? Jeremy, by the way, ended up getting adopted by a woman named Elizabeth who went to church with the family. She was not a direct family member, but Elizabeth somehow managed to weasel her way into the family to adopt Jeremy. Jane and her two daughters, their bodies were brought back to Kenya to be buried there. But Elizabeth began to just sell everything from Jane's home. Elizabeth and Patrick knew each other, but the police can't find any other link between the two of them. This Elizabeth person has this vague title of, like, person of interest, maybe. 
because of how she integrated herself so almost forcefully to get custody of Jeremy. One other thing to note was that Jane was currently trying to get asylum. And this had to do with, I guess, Jane's very public opposition to female genital mutilation there in Kenya. But I guess that asylum was denied shortly before the murders. Jane told, I guess, the immigration lawyer that if we go back to Kenya, if we're forced to go back, our lives are in danger. So she appealed the decision for this asylum being turned down and then her family was killed. So you have these kind of three sort of maybe persons of interest slash motives, maybe, but also not really. It could be that Patrick guy, could be Elizabeth, could have been the two of them working together, could have been none of them. Who wanted to kill Jane? Did they come to the, to the States to do it, to finish it? They don't have the answers, unfortunately. So if you have information with regards to the Curia family murders, please contact the authorities in the Atlanta, Georgia area. You can remain anonymous. You do not have to say who you are. You just have to say what you know. They deserve justice. They should get justice. If you can help provide that, please do so. Were their murders connected or just a tragic coincidence? Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Laura and Tammy. Viewer discretion is advised. Both of these cases occurred in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, where 23-year-old Laura Kempton was an aspiring model. Laura was last seen alive on September 27, 1981. She had gone to a place called the Ranger Club, then she met up with some friends. She was seen leaving a restaurant on Hanover Street and walking towards her home, which was just a three-minute walk. The following morning, police would go to her apartment because she had some unpaid parking tickets. Something apparently stood out to them that they needed to enter the apartment. And when they did, they would discover the body of Laura Kempton. Laura had been bludgeoned to death over her head. They believe the murder weapon was this beer bottle. It appeared as if someone had broke into her home and then just viciously attacked her. There was DNA left behind, but being back in 1981, there really wasn't much they can do with it, but they did store it. A year later, it seemed to happen all over again. It was October 19th, 1982. Another aspiring model, 20-year-old Tammy Little, well, her mom hadn't heard from her in several days. So she goes to Tammy's apartment and she finds that her daughter is dead. Tammy Little had also been struck over the head with some kind of blunt force instrument. Her home also appeared to have been forcefully broken into. Laura Kempton and Tammy Little did not know each other as far as people knew. They weren't friends. However, both women did attend the Portsmouth Beauty School and they were actually attending the school at one point at the same time. So there is a chance that the two girls knew of each other or vaguely knew each other, but there was no indication that they were actually friends or anything. I do not know if there was any DNA evidence collected from Tammy Little's murder scene, but they would still connect the two cases for like the longest time. They were both around the same age. They were both aspiring models. They both attended the same beauty school. They were both from the same area. They were both found in their apartments alone, bludgeoned to death. Both of their homes were broken into. There were rumors of a local lunatic who was doing this. Well, yeah, no shit. But both of their cases just went cold. They had no tips, they had no leads, they had no suspects, they had nothing. In July of 2023, police announced they had a suspect in the murder of Laura Kempton. With a DNA profile using genetic genealogy, they were able to determine that Laura Kempton's killer was this man, Ronnie James Lee. However, he would never face justice for what he did to Laura. In 2005, he died of an overdose. Therefore, they will never know his motives. They will never know why. But then with Tammy Little, there apparently is no DNA match or they don't have DNA. There is a chance they may be connected, but it's also a possibility that they are completely unrelated. If you have information, please contact the Portsmouth, New Hampshire Police Department. A body was found floating in Turnbull Creek on September 8th, 2002, and it was obvious that this was a murder. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Leanne Mangrum. Viewer discretion is advised. Turnbull Creek is located in Dixon County, which is in Tennessee. On that September 2002 day, a fisherman discovered the body floating in the water next to a partially submerged car. When they pulled the body from the water, it was more than obvious that she had been beaten. However, the coroner would ultimately rule that she died from drowning, so she was alive after the beating and thrown in the water. She would soon be identified as 34-year-old mother Leanne Mangrum. 
Police would interview people in her life, including her ex-husband, Terry Mangrum Sr., who was now married to a woman named Kimberly Mangrum. And Kimberly had become the evil stepmom, essentially, to Terry and Leanne's children. Well, when interviewed, they said that Leanne had come to their house the night before she was eventually found, and she was there with some man named Bob. They said that Leanne was drunk, and that Leanne forced Kimberly to give her some medication like Clonopin. When they search Leanne's trailer, they find blood. They found a cigarette butt. She didn't smoke. There was broken glass, which they were able to pull fingerprints from. Several people would say that the story that Terry and Kimberly gave was not true. Who was this Bob guy? Nobody even knew who it was. And then suddenly, a year later, there are three people charged with her murder. Terry Mangrum Sr., Kimberly Mangrum, and Leanne's own son, Terry Mangrum Jr. Terry Jr. was 16 at the time of the murder. I don't know when this photo was taken. It was Terry Jr.'s DNA that matched the blood found in the trailer that Leanne lived in. The fingerprints found on the broken glass, also his. When Kimberly Mangrum is brought in after this charge, she then said, well, okay, I had been at Leanne's house that night and you might find my DNA possibly on a cigarette. And they do take her DNA and lo and behold, it matched the cigarettes found at the crime scene. But she was, it was just a harmless visit to Leanne. They interview Terry Jr. This is him more close to now. And he flat out confesses to everything. Leanne Smith, who would eventually become Leanne Mangrum, was born on November 19th, 1967. Eventually, she met Terry Mangrum Sr. They got married and had two kids together. But their relationship was not great, and eventually it ended in divorce. Terry ends up marrying a new woman, Kimberly. Then at that point, Leanne ends up having a really rocky relationship with Terry Sr. and especially Kimberly. Kimberly clearly hated Leanne. Kimberly also treated her children like dog shit. She was physically and emotionally abusive to Leanne's two children. Kimberly threatened to kill Leanne on a couple of occasions. It's kind of wild that it took a year to find all of this out. But what happened that night? On September 7, 2002, Kimberly finally decides she's had enough of Leanne. Terry Sr. is asleep at home. So Kimberly takes the kids and puts the kids in the car and then drives to Leanne's place. They had gotten to Leanne's home shortly after Leanne pulled into the driveway. Kimberly gets out with a baseball bat and smashes one of her car windows. Leanne tries to drive away, but she's blocked. As Leanne gets out of her car, Kimberly begins to beat her with the baseball bat. Then, as Leanne's on the ground, she tries to force Terry Jr. to continue beating her, his mom with the bat. At first, she says no. But then Kimberly threatens to beat him with the bat if he doesn't, and so he does. Kimberly, along with then 16-year-old Terry Jr., they load Leanne, who is unconscious now, into her own vehicle, and they drive her car along with the other vehicle to Turnbull Creek. Kimberly then shoves an entire bottle of pills down Leanne's throat. Then she forces Terry Jr. to drown his own mother. She threatens to seriously harm him or possibly kill him if he did not comply. And so he did. He forced his own mother's head into the water and killed her. Now, Terry Sr. had no involvement in the physical murder or of hiding the body. However, he did find out about it afterwards and he destroyed the bat and hid other evidence. So he became just as culpable as the rest of them. When they were initially charged, Kimberly basically escaped and she was on the run and she became one of TBI's top 10 most wanted. But eventually they found her. Terry Jr., who cooperated with police, would end up taking a guilty plea to second-degree murder, and he would end up serving eight years in prison and was released. Terry Sr. would end up pleading guilty to accessory after the fact. They ended up dropping any and all, like, murder charges against him. But I'm having a hell of a time finding what he was actually sentenced to. Kimberly, on the other hand, was sentenced to life in prison, plus 25 years, plus an additional six years for, like, aggravated robbery and assault. She will first be eligible for parole when she is a crisp 94 years old. She's good old-fashioned cuckoo could you wackadoo material. Do you all think that Terry Jr. was sentenced appropriately, or should he have gotten more? Should he have gotten less? I guess it really just depends on whether or not you believe his story. But based on other witnesses in terms of Kimberly's behavior, it all kind of seems to check out. And here she is, Kimberly, still rotting in a prison cell. Womp womp.
If you don't like your marriage, I just want to remind you that divorce is a less deadly option. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Mario Scramuza. Viewer discretion is advised. At the time of this case, Mario Scramuza was a 48-year-old man living in Covington, Louisiana. He was living with his wife, Gina, who worked as an x-ray technician. A few years after they got married, they ended up having a son, and they seemed like a happy family. Mario worked as a paramedic, and he was described as being kind of a timid guy, a little shy, which was pretty opposite from his wife. But he loved being a dad. He was a wonderful father. And he did his best to provide his wife Gina with whatever she may have needed. Gina is described as being very materialistic. Someone who needs money, money, money. She insisted that at their wedding, they gave each other very expensive gifts. Down the road, Gina would take out several credit cards without Mario knowing. She spent lavishly. Then she started having an affair with a man named Carlos Rodriguez. She bought Carlos a car. She lavished him with very expensive gifts, all underneath the nose of her loving husband. Well, Gina was now just tired of the, the marriage. And so she got a divorce, right? No. She hired Carlos, and then Carlos hired Luis Rodriguez Hernandez and early Montoya Matut. Those two men didn't speak a word of English, and it sounds like the two of them were taken advantage of and lied to. Essentially, Gina's plan was to have Carlos and the two men go into the house, ransack it, and, you know, make it look like a robbery. The other two men believed that this was just a robbery, but they waited in the house for Mario to get home. They then ambushed Mario. Carlos beat him and strangled him and tied him up, then took a zip tie around his throat and strangled him again until he was dead. Gina ends up getting a call from a neighbor to say it looks like something happened in their house. I guess she was at work. So she rushed home and she found the body that she knew was going to be there. She actually was told by Carlos that he accidentally left fingerprints on a beer bottle. So she goes there, she wipes off the beer bottle and throws it away. Then she fakes this call to 911. Police question her and they found out about Carlos Rodriguez. They told her, did you know that Carlos Rodriguez is married with a child? And that pissed her off. She then openly admitted to paying the men to go into the house and rob it. However, she says, I didn't know they were gonna commit murder until they found out that she had gone there, wiped off fingerprints to hide Carlos ever being in the house. So she was charged with first degree murder. And she was convicted. She got life in prison without parole. Wah, wah. Carlos Rodriguez and Luis Rodriguez Hernandez both got life in prison without parole as well. Early Montoya, he pled guilty to manslaughter and got 35 years in prison. Divorce is way easier. Did a torrid affair cause this man to commit murder? Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Melvin Snyder. Viewer discretion is advised. This particular case happened in Greencastle, Pennsylvania, and we're going back to 1985. Melvin Elwood Snyder was a married 42-year-old man, and on May 25th, 1985, Melvin would be seen for the last time. Two days later, on May 27th, 1985, his truck is found all the way in Maryland. In the truck are his wallet, his checkbook, and the keys are in the ignition. There was also a loaded rifle in the back of the truck, but Melvin was nowhere to be found. Police dusted the truck for fingerprints, but they got nothing whatsoever, which was kind of strange. It appeared that someone had wiped the entire truck clean. It would also be that same day his truck was found that his wife, Joan, reported him missing. Gee, isn't that great timing? She made it sound like he had packed a suitcase full of clothing and then just, I guess, went somewhere but police found out that he had $4,000 in his checking account that hadn't been touched. Around this same time, he was supposed to be claiming his pension from his, I guess, recent employer, but he never went to claim it. He had scheduled a dental appointment for July, but he never showed up. Police couldn't find any evidence that this man was trying to leave on his own, and so they believed that he may have met with foul play. That's when police found out about this man, Ronald Harshman, Police would learn from questioning that his wife, Teresa, had an affair with Melvin. The affair occurred back in 1984. Allegedly, when Ronald found out about this, he made threats towards Melvin, and then he rammed his car twice. He also took a gun one day and fired two shots towards Melvin, but missed. This had happened, you know, like a year before he went missing. 
he had reconciled allegedly with his wife, Joan, but Ronald Harshman's wife, Teresa, would divorce Ronald about four months after he found out about the affair. By 1990, he's still not found. Joan files for divorce. By 1993, she has him declared legally dead. And then in 2001, Ronald Harshman was charged with the murder of Melvin Snyder. They had some forensic evidence, yet still no body, plus a whole bunch of witness statements, including from a couple of inmates. Melvin's wife, Joan, was then also charged as a co-defendant. They found out that she basically participated in this. She would tell police that she told Ronald exactly where Melvin would be the morning he, would, he disappeared. Charges were then dropped against Joan because it appeared that she had been doing this against her will. He ends up getting convicted of the murder. The inmates who testified against him, they all recanted their statements. And so a judge overturned his conviction. A new trial was ordered. In 2019, he pleads no contest to third degree murder. He then got 20 years and I believe he is still in prison. It took 32 years and DNA technology to make this no longer an unsolved mystery. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Michelle Welch. Viewer discretion is advised. Michelle was born on June 7th, 1973 in Georgia. She was one of three kids. She was the oldest. At the time of this case, the family was then living in Tacoma, Washington. Michelle's younger sisters would later say that they looked up to their sister. She was a big inspiration and she was the best sister a person could ask for. Michelle took really good care of her sisters. And this was just your normal American family. But that normalcy would be destroyed one day in 1986. It was March 26, 1986, at about 10 o'clock in the morning. 12-year-old Michelle would end up taking her two young sisters to the nearby park, Puget Park. At around 11 o'clock in the morning, she would get on her bike and ride back to her house, which was just right down the street. She went there, she made lunch for her two sisters, and then she came right back. But when she got there, her two sisters, she couldn't find them. That's because her sisters had gone to use the restroom at a business that was just across the street. So Michelle goes looking for them and then they end up getting back and then now they're looking for Michelle. They would end up finding the sandwiches that she made and her bike, but Michelle was nowhere to be found. So the girls rush home and the mother is notified and so they call police and she's reported missing immediately. Police were told that witnesses saw a man under this bridge, which was at the park. I guess it's called Proctor Bridge. I guess this man was seen looking at the three girls. And so police put out feelers to see if they could find this man while they're still looking for Michelle. Unfortunately, at 11.30 p.m. that night, two search dogs would lead police with scent directly to the body of 12-year-old Michelle Welch. She had been found in a gulch, which was near that bridge. Michelle had been sexually assaulted and her throat had been cut. Other witnesses would come forward to state that they saw a man talking to Michelle just before she would have gone missing. That man was pointing towards the gulch she was later found in. Like he was talking to her pointing towards the gulch. So they believe this is a man who lured her away and killed her. Unbelievably, there were other murders that had happened to young girls in that same area around the same time. And there was a time when those murders were connected all together thinking this was all done by the same person, but eventually they would find out with DNA they were not. These three particular young girls were killed by three different men. But unfortunately, Michelle's case went cold pretty quickly. It would not be until 2018 when they finally got the answer. DNA was left behind on Michelle and they had stored that. So using forensic genealogy, they first came up with this composite of the suspect. And then through a genetic family tree, the DNA belonged to a man named Gary Hartman. He was never a suspect back then. So he was arrested and charged with her murder. He was a total stranger. The 66-year-old man got 26 years. Just down this road, a massacre occurred. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of the Moccasin Gap Road murders. Viewer discretion is advised. In the early morning hours of October 26, 2016, police in Jackson, Georgia were called to this house just down Moccasin Gap Road. Inside the home was a nightmare. The house was riddled with bullets and there were three people confirmed dead at the scene. A fourth individual had been shot and was rushed to the nearest hospital. Sadly, just a couple of days later, the fourth person would die. The victims were 29-year-old Keith Gibson, 18-year-old Matthew Hicks, 20-year-old Sophia Bullard, and 20-year-old Destiny Olinger. Destiny had actually been house-sitting at that house that night. The family was out of town. 
there were, I believe, at least one or two other people in the house that survived. Through their investigation, two names came up pretty quickly. Jacob Kosky and Matthew Baker Jr. They were able to piece together that these two had attended a bonfire at that house, I guess the night prior to the bodies being found. The two men then left the house and then came back sometime shortly afterwards, this time armed with guns, and apparently those guns had been stolen. And Jacob Kosky, he opened fire on everyone there at the bonfire. He was the one who pulled the trigger. He shot all four of these victims in the head. So at this point, police are trying to find these two. But police also get the names of these three people. Brooke Knight, Jacob Williams, Kayla Head. Apparently, these three had knowledge of the crimes after the fact, or some type of direct involvement. Matthew Baker was soon arrested during a traffic stop, and Jacob Kosky would end up calling 911 to turn himself in. And that's exactly what happened. He turned himself in, and he told police where to find the gun. He had tossed it in a nearby body of water. They recovered the gun. Jacob Kosky, it turns out, had been suffering some pretty serious mental health issues. Twelve days before the murder, he was discharged from a mental health institution, despite still being very mentally unwell, and said he was hearing voices in his head telling him to do things. Something happened in their system, and he was just let go. And then he did this. What was his motive for killing these four people? It's not known. They said there was no arguments between him and the victims beforehand. He barely even knew them. Everything was going fine. Then he came back and just shot everyone. They have absolutely no idea why he did it. But he ends up pleading guilty and he is sentenced to multiple life sentences without parole. Matthew Baker Jr., who did not fire a single round, well, he's pleading not guilty because technically he didn't kill anyone. However, they've already told him, we are going for the death penalty for you. Koski didn't get the death penalty, but he that's what they're going for with him. The guy who didn't pull the trigger. Yes, the black individual. There are a lot of people who believe that there is some serious racial bias going on. To be fair, he did, from what I understand, help provide the gun, allegedly. And also, allegedly, he was holding a gun during the actual murders, but did not shoot anyone. Again, these are just allegations, because he has yet to go to trial. It is 2024. The murders happened in 2016. He's been sitting in a prison cell awaiting his death penalty trial for murders he didn't technically commit. He has admitted that he was there and he saw what happened. And yeah, there should be punishment for the involvement he did have. But to say, we're going for the death penalty for you, knowing you didn't pull the trigger, the guy who did pull the trigger, we allowed him to plead guilty and not get the death penalty. Make that make any kind of sense. I'm not defending the dude's actions, or in this case, I guess, inactions, but come on, the death penalty? That could be considered a little extreme. There is no physical evidence, no DNA or fingerprints or anything that actually connects him to the crime in terms of like the murder weapon itself. But they are going slow as molasses and even going to trial with him. The real issue here is why on earth was this man even allowed to do this? Why was he out? Why did our mental health system fail yet another person, which in turn failed for other people, his victims. Like, I am sick of hearing and covering stories with this same exact scenario. But at least he will never be able to hurt anyone ever again. Living cushy and sweet in his cell while the other guy who didn't kill anyone is awaiting a death sentence trial. What? In terms of these three, from what I have read, I think one or two of them had heard Jacob Kosky say that he wanted to kill people a couple of days prior to the shootings. And I guess they had obstructed some of the investigation. I know that two of them pled not guilty to their charges, but I don't know what the heck happened to them after. Like, I'm having a hard time finding the update to them. But if the friends knew that he was mentally unwell, he had said he was tr wanted to kill people, then you have the actual mental health care system who is basically saying, eh, he's fine, just get out, go away. Despite not being well mentally, <sighs> four people, four innocent people with their lives ahead of them. Could this have been prevented? Absolutely. Should it have been prevented? Absolutely. And I have absolutely no idea when this man is ever going to face a trial. But what I can tell you is that even the legal experts have stated that there is no physical evidence that qualifies him for the death penalty. 
so why are they still going for it? But because of Koski's sentence, at least these four victims got the justice they all rightfully deserved. Human remains were scattered all over the backyard, but somehow this is still unsolved. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Monica Rizzo. Viewer discretion is advised. At the time of this case, Monica Rizzo was a 44-year-old woman who was married to this man here, Leonard. They were living in San Antonio, Texas, and Monica was working a government job. It was the afternoon of May 5th, 1997. Monica's employer said that that day she just got up and left her desk, presumably to go to lunch. However, she left her purse behind and she never returned to work. He would call Monica's home repeatedly over the course of the next week, but never got an answer. But suddenly, a week later, he did get an answer. Monica answered the phone and said that she was not feeling very well and she would be back to work soon. But she never showed back up to work. It's unclear what the last time that anyone saw Monica alive, what that time was. But towards the end of May, Leonard said that she just up and left and he never reported her missing to police. On June 5th, 1997, police got an anonymous phone call stating that Monica Rizzo's remains were buried in her own backyard and that Leonard Rizzo had killed her. So police go to the home, they knock on the door. Monica's not there, but her car is. They are given permission to search the backyard and they do actually find animal bones, but that's all they found. So they assume the caller was just wrong or was a prank. The caller called back a couple of days later and insisted, check under a pile of tires. That is where they are. Lo and behold, they found a pile of tires and underneath were human remains. This is a recreation from Unsolved Mysteries. They brought in a team of archeologists to help look for more bones and they found them everywhere, just scattered underneath the dirt all over the backyard in these like tiny little one inch pieces. It appeared that the body had gone through a wood chipper. They even found bones from human hands inside the barbecue. At first, police said they assumed that the remains they found in the backyard were multiple people, but they really didn't know that for sure. Sometime later, they were able to take DNA from the bones they found and they finally discovered that they belonged to one person. The human bones found all over the backyard, every single one of them belonged to Monica Rizzo. Leonard Rizzo, despite finding all of those bones, says, I think she's still alive. In the house, they found several holes punched into the walls or maybe someone's head had gone through them. They found sections of walls that were basically painted with blood spatter. Leonard said he got so upset over what happened to her that he started just beating up the house. Right. Two years later, Leonard is arrested and charged with assault for beating up his girlfriend. And he was convicted of multiple charges, including assault and kidnapping. Police believe firmly that Leonard Rizzo killed Monica and buried her remains in the backyard after running her through something like a wood chipper or some sort of industrial chopping machine. Now, he did have a son at the house during all of this, but the son doesn't really know anything about what happened. They also found out who the anonymous caller was, and it was a friend to this family. Because if they, for a while, they were like, oh, maybe this guy who called had something to do with this. But the guy said, when they found out who it was, that he was over at the house and his dog, he brought his dog over with him. His dog came back to him with a human jawbone with teeth that were that looked a lot like Monica Rizzo's. And that's why he placed the anonymous phone call. That man was eventually completely ruled out of any wrongdoing. Despite having over 200 bone fragments found in the backyard that all matched Monica Rizzo, they unfortunately do not have any evidence, physical evidence, to arrest Leonard for her murder. I don't understand how. I mean, they found clearly the signs of a fight in the house with blood and punched holes. Her body is chopped up in their backyard. Two years after this, when he got when he was charged with assaulting his girlfriend, he told that girlfriend, I'm going to kill you, I'm going to chop you up, and I'm going to put you in a bag. Oddly enough, during the initial search where they found all the bones, they also found a bag buried with Monica Rizzo's flesh. Again, recreation. He swears up and down he had nothing to do with this murder. Okay, then, what? who did it then, bud? How did somebody kill her in their house that he shared with her and have the time to chop her up and bury her in the backyard? How is he not arrested for this? 
They also learned that in the months leading up to Monica's murder, her co-workers had called police to say that Monica appeared to have been beaten by her husband because she came to work with bruises. A cop went to their home and saw bruises on Monica, but she said, I'm fine, I fell, he's not touching me. Then she ends up dead. Why did she leave her work so abruptly that afternoon? That's also a mystery. It was very eerie how she just got up and left work, left her purse, and apparently went home for at least a few days because they talked to her on the phone. He must have been holding her hostage or something. Allegedly, according to the DA at the time, they said that Leonard said he would confess if he was just given a 10-year probational sentence. The courts were like, no. So he said, okay, I'm not confessing to anything. What more do they need? Seriously. It's, cl it's so clear. I don't get it. What is it, Texas? Is that what it is? Monica Rizzo deserves justice. Somebody has got to have information to help finally settle this. So if you do, please call the San Antonio Police Department. She was last seen in 1998, but it wouldn't be until 2009 when they finally had all the answers. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Nancy Daddiesman. Viewer discretion is advised. Nancy was born on May 7th, 1956 in Waterloo, New York. I really don't know a lot of information about her. All I really know is that at the time of this case in 1998, she had recently moved to Bowling Green, Kentucky. Nancy had just gotten over a really bitter divorce where she lost the custody of her five kids. On September 4th, 1998, the 42-year-old woman in Kentucky was supposed to be getting into her car to drive to Indiana to meet with a gentleman friend that she had been talking to, but her car broke down. According to witnesses later on, people would see Nancy on the side of the road essentially hitchhiking. She was wearing a pair of red jeans and this blouse. But after that evening, Nancy was never seen again. She was reported missing by family, but there really was not much to work on in terms of any clues or anything like that. Then on September 21st, 2000, in Barron County, Kentucky, on this hillside, there was, I guess, this little area that people had just dumped a bunch of crap in. But these two teenagers were walking along this hillside when they found this pile of garbage. But in it, they found bones. And it looked very much like human bones. Once police arrived, they actually also had a forensic anthropologist there with them to help identify the bones. One of the leg bones was still in a pair of red jeans. They also found what looked like a white blouse. About 15, 20 feet away, they found a human skull. Once the remains were brought back to the coroner's office, this anthropologist would look at them and there was a cut mark on at least one of these bones that would indicate that whoever this was was likely stabbed to death. But the anthropologist would confirm that this was likely the remains of a white female in her 40s. Once they started looking into missing persons reports, you know, they're plugging in certain pieces of information like age and race, when a person disappeared, clothing they were wearing. And it was through the clothing that they really found the person they think they have. And the name on that report was Nancy Daddiesman. Then they had something to work on, and I believe they would end up identifying her through dental records and confirmed that the remains found were that of Nancy. Police would look into the person she was supposed to be meeting, but they were able to very quickly rule that man out. And then the case just goes cold, and it wouldn't be until 2009 when they finally got an answer. A 35-year-old man who was already convicted of homicide named David Bell, well, he just up and confessed to killing Nancy Daddy's men. He also confessed to killing several other women, and he is a self-proclaimed serial killer. He said that he was high out of his mind and that particular evening, and he saw Nancy was hitchhiking. He confirmed many things, many aspects of like what she was wearing, some pieces of information about her. He said he just struck her over the head with a pipe, but it didn't kill her. She woke up within like a few minutes. She then tried to fight back, and that's when he took a knife and he began to stab her. He said he had stabbed her in certain places that were also confirmed with the stab or indicative of knife marks on the bones they found. They knew he was the guy. He claimed to murder his own mother back in 1991. In 2005, he murdered a woman named Claire Ellis. He picked her up as she was hitchhiking and then he struck her over the head with a wrench. 
The reason why he was caught for her murder was because he used her cell phone uh, repeatedly to call his own family. He then confessed to committing that murder, which is why he was in prison in 2009 when he confessed to killing Nancy Daddiesman. As far as I can tell, he was never actually tried for Nancy's murder. I don't know if he will at some point in the future. He's not eligible for parole for his other confirmed murder until 2037. So I don't know if they're just like waving it out or what the case is, but technically speaking, Nancy Daddiesman hasn't gotten justice. She was murdered and they know who killed her. They have the guy who said he did it and they have evidence to say that his story is true. I hope that one day Nancy gets the justice she rightfully deserves. An innocent child was just walking home, but unfortunately she would never get there. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Nancy Shoemaker. Viewer discretion is advised. At the time of this case, Nancy Shoemaker was just nine years old. I believe she had one sibling and she was living with her sibling and her parents in Wichita, Kansas. It was July 30th, 1990. Nancy was going to a convenience store to buy some like snacks. And this convenience store was literally just like a quick walk down the street from her home. She got there, she got the snacks she wanted, and then she was on her way back home. But she never made it home. Nancy was reported missing and the search for her began right away. The community gathered together. They were looking high and low for her, but they just could not find her. But on February 18th, 1991, her remains would be found. She was discovered off the beaten path in an area called Bell Plain. So they had to use dental records to confirm it was her. I'm not 100% sure how these men became a suspect, but a man named Doyle Lane became a suspect pretty soon after the body was found. When police were talking to him, they discovered he had a connection to a man named Donald Wacker. They were close friends. I'm guessing they must have noticed their vehicle in the area and that's why they were initially questioned. So as police are interviewing Doyle Lane, they're also interviewing Donald Wacker and Donald Wacker is saying things that makes it sound like he may have had some involvement in what happened to Nancy Shoemaker. On July 17th, 1991, as Donald Wacker is still being questioned by police, he actually just finally confesses and says what happened. On that July 30th, 1990 day, Donald Wacker was driving his car and Doyle Lane was in the car with him. Doyle Lane saw Nancy Shoemaker walking down the street as she was heading towards her house. He had instructed Mr. Wacker to please, you know, stop the car next to that girl. So he does. And then Doyle Lane just walks up to Nancy and takes her and forces her into the car. How nobody saw this, I don't know. Donald Wacker is saying to police, I don't want any part of this. I told him, please let her go. But he said that Doyle Lane threatened to kill him if he didn't comply. He says that Doyle Lane forced him to drive to the Bell Plains area where Nancy's body would later be found. Doyle Lane pulled Nancy out of the vehicle, removed all of her clothing, and he just sexually assaulted this nine-year-old child. Donald Wacker watched. He watched it all. Then he says Doyle Lane takes a, a belt, wraps it around Nancy's neck, and he pulls and tightens it and strangles her until she is dead. So at that point, now that they have this confession, Doyle Lane and Donald Wacker are both arrested and they are charged with murder and kidnapping. Donald Wacker would end up going to trial and he was convicted. He was sentenced to 16 years to life. Doyle Lane was also convicted of his involvement and he was sentenced to life in prison. In 2021, Donald Wacker was actually paroled out of prison and that's it, he was released. The family of Nancy Shoemaker is very concerned that the same thing may eventually happen to Doyle Lane. But here's the thing, Nancy Shoemaker was not Doyle Lane's only victim. On March 20th, 1980 in Texas, an eight-year-old girl named Bertha Martinez goes missing. She is eventually found murdered. Her case would go cold and it went unsolved. Fast forwarding now to 1991, as he is being questioned by police with regards to the Nancy Shoemaker case, he eventually confesses to Nancy's murder, but he also confesses to the murder of Bertha Martinez. He goes on trial in 1994 for the murder of Bertha Martinez, and there he is sentenced to death. But in 2007, the governor of Texas 
would end up commuting Doyle Lane's death sentence and then changing it to life in prison with the possibility of parole. This is because Doyle Lane, he was someone with limited mental capacity. He had a very, very low IQ. And even in Texas, you can't execute people like that. They are concerned that there is always a possibility that Doyle Lane could be paroled from his prison sentence in Texas. But if he is, what that means is he will then have to transfer to Kansas to serve his sentence for the murder of Nancy Shoemaker. The odds of that man ever really getting out of prison for sure are probably next to nothing. If these courts know what's best for a society, they would never let that man ever be out again. He has killed two young children. He is clearly a threat to children. Hopefully he never gets out, but at least Nancy and Bertha both got the justice they rightfully deserved. They caught the Zodiac Killer. Oh shit, oh so sorry, no, 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 <laughs> not this one, not this one. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of the New York Zodiac Killer. Viewer discretion is advised. This case primarily happened in the Brooklyn, New York area. And on May 31st, 1990, the first murder victim would happen. 78-year-old Joseph Prochi had been shot as he was entering into his home. He had been rushed to the hospital once he was found, and he was in, in and out basically over the next three weeks, but unfortunately he would not survive his injuries. He gave a vague description before he passed away of the man, saying he was unkempt, he had a mustache and a beard, and was wearing a hat. At the crime scene, police found a note, and it said, quote, This is the Zodiac. The 12 sign will die when the belts in the heaven are seen. Then they had this circle drawn. This diagram had Scorpio, Gemini, and Torres physically written in. A couple of days later, the New York Post, they receive a letter in the mail. This note stated, quote, The first sign is dead on March 8th, 1990. The second sign is dead on March 29th, 1990. The third sign is dead on May 31st, 1990. And police were wondering what that meant. Were there other murders that happened before this? Well, through some investigation, they discovered that there were two other shootings that are, were very similar in style, but those victims didn't die. 49-year-old Mario Orozco and 33-year-old Germain Montenegro, they had both been shot. Orozco, the first shooting victim, was a Scorpio. Montenegro, the second victim, was a Gemini. Mr. Prochi, the guy who was actually killed, his sign was Torres. They discovered that this guy was doing this every 21 days and always happened on a Thursday. On June 21st, 1990, there was a homeless man who was just asleep on a bench. Apparently, someone approached this man and asked him what his astrological sign was. The homeless man tells this guy, well, I'm a cancer. This 30-year-old man was then shot, but he would survive. The police were able to discover that on one of these handwritten letters, because there was actually another letter left with him, the police at this point had been given several letters stating that this is the Zodiac killer and he's killing people by their Zodiac signs. But they found fingerprints on one of the letters. However, the fingerprints never matched anyone that was already in their system. They did eventually release a composite drawing of this man. Again, he had a mustache and a hat he was wearing at all times. This is based on a couple different people who had actually seen this guy. The New York Zodiac would go silent for three years. Police were thinking to themselves, okay, this guy's claiming to be the Zodiac. Is it possible that this is the same Zodiac that we all know from back in San Francisco who was killing people back in the 60s. They would take the handwriting sample of, of his letters, the New York letters, and they compared them to the letters written in San Francisco. They were determined that these letters were not written by the same person. But police discovered that in 1992, there actually was another murder victim, a woman named Patricia Fonti. She was actually stabbed a hundred times. The letter they received in 1994 was the Zodiac claiming that he had done this, that it was him who did it. They also discovered another victim, a man named James Weber, shot in 1993, but survived. In July of 1993, another man, John Diacone, a 47-year-old man, had been shot. He did die. And then another victim named Diane Ballard, who was shot but survived. And they all had different astrological signs. Leo, Libra, Virgo, and Taurus. Taurus had already been used, so this was kind of odd to police. In 1996, the NYPD would respond to an East New York apartment where there was gunshots being fired. On this third floor apartment, a man had shot his 17-year-old sister, who would survive. 
there would be a essentially kind of like a hostage negotiation type thing. But eventually the gunman would be waving his arm out the window and surrenders. Police are able to go up there and capture him. The man was named Eddie Seda. They found a whole bunch of zip guns. Now the bullets that were used in the Zodiac killings, they were all without grooves and they didn't have like the distinguishing marks that a typical bullet fired out of a typical gun would have. When looked at under a microscope, they did discover that there were tool marks on these bullets. And when they had access to the zip guns that Mr. Seda had in his home, there were tool marks inside some of the barrels of these and they were identical to the tool marks left with on the bullets that were in some of the murder victims. So out of curiosity, they took his fingerprints. They were a match to the fingerprints found on the letter. The letter he got sent to the New York Post, well, he licked that letter, and so therefore they were able to get DNA off of the envelope. That DNA matched Mr. Seda. What boggled police officers' minds is how did he know the astrological signs of his victims? They never actually got the answer directly from him. They determined that this was likely a very lucky random attack. He probably looked at their wallets as they were unconscious on the ground because his first actual victim didn't die. He found out their birth date and just sort of said, oh, I can do this thing now. This is the Zodiac thing. And he just got lucky for the most part. In 1998, Eddie Seda would go on trial, two separate trials. There was one in Queens and one for Brooklyn. He would end up being convicted of three murders and one attempted murder, and he was sentenced to 83 years in prison. The second trial, he was tried for eight attempted murders. He was sentenced to 152 years in prison. But one Zodiac killer is down. What about the other one? One day, maybe, will we know for sure? Time will tell. She was last seen getting into a truck and then never seen again. Hello, true crimeers. This is another missing or murdered indigenous woman case. And this is the case of Nicole Frenchman. Viewer discretion is advised. At the time of this case, Nicole Frenchman was a 23 year old First Nations member and she was living in Edmonton, which is in Alberta, Canada. Nicole pictured here with one of her sisters. According to her sister, Nicole was pregnant at the time of this case. I guess she had just found out and she was super excited for this. Nicole was last seen on July 9th, 2021 in downtown Edmonton. She was officially reported missing as of August 10th, 2021. Once reported missing, police were able to access her phone records and her phone had not been used since July 10th. Her phone has had zero activity. Her bank has had zero activity. She has not shown up or been seen anywhere. She has not contacted anyone. The little information they know that when she was last seen on that July 9th is she was seen getting into a truck. A larger, they think maybe a gray pickup truck, and it had oversized tires and a lift kit. And I guess this was in the Kingsway area of the Royal Alexandra Hospital. And police have said there have been no signs of life ever since then. They also don't have definitive proof of foul play, but they don't know whose vehicle this was that she got into. But unfortunately, no one has really come forward to identify themselves as being the owner of that truck. I, it sounds like no one saw the person driving it, or if they have, they haven't released that information. On August 27th, 2021, I, I guess this case was moved over from missing persons to the homicide team. They have not found her body, but from what it sounds like, they have enough information that this may likely have been a homicide somewhere, somehow. But they don't know how she would have died. And again, we they can't say that she even is dead, but that's pretty much all the information there really is. Somebody out there has got to know what happened to her. Nicole has this exact tattoo that's located on her upper right chest. She also has a dream catcher tattooed on her right forearm and a flower and a dollar sign on her right hand. Nicole is five foot four inches, approximately 130 pounds. And again, at the time of this case, she was pregnant. She has long black hair and brown eyes. I do not know if they know who the father of the baby is and if they've in interrogated him or questioned him at all. I'm not sure. But if someone out there knows what happened to Nicole, if you have any information, please call 780-423-4567. You can also report tips anonymously to 1-800-222-8477. Please help Nicole's family bring her home. Somebody is in prison for kidnapping her, but she has never been found. 
Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Pamela Dunn. Viewer discretion is advised. This particular case happened in Watertown, South Dakota, a relatively quiet and peaceful little place, it sounds like. At the time this case occurred, Pamela Dunn was a 38-year-old mother and grandmother. Pamela had recently been dating a man named David Asmussen, but he was an abusive piece of crap. And just before this case occurs, Pamela is talking to a friend saying that I think I need to break up with him. The friend was like, yeah, you do. And then on the morning of December 10th, 2001, Pamela hadn't been showing up to work. Her family hadn't heard from her. So they go to her apartment in Watertown and they knock on the door. They don't get a response. There was a note on the door that just said, Pam, come home. And so Pamela Dunn was reported missing. At first, the people that knew her thought that maybe she was just trying to get away from her abusive boyfriend. Maybe she did break up with him and she just needed to hide just, just in case. But after days and then weeks go by not hearing a single thing from her, they knew something had to have happened to her. There were no signs of a struggle in her apartment. Her car was still in the parking lot and there was no signs of a struggle in there either. Initially, police thought there wasn't likely any foul play, but then they brought in like bloodhound dogs and they became more and more aware that this may be an actual endangered missing person. The dogs, however, did not pick up on anything. Apparently, there was someone who knew Pamela who was forging checks in Pamela's name after she disappeared. That person was arrested and charged with check forgery, but they didn't find any connection to say that she was involved in Pam's actual disappearance. In February of 2002, her boyfriend is arrested, but this is for charges of stalking Pamela and for violating a protection order. But at this point, he is not a suspect in her disappearance or in something maybe worse. By 2004, he's convicted of that and sentenced to 40 months in prison. Then in May of 2006, he is arrested again, and now he is charged with the kidnapping of Pamela Dunn. It sounds like the evidence involved a lot to do with the stalking information, and they did have other evidence, which I'm not 100% sure what the evidence is, but a jury would end up finding him guilty of her kidnapping, and he was sentenced to life in prison without parole. He denies having anything to do with it, and he has never revealed where she is. Back in 2020, they excavated and dug up a well in Watertown. This was in hopes that they would find her remains, but unfortunately, they did not. And still to this day, she has never been located. Murder charges cannot be pressed because there is no body. If you have information, please call 605-882-6210. It took 37 years to finally find out who done it, but unfortunately, they will never know why. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Patricia Stichler. Viewer discretion is advised. At the time of this case, Patricia was a single mother to three children. They lived in Sylvania, Ohio. Her children meant the absolute world to her. She was a fantastic mother. And unfortunately, something horrific would happen to her when they were just upstairs. It was New Year's Eve, 1984. Patricia had gone out and she partied and, you know, had some fun. The following day, New Year's Day, she had a very relaxing day. She spent the day with her three daughters, and it was just a really fun, you know, afternoon and evening. And then later that evening, she would put her three daughters to bed. But unfortunately, that would be the last time they ever saw their mother alive again. One of the daughters can recall, she was nine years old at the time, that the phone kept ringing all night long. And Patricia was answering the phone, saying, hello, hello but I don't think anyone knows who those calls came from. And then sometime around midnight or so, someone broke into their house through a bathroom window. And without any reason, they just began to stab Patricia. And she fought back. She had defensive wounds on her hands and her arms. But unfortunately, she would receive 19 stab wounds. And then the following morning, Patricia's daughter, one of them, would find her bloody body on the floor. Her throat had been cut and there was blood spatter all over the walls. It appeared that the, this fight took place between two different rooms as there was blood spatter in another room as well. And unbelievably, the three daughters actually slept through whatever attack occurred. It's absolutely horrific that a young child had to discover her murdered mother. That is just so unbelievably tragic. 
At first, they wanted to blame, you know, Patricia's ex, the father to the children. And for many, many years, the community, according to Patricia's daughters, basically vilified him and said, yeah, you killed your, your ex-wife, didn't you? You did it. He had a hard time basically living in the community. But the thing is, is there was no evidence to support that he did this. And they could never link him to it. And then they couldn't link this to anyone. And so the case goes cold. They try to reopen it in 1998, but they get nothing. Then again in 2012, again, they don't get any further. And then out of nowhere, police in 2022 announced they have a suspect. They used DNA genealogy to find who it was because he did leave some blood behind at the scene. A vicious stabbing, you're gonna, you're gonna cut yourself. And it was a 17 year old neighbor at the time. His name was Michael Mellis. He lived just six houses down from Patricia. He was never even looked at as a suspect. Unfortunately for justice, he was killed in a car accident in 1989. They couldn't find any evidence that he knew Patricia at all. And they will never ever know why he did it. Why did he choose Patricia? I am not insane. I am angry. I killed because people like me are mistreated every day. I did this to show society that if you push us, you'll push back. Those are words from the confession of a school shooter. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of the Pearl High School shooting. Viewer discretion is advised. October 1st, 1997 was a normal morning in Pearl, Mississippi. Sometime around eight o'clock in the morning, this student here, Justin Sledge, was approached by another student, a friend of his, named Luke Woodham. Luke handed Justin Sledge what he described as his manifesto. Justin Sledge read the first line of this and he knew exactly what was about to happen. So he grouped up some students and brought them somewhere safe. At 8.06 a.m., a gunshot rang out in the halls of Pearl High School. It was the sound of a bullet entering the back of Christina Menefee's head, killing her instantly. Now, allegedly, his motive behind shooting and killing Christina was the fact that they used to date, but they were no longer a couple at this point. And he wanted to take, I guess what he said was, revenge but also the fact that he was bullied a lot at school. Just firing gunshot after gunshot after gunshot. He managed to hit seven other people, but all seven of them would survive. But obviously it was pure chaos at the school. Luke, when he was done, decided he was going to flee the school. And finally, a good guy with a gun actually does something productive. Allegedly, the school's principal ran to his truck where he had a gun himself. He took the gun and he chased Luke. But Luke was speeding away in the car as the gun was pointed at him. But Luke was so out of sorts at that point that he lost control of the car and it stalled out. And then allegedly the principal pointed the gun at him and made him get out until police got there. So, so Luke Woodham was arrested and brought into the police station and they needed to contact his mom. But it was too late for that. When police arrive at the Woodham house, there is now a third murder victim, Luke's mom. 50-year-old Marianne Woodham, Luke's mom, had been bludgeoned and stabbed to death by Luke. Later, he would claim that he, his memory is foggy on killing her. So in the end, Luke claimed three victims. Well, was there a reason? Was there a motive behind this? Well, Satan. The 80s and 90s, and this is Luke being questioned and just confessing to what he did. But the 80s and 90s were obviously the time where satanic panic would kind of run rampant. Well, they found out that Luke Woodham was part of a group, a group led by this guy, Grant Boyette. The group was called the Croth, or the Croth, K-R-O-T-H. Boyette would tell this group that his dad was Satan, like the literal Satan. He referred to himself as the master of high demon activity. Okay. He was also apparently really fascinated by, you know, that one bad guy from Germany in the 40s. Well, he would threaten members of the Croth when they wanted to leave the group. He said that it's the Croth or you're dead. Now, allegedly this group was basically kids who were always picked on or bullied at school. And I think the idea behind it was that, you know, together they could kind of fight back against bullies. But to police, it also appeared that they all knew about this plan to shoot up the school. Justin Sledge, if you remember him, I talked about him earlier. He was part of that group. So that's how he knew something bad was about to happen, and that's why he got some people out of there. Luke would say that the, the Croft made this plan in the summer of 1997 to take down the school. There was plans to set it on fire, then shoot the students, and then they would all get into a car, get to Mexico, and then get on a boat to Cuba. 
they discovered that Luke, he wrote in a diary that he brutally tortured and murdered his dog. And his journal entries show that he was excited and happy when he did it. So Luke on his own is already pretty messed up. But then when you kind of put him into this group of, about, you know, Satan and the occult, well, that's just not going to go well. In his manifesto, he also gave like his will and testament. He was probably expecting to die. So Luke Woodham is charged with three counts of murder, seven counts of attempted murder, and he would eventually be convicted. Luke was eventually sentenced to multiple life sentences, plus an extra 140 years for other charges. But he's still able to get paroled, oddly enough. Why tack on all that extra time if there's a chance of him getting out? He's eligible for parole in 2046 when he's 65 years old. The six members of the Croft were initially all charged with conspiracy to commit murder charges because it was more than evident that they at least had some kind of inkling that this was going to happen. But many of them would deny like that it was real, that they thought it was part of this role-playing thing that they did. So charges against five of the six were dropped. 18-year-old Grant Boyette, however, was still charged and he would eventually be convicted of conspiracy charges. He was sentenced to the Mississippi State Penitentiary, specifically at a place called Parchman Boot Camp, which would only be for six months and then he would be on probation for five years. I don't know if Luke did this because of the whole, you know, Satan occult thing, or if he was just already unstable enough that he did this just, you know, on his own accord. But thankfully, he is exactly where he needs to be, away from the public. She may have been just one of many victims of the Highway of Tears. Hello, true crimeers. This is another missing or murdered Indigenous woman case, and this is the case of Ramona Wilson. Viewer discretion is advised. Ramona Wilson was living in Smithers in British Columbia, Canada, and she was a member of the Gixon Nations. Ramona was one of six kids and she was the baby of the family. As she grew up, she had a very bubbly personality, a lot of energy. She loved to joke around with people. At the time of this case, she loved playing baseball. She aspired to become a psychologist and she was working at a really popular chain restaurant there in British Columbia. It was June 11th, 1994. That evening, Ramona was going to go to a party with some friends. It was a dance party that was going to be in Hazleton. Ramona said goodbye to her mom, with her mom not realizing it was the last time she would ever see her alive again. But Ramona never made it to that dance, and she never came home. At first, her family thought that maybe she went to go visit her boyfriend in Morristown. But her boyfriend and anyone in that area that she knew hadn't seen her there either. And so on June 13th, Ramona was officially reported missing to the RCMP. At first, they said, ah, she probably ran away. Maybe she ran off with a boyfriend, but they were quickly able to prove that wasn't the case. Ramona left all of her belongings behind, including her uncashed paycheck. Now, around this same time, there was a white woman who was found murdered in the area. And it seemed that the media and police were all focused on that one. And so there became this immediate lack of support for helping find Ramona Wilson. It was all hands on deck for the other case. It would be about 10 months later, here off of Yellick Road, two young boys were doing some ATV riding down this path. They found a pile of clothes with a yellow rope, and then a few feet away, they found a body, later confirmed to be the body of 16-year-old Ramona Wilson. Her body had been there for a very long time, and they got no forensic evidence from anything. Her family continues to try putting her name out there, but they are still getting no tips, no leads, no suspects, nothing. They don't know what happened to Ramona that night and why she didn't get to the party. Ramona Wilson was found along the road called the Highway of Tears. It's a nearly 450 mile stretch of Highway 16 that runs between Prince Rupert and Prince George. Since 1970, there have been somewhere around 80 to 100 either missing indigenous women who go missing along this highway or are found murdered along that highway. And 16 year old Ramona Wilson was just one. I don't know Ramona's exact cause of death. I don't know if they do either, but they have ruled this a homicide. Some speculate she may have been hit by a drunk driver, but then her pile of clothes that was kind of in a neat pile next to her body, that wouldn't make any sense. That sounds like someone who knew her. If you have information, please call 1-800-222-8477. Road rage crimes can be some of the hardest cases to solve, but thankfully this is no longer an unsolved mystery. 
Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Robert James. Viewer discretion is advised. This story happened in Hesperia, California, back in 1997. It was August 1st of that year. Two-year-old Robert Xavier James was in the vehicle with his parents and his sister. His sister, Sarisa, was six years old. It was a long afternoon, which led into the evening of doing a bunch of errands. And eventually, Travis James, who was driving the car, uh, Robert's father, they were driving along Main Street in Hesperia, California. Travis was trying to merge onto Main Street, which was really busy at this time of night. As he was doing that, a blue Chevy Camaro had basically tried to cut him off. As Travis was trying to change lanes, the Camaro kept cutting him off, like deliberately almost. Travis wanted to pass this car, but whoever was driving this vehicle was not going to let it happen. When Travis speeds up, the Camaro goes a little bit faster. It was clear that this vehicle, whoever was driving it, was not going to let Travis get his way. So Travis then decides to do an illegal U-turn. But as he's doing this, someone from the blue Camaro, a passenger, not the driver, stuck himself outside the car window and pulled out a gun and began to fire at the car that had two-year-old Robert and his family in it. 13 total rounds were fired into the car. The blue Camaro speeds away while Travis and his wife Wendy, they stop the car to see the damage. They turn around and they see blood everywhere. Two-year-old Travis had been shot and killed. The only protection he had, they said, was his stuffed teddy bear, which the bullet went through and pierced him in his head. His sister and his two parents were unharmed. Travis and Wendy both got a fairly good look at the shooter. They said he was more than likely a white male, but possibly Hispanic. Late teens to mid-twenties. And working with sketch artists, they came up with this composite drawing. The Camaro was a blue color with a light strip on the bottom. And so police put out the description of the car plus the shooter. This case airs on Unsolved Mysteries. And then by August of 1998, they get a break. The shooter was identified as 26-year-old Alvy Utah Williams. He was revealed through several anonymous tips. Alvy was a neo-Nazi. He was in prison when he was identified as the killer here for weapons charges. When they found him, they finally found the driver and they also found the other passenger. Both of them testified against Alvy. He would be convicted and then sentenced to life in prison, but in 2005, the conviction was overturned due to a prosecutor error and then in 2009, he pleads guilty to voluntary manslaughter and got 11 years. And now he's out. Was it a hit and run or was he beaten to death? To this very day, it is still an unsolved mystery. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Russell Evans. Viewer discretion is advised. Russell Evans' case originally aired on Unsolved Mysteries on Season 3, Episode 15. At the time of this case, Russell Evans is 13 years old and he lives in Spokane, Washington with his family. So like I said, he's 13 years old, but apparently he was six foot three inches tall. He was a big kid, but he was a kid who just loved to, you know, dress up and play. And he absolutely loved playing basketball. He was in the eighth grade and he did really, really well in school. And he was just described as just a really well-behaved young man. And he had a lot of friends too. This is a recreation from Unsolved Mysteries. On June 4th, 1989, at 1.05 a.m., a person was driving down the road when they noticed a body lying in the street. The witness, Sandy Ferris, said it was a young boy and he was having a hard time moving and he was groaning, but also he had been screaming the name Brian. Brian, please help me. Brian, where are you? She did not know what that meant because there wasn't anyone directly there. However, she later stated that when the ambulance arrived, she saw a person in white shorts and a white shirt hiding behind a tree. And then when she noticed him, the person took off. She wasn't sure if this was Brian. She tried to tell police, but they kept ignoring her. Russell Evans was rushed to the hospital, but unfortunately, several hours later, he would be pronounced deceased. So what killed him? Well, therein lies the dilemma. Russell's parents were told that he died from an accidental hit and run. Someone struck him, likely with a truck, and they took off. But almost immediately, his parents weren't so sure about that. One, the injuries along his back were, were not indicative of a single blow from a bumper. They were like scattered kind of like injuries on his back. He also had what looked like some bruising on his face as if someone had been punching him. 
He had bruises on his arms as if someone had been squeezing his arms and maybe holding him down. So, the police state that they believe that Russell was in the middle of the road crossing the street when a truck, the guy was probably driving drunk, maybe, struck Russell, launched him like 70-ish feet, knocked him out of his shoes, and then just continued to take off. One thing to note is that Russell did not have any, like, road rash on him. He was not, he had no scrapes whatsoever, indicating that he was launched and then fell on the ground and slid across the pavement. He had none of that. But this, this is where it gets even stranger to say this may not be a hit and run. This may be something totally different. These are actual crime scene photos. So this is Russell's shoe, one of them. And then this is another shoe. This is his shoelace. His shoelaces had completely come out of his shoes. I don't understand the physics of how they think that happened if he was hit by a car. The shoelace also has small amounts of blood on it. How would there have been blood on it if he, sh if he was knocked out of his shoes? Also, there was not just one pool of blood, there was two. Actually, there was three pools of blood. The red circles here indicate where those were. His shoes and the shoelaces were where these X's are. How was there blood in three separate locations like that? If he was struck by a car and launched 70 feet, how wasn't there like a trail of blood? And these weren't like little drops, these were like actual pools of blood. If a person is flying in the air from being hit by a car, there's not going to be enough blood to, like, create a pool of blood. There would be, like, splatter, and there would be, you know, uh, just blood everywhere. Okay, so who would have done this then? Well, according to Russell's friend, Aaron, the two of them had been hanging out that night. They were with some friends when another group of people came over and started arguing with Aaron about Aaron's girlfriend. This almost got physical, but they broke it up. Russell ends up going to another friend's house where he leaves sometime after midnight on his way home because he's walking home, Russell. He runs into his friend, Sade Madison. Russell told him about this almost fight that happened, how kind of crazy it was. And then he went about his way. And then at 1.05 a.m., Russell is found near death in the middle of the road. The coroner initially said that this was a hit and run, that's it, and that's, that's the end of it. The family said no. So another pathologist does an examination. He determines that Russell had gotten into some kind of physical fight just before his death. The bruising on his body is more indicative of being punched and kicked than it is of being struck by a car. However, police continue to say it was a hit and run. Okay, well then who did it? Are you investigating it? Because it doesn't seem like they are. They almost sound like, oh, it's a hit and run. Oh, well. His parents have done more investigating into this than they have. They found out that he had been saying the name Brian when he was found. He had a friend named Brian. And so his dad goes to that Brian and says, hey, what were you wearing that night? He says, I was wearing white shorts and a white shirt. Then later, police go to interview Brian. He says, nope, I don't own any clothing like that. To his parents, it sounds like Brian may have witnessed what happened and he's too afraid to come forward. According to police, they have interviewed and polygraphed all of the kids from that little fight. And apparently they've all passed. And so I guess to them, that means they're innocent. They didn't really do any more investigating at all. And now we're left with, was this a hit and run or a beating? Regardless, it was a murder, an unsolved one. If you have information, please call the police in Spokane, Washington. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Sandra Lee Long. Viewer discretion is advised. Unfortunately, I really don't have much information on Sandra. At the time of this case, she was living near Wilmington, Delaware. She lived in an apartment on her own. On September 2nd, 1994, her apartment was found on fire. Once the fire was put out, they would discover that Sandra Long was in the apartment and she was pronounced dead at the scene. A couple of hours after that, a man calls the local The News Journal, some like media site, and he calls himself the Driftwood Killer. It sounded like he was taking blame for killing her and then he told them who his next victim would be. When he named that victim, police go to that victim and they find out that she's been getting really obscene phone calls from some strange man. So they put her into protective custody. They're able to track the phone calls and find out where they're coming from. Hachi mama. They come back to a man named Brian Steckel. So they put out a harassment warrant on him. They finally track him down and when they do, he is wasted. They throw him in a jail cell to let him sleep it off. The following morning, he sits into an interrogation room with them and he just flat out confesses that he killed Sandra Lee Long. He was the one making the phone calls. He was a neighbor of Sandra's. They barely knew each other. She only met him like a week prior. He managed to get inside her apartment by saying he needed to use the phone. Once he got inside, he said, I'm gonna have sex with you. 
She said, no, you're not. So he then rips the phone cord out of the wall, finds a pair of pantyhose of hers, and he basically forces her onto the couch and puts the pantyhose around her neck. He would say the pantyhose then ripped, and then he continued it by using a sock, strangling her with it. He waited until she was unconscious, and then he sexually assaulted her. He then put her body in the bedroom and noticed she had long curtains, and so he took a lighter and he lit the curtains on fire. About an hour or so later, he was in a car with his friend, and they had noticed the fire in this apartment building. He apparently just like turned white as a ghost, and the friend looked at him and said, you look like you've killed someone. And then later he makes those phone calls, which traces back to him, and he is arrested. He goes on trial, and he is convicted. He is actually convicted of three counts of murder. One count of intentional homicide, and then two felony murder charges. And then he was sentenced to death. He tried to appeal it. It went to the courts. The courts denied his appeal. On November 4th, 2005, he was strapped to the gurney. He says, I'm sorry for the cruel things I did. I'm a different man now. I've changed. But I accept this punishment. It's time for me to go. He appears to struggle as the lethal injection is done. He was still lucid for some time. He was actually, like, convulsing. But eventually, he would be pronounced dead. Ugh! Ugh! You got a stinky attitude. <sighs> Hello, true crimers. This is the case of Scott Erskine. Viewer discretion is advised. Oh God, I just feel greasy looking at him. This guy grew up in San Diego, California. Back when he was like a kid, he was hit by a station wagon and was in a coma for like 60 hours. And that kind of messed up his brain. But by the time he was 10 years old, he was molesting his siblings. As he got older, he started sexually assaulting his friends. He threatened to kill those friends if they said anything. In 1980, Scott Erskine, God, even your name sounds angry. Well, he had beaten and sexually assaulted a 14-year-old boy. He was arrested and charged with this. He was convicted and only sentenced to four years in prison. And he was released in 1984. Okay, so the face is always like that. Got it. In 1993, he kidnapped and sexually assaulted a woman, and he was almost immediately arrested after the fact. He was convicted of that crime and sentenced to 70 years in prison. At that point, he was required to surrender his DNA. And in March of 2001, that DNA came up with a match to another crime. On March 27, 1993, friends Charlie Kiever and Jonathan Sellers were out riding their bikes. This was in San Diego County, and the two boys were last seen about 12 p.m. that day. On March 29, 1993, that was my eighth birthday, the bodies of the two young boys were found. Charlie was lying face down on the ground. His genitals had bite marks, and there was just a lot of blood around that area. They found DNA inside of his mouth, which they collected and stored. Jonathan was found in the same exact area, and he had been hanging from a tree by a rope. He was nude from the waist down, and his genitals had also been mutilated. And then in 2001, the DNA found in one of their mouths was linked to Scott Erskine. Scott Erskine would then go on trial for that murder, and he was convicted and sentenced to death. And then another DNA hit came in. A murder in Florida of a 26-year-old woman named Renee Baker. She was found sexually assaulted and murdered, and there was DNA left behind with her. That DNA would then also match Scott Erskine. For her murder, he went on trial and he was convicted and sentenced to life in prison without parole. Scott Erskine, are you just like permanently upset or? Well, he was waiting on death row for quite some time and he would die on death row, but not from being executed. On July 3rd, 2020, he died of COVID. And for him specifically, I hope it was painful. I hope it was horrible. I hope he suffered. This forever angry son of a bitch got exactly what was coming to him. These two lights here seem to be all they have in the search for a missing 15-year-old boy. Hello, true crimeers. This is a missing child case of Sebastian Rogers. Viewer discretion is advised. Sebastian Rogers is a 15-year-old autistic boy who lives in Hendersonville, Tennessee. There seems to be a lot going on in Tennessee. He lives here in this neighborhood. And it was on February 26, 2024, where at some point between midnight and 6 a.m., Sebastian Rogers walked out of his home, never to be seen again. 
and this is the road he would have likely been walking on. His parents didn't know he was missing until they all got up the following morning to wake him up for school. So he was reported missing, and as of right now on March 14th when I'm filming this, there still has been no sightings of this kid. There are also no indications of where he is, where he went, if this was planned. No evidence of foul play either. His parents are obviously just, you know, devastated. They want their child back. Police have been, from what I've read, pretty vague about their classification of this case. They say there's no evidence of criminal activity, but there's also no evidence that there isn't criminal activity, which is basically saying, we don't know. Police have said that they have received upwards of 100 tips or so, but they've investigated every tip and they've all led nowhere. They recently released footage that was taken from outside of his house the morning he disappeared, and I'll let the news guy explain it. Source in the lower right-hand corner. Then you see subject two briefly appear and move toward the first before that light source is covered or obscured by bushes. Subject one, a few seconds later, then moves out of frame. Then subject two reappears and follows subject one off screen. It's a short time later, and it's very vague, but then you see one of the subjects moving quickly back through the common area, and that is it. So these two light sources, which they believe are flashlights, and the parents believe Sebastian had a flashlight on him when he left the house, they're picked up around 3.10 a.m. the morning he would have vanished. And this is from, like, a neighbor's camera, so this is right next to their house. The neighborhood at night is pitch dark. There's no streetlights. They have no idea if this was related to Sebastian Rogers' disappearance or not. But police do want to know, like, if you were outside with a flashlight at that time right by his house, they need to know this. Because they need to be able to rule it out or find out who that second flashlight is if Sebastian's the other one. They have checked landfills based on tips, which is frightening in itself. And this is in Kentucky, but they've come up with absolutely nothing. It's been about 18 or 19 days or so with no signs of him. He is a child. If you know where he is or have information, please call 615-442-1865 or 1-800-TBI-FIND. She was last seen leaving with a man who looked like this and then never seen again. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Sue Swaddell. Viewer discretion is advised. At the time of this case, Sue Swaddell was 19 years old and she was living in Lake Elmo, Minnesota. She lived with her sister, Christine, and the two of them were really close, and also they lived with their mom. Sue had recently graduated high school and then started going to college when she realized that this really wasn't what she wanted to do right then, and so she would move back in with her mom and sister. Sue was described as being very, like, bubbly, very social, and at times a little naive and overly trusting of, of certain people. But, I mean, yeah, she was just a happy 19-year-old kid. Her life was really just getting started. At the time of this case, she was working two jobs, including working at a Kmart, which is where she was working the night she disappeared. She got off work at about 9 p.m. and it was, there was a blizzard going on as well. What her coworkers found strange was that she at work got dressed out of her work clothes and into a skirt. It was weird because of how much snow and how cold it was outside. She got into her maroon 1975 Oldsmobile that belonged to the family and was apparently on her way home. I guess she called her sister earlier that night while she was on break and said, hey, what movie are we going to watch tonight when I get home? But Sue never got home. Within an hour or two of her not getting home, her mom and her sister got really concerned, and so they would end up calling police. Police were actually able to find her vehicle. It was parked here at this now obviously abandoned gas station. In the car, which was locked, was her purse. Her driver's license was in it. Her glasses were in the car. And no signs of foul play. The gas station was closed, so police went back the following morning and they spoke to a clerk who was also working the night prior. That employee said that Sue did go there that night and she had parked her car there because apparently he was having car trouble. Well, later, her mom has her car towed to a mechanic and they found out that someone had tampered with Sue's car, deliberately making it, you know, not run properly. So almost as if someone was trying to get her into their car. And that may honestly have been what happened. The gas station clerk gave a description of a man who looked just like this. He had curly hair. He pulled into the gas station shortly after Sue did. The employee saw him and Sue talking. It seemed like a normal conversation. No fighting or anything. Nothing aggressive. Sue got into his car and they drove away. 
He was in some light-colored two-door muscle car, is what it was described as. And then Sue was never seen again by anyone. A week later, something bizarre happened. Sue's mom and sister noticed that someone had been in their house. Their spare key had been moved. There were extra dishes in the sink. And the pants that Sue was wearing to work that night that she disappeared were now in the house under her bed. They definitely were not there before, but nobody knows who it was who left that there. Sue's mom and her sister had been out that day when they came home to notice these things. I don't know if they had police come and investigate or like dust for fingerprints or anything. I'm not sure. By the way, I think I forgot to mention the date this happened, January 19th, 1988. So what police know is that her car had been tampered with by who? They don't know. But whoever did it may have done it on purpose for her car to break down on the way home to pull into a gas station. And then perhaps that person who maybe Sue knew and trusted pulled into the gas station conveniently after she did and offered her a ride home. That is a working theory. This would have been someone she likely knew and she trusted enough. Because again, the gas station attendant said they looked like they were having a normal, friendly conversation as if the two of them knew each other. But the description of the guy didn't really ring familiar to anyone in her life. They also wondered, like, why did she get changed into a skirt after work? Why would she do that and not just wait till she got home when she said she was coming home to watch a movie with her sister? Did she have plans that night instead? And nobody really knows. They want to know who this man is, who he was, and... He was the last person to really see Sue Swaddell. Did he do something to her? If, you know, police at first were like, oh, she probably just ran away. But then with the car tampering thing and getting into this man's car, never to be seen again, this guy never coming forward. I think it's pretty obvious at this point that this was an endangered missing person and that Sue Swaddell very likely met with foul play. But no trace of Sue has ever been found. And her family just wants to know where she is, what happened to her. They want peace, they want closure, and if she is gone, they want to be able to lay her to rest. Somebody somewhere out there knows the truth, and perhaps that someone is you. If you have information about the disappearance of 19-year-old Susan Swaddell, please contact 651-430-7850. If alive today, she may look something similar to this. So please help this family get the answers and the justice they rightfully deserve. The fire seemed to destroy any and all potential evidence. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Tara Baker. Viewer discretion is advised. It was January 19th, 2001 in Athens, Georgia. 911 got a phone call with regards to a fire in this home. When firefighters got inside the house, they saw that all four burners on the stove were on. This immediately indicated that this was likely an arson, and they were soon horrified to find that there was also a body inside the house. A body later identified as 23-year-old Tara Baker. Tara was a first-year law student at the University of Georgia. She was a loving sister. She's here pictured with her brother. She was sweet, and she was kind, and she was incredibly intelligent. Tara, pictured here with her mom, was going to have a very bright future. But someone decided to take that away from everyone. The police in this case have kept pretty much everything from the public. They have barely even told her family the details about what was inside that house. Police would interview a bunch of students from the school. The neighborhood she lived in was primarily consisted of people who went to the school. They interviewed a bunch of people from the neighborhood. They apparently looked into any potential boyfriends or exes, and they have come up with nothing. It actually wouldn't even be until about 2017 when the family and the public finally knew how she died. Tara had been beaten. She had been stabbed numerous times. She had been strangled, and there were signs that she was also sexually assaulted. However, the fire and then the water from the hoses from the firemen completely destroyed any potential evidence. This is a situation where the killer lit the fire for the purposes of destroying evidence. And in this particular case, it worked. We've seen on forensic files how they can do amazing things, even through burned and charred things, but they just have not been able to do it with this case. They did also announce that her laptop had been stolen and that was about it. They do theorize that maybe she was in communications with someone 
you know, through email, and maybe that's why the killer took it. They have this theory that she may have been murdered by someone who was maybe infatuated with her, possibly stalking her. Maybe someone had been harassing her, but she didn't tell anyone. Her boyfriend at the time was looked into very deeply. He had a very solid alibi that was confirmed by numerous people, and they cleared him. And that's it. That's where it's at. Tara's family has no idea who killed her. They have no idea why she was killed. Police have kept very hush about the things they have. They've been given names of suspects, but they've never named those suspects publicly. So if you have information about the murder of Tara Baker, please call 706-613-3330. Help her get justice. I mentioned to one of my friends, Nikki, that like I wished I could, but that was about it. You wish you could what? I wish I could, like, kill my dad or whatever. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Tim McNeil. Viewer discretion is advised. It was July 19th, 2007. Police in San Diego, California, get a panicked 911 call from a young girl who said her father had just been shot dead. The girl said that this was a robbery and that she had been tied up with zip ties and she called 911 by using her tongue. When police arrive, they do in fact find a very bloody crime scene just on the other end of this pool table. A man is lying on the ground and he had been shot to death. That man was 63-year-old San Diego lawyer Tim McNeil. He had just celebrated his 63rd birthday a day prior. Tim lived in that house with his 16-year-old stepdaughter, Bray. Tim had married Bray's mom back in 1990. At the time, she was a single mom of two kids. Her two kids were Bray and Nathan. Their mom and his wife, Doreen, would end up committing suicide in 2006. By the way, Tim also had children from a previous marriage. It's confirmed by many people that both Nathan and Bray dealt with some extreme abuse from their mother growing up. Physical abuse, emotional abuse, and it was bad. So when Tim came into the picture, he was like this epitome of a great parent. He loved those two kids as if they were his own. He pampered them. He gave them everything they wanted. He was loving and caring. And because of how bad the relationship was between Nathan and his mom, Tim would actually end up sending Nathan to Arizona to live with his grandparents. Nathan turned his life around. He became an honor student in college. He was a well-respected and good young man. And after Doreen's suicide, he still had Bray living with him because at that point he was her dad. So then what on earth happened here? Was this a robbery? According to Bray, this man broke into the house sometime in the middle of the afternoon, by the way, armed with a gun and basically was forcing Tim to open up the safe and get the money out. But according to Bray, Tim said no. And so this robber shot Tim and killed him. And then he left. And he, for some reason, didn't shoot Bray. He runs out this back door and then is seen running down this path. On that pathway, police do find a revolver, and it turns out that this was the gun used to kill Tim McNeil. In a nearby tree, police find this black t-shirt. Wrapped inside of it is this ski mask. There was no DNA found on the shirt, but they did find DNA inside the mask, and they were able to create a profile. As police are still combing through evidence back at the house, 16-year-old Bray is being questioned. Now, she says the guy was wearing a mask, but then she slips up. This is a composite drawing. This drawing was made after several witnesses saw a man who looked like this running from the scene. When Bray saw this photo, she said, no, he had, his chin looked different. But she had said the man was wearing a mask, completely covered up. How did she know what the man's face looked like? Then in her interview, she slips up again and she says that at one point she heard someone say the name Nathan during this robbery attempt. But then she quickly says, but, but not my brother, Nathan. It must have been a different Nathan. Oops. So they're taking the DNA they found inside the mask and they're running it against Nathan. It's a match. His DNA is inside that ski mask. The gun that was found outside the house they found out was registered to Doreen. This gun was typically kept in a nightstand inside the house. So the killer got the weapon from in the home. Police then continue to press Bray and see what else she might know. And then she says this. I mentioned to one of my friends, Nikki, that like I wish I could, but that was about it. You wish you could what? That I wished I could like kill my dad or whatever. She also asks police, how did she know it was us? 
she just completely caved. They did also confirm that Nathan was in the area during this time. But what, what caused them to do this? Tim was actually their good parent, the loving and kind parent and supportive. Turns out Tim had recently gotten a new girlfriend. This didn't sit well with Bray. She felt Tim was giving her all the attention and no longer giving anything to Bray. And she said, well, I thought he loved me, that he was my dad. She was jealous of this woman. So she called her brother. Nathan also had this motive of, well, why did Tim not stop this abuse from his mom? He and Tim didn't always see eye to eye. They did butt heads. So both kids had some very weak motive. Nathan continues to deny any involvement in it. In a very unusual twist, the two of them go on trial. It's the same trial. They both have different lawyers and there are two different juries. One jury for each defendant. Prosecutors would present evidence that eventually Nathan, when pressed a lot, he said that he thought Tim had been cheating on his mom prior and he got really angry. And on that day in question of the murder, they got into an argument over it and he shot him three times. Each of their defense lawyers blamed the other defendant for starting this. Ultimately, both kids were found guilty of the murder. Nathan got 25 years to life. Bray, considered the mastermind, was given life without parole. However, her sentence would later be overturned and she was resentenced to 26 years in prison. She was jealous of his girlfriend and Nathan just had anger issues. And this innocent loving man died because of it. This is the last known image of a 19 year old kid who is missing. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Tamantes Hurt. Viewer discretion is advised. Shortly before this case happened, Tamantes Hurt was a recent high school graduate. He graduated from Hunters Lane High School, and that was in Nashville. The now 19 year old is currently attending college in Missouri. His grandma says that Tamantes is a very loving and caring individual. He's extremely soft spoken very respectful young man. Now, at the time of this case, which was just recently on February 1st, 2024, Tomantes had been visiting a friend in Kansas City, Missouri. He was, I think, scheduled to be on a Greyhound bus, which would have brought him back to where he lived. However, he has never gotten home and he has not been seen by anyone since. These are potentially the last known images of Tomantes taken on February 1st, 2024, right before, right at 11.52 a.m. He is walking towards the Greyhound bus station. He is seen going to the door, which is locked. I'm not sure why it's locked. And then he is seen walking away. He does not appear to be any kind of distress. Everything seems to be normal, at least just based on the image. But then he is gone. It's now March 22nd, 2024. So we're close to two months since Tamantes has just vanished off the face of the earth. I don't know if police have spoken to the friend that he was visiting. I have to imagine they have, but it hasn't led them anywhere close to finding him. Tomantes has given no indication that he was like going to be never coming back. And so this may be an endangered missing person, but police need information. They need tips. They need anything. In one article I read that he was actually without his cell phone. And so tracking that or tracing and all of that, it's, probably going to lead to nowhere because I guess he didn't have it on him. But unfortunately, there is very few posted articles about this case, but he has to be out there somewhere and, and someone out there knows where he is. Hopefully he is alive and well and safe. But at the same time, you have to think, you know, almost two months has gone by with nobody reporting have seen him, no one hearing from him. You do have to have some kind of concern there. But somebody somewhere out there has to know the truth and has to know where he is or what may have happened to him. If that person is you, you can report your information anonymously. You don't have to say who you are. You just have to say what you know. So you can call 314-305-9478. He is 19 years old. He has brown eyes, black and red hair. He is six foot one, 160 pounds. He was last seen wearing a royal blue price chopper polo and green sweatpants, and he does have a tattoo on his right arm. If you have info, please help bring him home. Hello, true crimeers. This is the disappearance of Tony Turner. Viewer discretion is advised. At the time of this case, Tony Turner was 22 years old and living in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. 
She is considered typically a very happy and bubbly person and a fairly active person. She actually was working at a place called Studebaker Metals as a metal fabricator. And she also taught ceramics. Tony is described as an artist, uh, a visionary. She also loved to dance, she loved music, and she was an amazing sister. It was December 30th, 2019. She had worked her shift at Studebaker Metals. She worked from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. that day. At approximately 6 p.m. that same day, she was seen at Dobra Tea. And according to the people that worked there that basically served her almost every single day, she appeared to be in her normal mood. Nothing seemed out of the ordinary. Then Tony gets on her normal bus that she always takes and she begins to go home. The bus driver would later testify that she got off the same stop she always got off and began to walk towards her home. I believe the bus driver actually knows Tony because he lived, I think, next to her. And from what I read, he actually saw her a little bit later that day at, you know, her place of residence. Tony then called her sister and they had a conversation. And then after that, they never heard from her again or saw her ever again. At 8.30 p.m. on December 30th, 2019, here at the Homestead Grays Bridge, and this is like three miles away from where she got off on her on the bus, and on the pedestrian walkway portion, someone found her backpack, her shoes, and a ceramic pot that she had made earlier. The items were returned to the family, and then she was reported missing on December 31st. The backpack, I guess, had her diary in it, and I guess the diary, the more recent entries, indicated she maybe have been a little sad. And I think the bus driver even stated that she seemed a little down that particular day. Police have stated that they have found no signs of foul play. It doesn't mean foul play didn't occur. She did just recently break up with her boyfriend, but apparently it was amicable but they just haven't found evidence of like a crime scene or any kind of indications of foul play. Her uh, home was in normal condition. I don't know, because I know people are going to ask, I don't know if they've combed the river for her. I know that the friends and family of Tony did search all around that area, like in the water and you know near the banks of the river, but police never recovered her body from this body of water. They never found it. Not to mention this is a super busy bridge and during the time she would have gone missing, someone would have noticed her jumping off. Sadly, this is still unsolved. If you have information, please call 412-323-7800. This poor woman was tortured to death over an allegation. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Wenda Wright. Viewer discretion is advised. This case happened in Titusville, Florida, which is located right there where the little red dot is, and it occurred back in 2005. Wenda Wright was reported missing in February of 2005 once her family hadn't seen or heard from her. Wenda worked as a housekeeper, and she did so for this woman, Margaret Allen. I'm not exactly sure when, but I do know that sometime shortly after, you know, she was reported missing, her body was found in a shallow grave. And next to her body, they found a cigarette. I know they tested that cigarette for DNA, which did have a profile. And it came back to matching, I think, this man here, James Martin, who was Margaret Allen's roommate. And then it also led them to her nephew, Quinton Allen. Wenda Wright's body had multiple bruises, especially to her face. She had contusions all over her chest, her wrists, her torso, her face, and her lips. She also had a very deep ligature mark around her neck, and it was likely this that caused her to die, so she suffocated, and they determined it would have taken about four to six minutes for her to die from this. They also discovered that more things were done to her. She was forced to drink a bucket of bleach. She also had nail polish remover, rubbing alcohol, and hair products shoved and sprayed down her throat. Several chemicals had been sprayed or poured into her eyes. They would also discover that Wenda had begged them to please stop, please stop. That's when they got a belt and they wrapped it around her legs and they also wrapped another belt around her throat and strangled her. Why did this happen? They would uncover through their investigation that Margaret Allen accused Wenda Wright of stealing her purse, which had $2,000 in it. So Margaret, pretty much it was mainly Margaret who did all the damage, tortured Wenda, 
to get the information out of her, like, where's the money, where's the purse? But Wenda was like, I didn't steal your purse, I didn't steal your money. And from what I understand, they never found the money or the purse. And I believe police would find out that Wenda didn't have anything to do with this missing purse or missing money. So she was accused of something she didn't do and she was tortured for doing that thing that she didn't do. And then she was killed. Margaret was the main person who did all this. These two men helped hide the body or poorly hide the body. So Margaret Allen was arrested and charged with capital murder and she was actually convicted and sentenced to death where I believe she is still on death row. Her nephew got 15 years for cooperating with the investigation and then Mr. Martin only got five years for accessory after the fact. An innocent woman murdered for not committing a crime. I hope she's resting in peace. Uh, okay, that's a face. Could a mother love that face? God, it looks like he wants to save Lada Kedavra, right? You know what I mean? Anyway, hello, true crimeers. This is the case of William Reese. Viewer discretion is advised. William was born and raised in Oklahoma. He was one of 13 kids. His parents were very busy. Later on in life, he would join the Oklahoma National Guard, but would very quickly drop out of it. He got married, ended up having a child. Then there was a divorce, but then he managed to convince his ex-wife to remarry him. But then that ends in a divorce again because he got very violent with her. In 1986, William, he would end up kidnapping the daughter of a sheriff's deputy. It's not very smart. He got her inside his car, tied her up, and sexually assaulted her. He was arrested for this because he let her go, and he was charged. Then he posted his own bail and escaped. When he was on the run, he ended up finding another woman who he kidnapped and sexually assaulted. He was finally reapprehended and then charged with both of those sexual assaults. Initially, he was sentenced to 25 years. However, because of some legal issues, I guess prosecutorial issues, his sentence was overturned and he was then re-sentenced to a much shorter term and was paroled in 1996. In 1997, a young woman, 19-year-old woman named Sandra, she was kidnapped. She was last seen at like a convenience store. She had left the convenience store. She's caught on camera. And so after Sandra was seen leaving the store, when she got into her car and started driving, she almost immediately realized one of her tires was flat. Lo and behold, William Reese is driving just behind her and pretends to be her knight in shining armor. Well, he ends up abducting her off the side of the road. He ties her up. His plan was to sexually assault her, but she actually manages to escape his truck. And the truck was moving and she got a lot of injuries, but she was able to escape. Sandra was put under hypnosis and she was able to remember the license plate number of the truck she got into and she had vague descriptions of the man. This would actually end up leading to William Reese. So when she saw him, she confirmed it was him. So he was just arrested and charged with her kidnapping and he was sentenced to 60 years in prison. At this point, he has to submit DNA for, you know, just for the record. In 2015, police are looking into the murder of Tiffany Johnston. She was a 19-year-old girl. On July 26, 1997, her vehicle was found abandoned at this uh, car wash. And this is actually in Bethany, Oklahoma at this point. Soon after they found her car, unfortunately, they found Tiffany's body on the side of the road. She had been beaten and strangled to death, and she was sexually assaulted. Well, in 2015, when they ran the DNA from that particular crime, because it was a cold case at that point, they finally got a match to William Reese. He would then confess to killing her. As he was talking to police, he says, she wasn't the only one. I killed three more girls. He said the first time he killed someone was on April 3rd, 1997, a 12-year-old girl named Laura Smither. And this was now in Friendswood, Texas. He claims he accidentally struck her with his car because it was super rainy that day. He then says he took her body and he, he hit it by a lake. But she wasn't dead, so he ended up strangling her until she was dead. 17-year-old Jessica Kane was reported missing in August of 1997. She was last seen in Houston, Texas, and they found her car abandoned on the side of the highway. William Ray says that he approached her, I guess, while she was leaving a restaurant and she said, you know, go away from me. And so he ended up following her and then he managed to get her off the side of the road where he killed her. Then he says in July of 1997, he was, I guess, in Denton, Texas at this point. He's like driving all over the place. He had stopped at a gas station where he says he got into some kind of physical thing with a 20-year-old woman named Kelly Cox. She was a college student and a mother. 
Apparently, he says they got into such a big fight that he ended up strangling her to death. She apparently was not sexually assaulted. I believe there were two bodies that had not been discovered yet. And I think one of them was Kelly's body and he pointed out exactly where they would be. They did some excavating and they found the remains of the women. And so all four of his known murder victims had been found at that point. And so yeah, he confessed to all four of these murders. And then by July of 2016, he ends up going to trial anyway. And this time he goes to trial in Oklahoma because that's where uh, Tiffany Johnston was killed. And then by 2020, there's a lot of obviously pushback because of COVID. And so his trial was, was pushed back a lot. But then by 2021, he finally goes on trial for Tiffany Johnston's murder, where he is found guilty and he is sentenced to death. Then he would end up just pleading guilty to all three of the murders in Texas. And Texas, <laughs> crazily enough, did not sentence him to death. They love doing that there. They actually ended up giving him life in prison without the possibility of parole for all three of them. He is on death row for the murder in Oklahoma. And one day he will be executed. But as of now, he is just chilling in his cell, looking like if Gandalf and Dumbledore had made it and had some weird little baby. But thankfully, all of his victims got the justice they all rightfully deserved. Ugh. An 80-year-old woman was recently arrested for murder. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Yvonne Menke. Viewer discretion is advised. At the time of this case, Yvonne Menke was a 45-year-old mother to four children. Unfortunately, one of her children died at birth. She was a single mom at the time, and she was living in St. Croix Falls, Wisconsin. At the time, she was also dating a man named Jack Owen, who also was dating another woman. The other woman's name was Mary Josephine Bailey. And so there was this love triangle. On the morning of December 12th, 1985, here at the apartment building that Yvonne Menke lived in with her kids, at about 6.25 a.m., one of Yvonne's daughters woke up to the sound of what she described as like a loud whipping sound. So she hurries out to the apartment and then she opens the door and this is their apartment. And then on the stairwell was her mom and she was lying in covered in blood. Yvonne Menke had been shot. As the daughter observes her mom, she also sees someone who appeared to have a feminine figure dressed in a gray dress coat, a stocking cap, and a scarf, first walking away from the scene, but then ran away. And then she calls 911. But unfortunately, once police and ambulance arrive, her mother would be pronounced dead. She had been shot three times. Police were able to recover shoe impressions that were left in the snow, and they believe that the shooter eventually got into a car and sped away. Now, other than that, there really wasn't much physical evidence left behind. They did first look into, you know, the father of the children, but he was cleared. Then they looked into Jack Owen, this man she was seeing, who also apparently had another girlfriend. From what I understand, they were able to clear Jack Owen of any wrongdoing, but he did admit that he had been dating... Yvonne and Mary Bailey for about two to three years. And it kind of sounds like the women sort of knew of each other. Police also learned from the kids that they would get calls at their apartment from someone trying to muffle their voice. And these calls have been happening for like a couple of weeks leading up to the murder. Sometimes when the kids answered, the person would ask, hey, what's your mom's schedule? When does she leave for work in the morning? But before they could answer this person, the person would hang up. Now, they said it was a muffled voice, but they could tell it was a woman's voice. And one of them even suggested it sounded like Mary Bailey. So police are able to get a warrant to search Mary's place. In her apartment, they do find shoes and boots. One pair, which is a definitive match to the boot impressions found outside the apartment the morning of the shooting. They also discovered that Mary had been in possession at some point, a 22 caliber pistol, which a 22 caliber was used to shoot Yvonne. However, she said that gun is gone. Someone took it. Right. A likely story. But sadly, police did not have much physical evidence at that point. And so the case goes very cold. As the years go by, detectives open up Yvonne's case. They, you know, look it over, but they really just don't get anywhere further with it. They have an idea that, you know, maybe Mary Bailey is responsible for this, but we don't have the proof. And then recently in 2023, the case is being looked at again. Well, this time they find new witnesses who come forward, witnesses that would not come forward earlier back then because they were afraid that they would get killed for talking. 
One witness told police that they were told directly by Mary Josephine Bailey that Mary instructed her other boyfriend that she had to burn and dispose of the clothing that she, Mary Bailey, was wearing the morning of Yvonne's murder. Police did not know this until 2023-ish. Other witnesses who have now come forward to state that Mary Bailey was very emotionally upset and very emotionally disturbed around that time because she wanted Jack Owen to herself and she was basically threatening Yvonne to say, give him up and he's mine. I guess they didn't really know back then how aggressive Mary was about the situation. Again, you know, d decades later, there are people now coming forward to state this information. If there was other physical evidence that they have linked to Mary Bailey at this point, I don't know yet. But wow, you are angry. Right at the end of 2023, Mary Josephine Bailey was arrested and charged with murder. She was arrested in Maricopa County, Arizona. She's been living near me this entire time. Great. She has then been extradited back to Wisconsin. Her bond was set at $300,000, and she is awaiting the next portions of this process. So basically, obviously you're innocent until proven guilty in the court of law, but Mary Bailey is the presumed murderer of Yvonne Menke. More than likely killed because she was jealous of her and wanted Jack Owen to herself, which is insane because in the end, he didn't choose her anyway. He ended up choosing a third woman and moved on with her. So thank you very much, Mary Bailey, for doing this for absolutely no fucking reason. There is no trial date set yet because this is still fresh. But, you know, if convicted, Mary will be spending the remainder of her life likely in a prison cell. And hopefully Yvonne Menke and her kids get the justice she rightfully deserves.